So, hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is story about what if Naruto is strong as Hashirama Senju. Part 1. If you guys enjoy this, what if? And want next part? Let me know before starting the video, comment down below. Please support for more awesome what if content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So without wasting time. Let's start the video. Hanahagakur no Sato, the Kanoha Hospital, October 25th, Naruto. Age 6. Not for the first time did the Sandame Hokage, Saratobi Hirazan, wonder what it meant to be the Hokage. Both his senseis and predecessors, the Nidame Hokage, Senju Tabarama, and his brother, the Shadai Hokage, Senju Hashirama, had told him many times that treating his fellow villagers, his fellow shinobi of belief, all as a part of his own family. As a part of his own body. That is what it means to be the Hokage. Hashirama-sama, an idealist at heart, had always dreamed that one day, all shinobi, regardless of the country, clan, or village they hailed from, would come together and cooperate. Thus erasing the hatred of the warring states period to coexist was his dream, much to the dismay of his more pragmatic younger brother, who would place Kanoha and its benefits above everything else. Discarding Shadai's idealism of such a notion as a mere fantasy. A fantasy that if it ever became a reality, would be an illusion at best. For that, after Hashirama's death, but even before, Tabira Masensei tried to instill a more realistic approach into his students. Hiruzen had tried to justify this every time he had to send his ninjas to the suicide missions. When he sent them to war knowing that some of them might never come back. Those were the moments when he wondered what it truly means to be the Hokage and if he was worthy of wearing the mantle of the third. Sitting on the hospital bed, looking at the sleeping form of the six-year-old Namakis Naruto, Hiruzen wondered how many of his fellow villagers actually embodied, or at the very least, believed in the ideal on which he tried to live by. It didn't come out as a surprise to him to hear about the villagers' resentment towards Naruto after someone had leaked his status as a jinch cricky to the public. The reason that as long as there was no physical abuse from the adults, Naruto would be safe. He could forbid them to talk about his status to the future generations, ensuring that Naruto grew up being accepted by his peers. But even if the adults followed his order, albeit grudgingly, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. The young children, having their parents as an ideal they wanted to impress, an ideal wanting to surpass, would notice something different about the blonde boy. Whispers and rumors are certainly one way to mold the opinion of the juvenile mind toward someone. Naruto did not have any friends. He lived in an orphanage and was generally avoided by everyone alone and weak prey for stronger to devour. Nothing in his memory suggests he held any previous resentment towards them, Hakajusama. Yamanaka and Waichi woke him from his inner thoughts. He went to the playground with the intention of making friends, as per your suggestion to him, the day prior. Unfortunately, the three Nanerald boys didn't like the idea of that boy being in their company. Before he unleashed his chakra in the form of the wind element, they started picking on him, calling him names, even hitting him a few times. Inoichi paused for a second, moving his gaze from Hiruzen to Naruto, and back again. And only after that, he did what he did. No previous elemental manipulation or even any shinobi training I found in his memories. Not even the intention of purposely killing them the way he did before he passed out from the shock. What about his life in the orphanage? Hiruzen asked, ruffling Naruto's hair while he slept peacefully on the bed. He would take him and treat him with some raiment on a few occasions, but would never ask the boy about his actual life a fact he was ashamed of right now. He promised Kashina that he would take care of her son, yet he failed. The worst part was, it looked as if he did not even try to change anything. Inoichi looked at him with a small frown. I can say it's not a healthy environment in which a child should grow, Hakajusama. The Hokage's eyes widened at that. Don't tell me. The Yamanaka clan head picked up his shock and quickly said. No physical abuse happened, Hakajusama. However, the general neglect, ignoring, or when they do notice him, an ugly look as he calls it in his head shape his rather resentful outlook towards the villagers, from whom he is a target of that treatment, more so than in the orphanage. Here is inside at that, wanting to hit himself for his previous ignorance. If Naruto received the ugly looks on the streets, the orphanage would be no different. But. It was supposed to be his home, a safe haven when in reality it was not one. Eventually, it would influence Naruto's mind towards more misanthropic worldviews. He needed to prevent more damage. Immediately. He did not want to face Naruto's ancestors one day. Pitifully trying to explain to them how he did everything he could. The Noichi continued describing Naruto's isolated life. Fortunately, the starvings and the beatings did not occur, aside from the recent attempt in the case of the latter. He learned how to read and write along with the other children. Though, Hiruzen felt as if there was more to it. Inoichi wore a conflicted and pained mask on his face. As if there was more to his experience than just that. Hiruzen did not press the matter further as his thoughts went back to Naruto. 
though, he reminded himself to have Inoichi tell him everything later. The child of his burden needed more. For Naruto was not only a jinch cricky of the Nine Tails, but also the only son of the Yandame Hokage, Senju Minato, and alongside Tsunade, a last member of the Senju clan coming directly from Tabarama's line, being his Greek rinson. Growing up and resenting the village his ancestors, clansmen, father, sacrificed their lives for, was the last thing the aged Hokage wanted he didn't want that to happen at all. Giving him the name of Namakas was for his protection, at least Hiruzen had hoped. It was a small game of words from his side. He couldn't very well name him the Uzumaki, as it would draw too much unwanted attention from the outside and their rival nations. Then again, Hiruzen didn't know Naruto would be facing these problems. In silent parts of his mind, he did know, but his faith in the village, in the will of fire, was strong, never wavering, not even when Minato died. Perhaps if he had given him the name Uzumaki, the villagers would be more respectful. Two first ladies did come from the Uzumaki clan after all. Hiruzen made countless errors and countless mistakes throughout his reign. But the error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. Sending some of his shinobi to the suicide missions, hoping they would survive, silently knowing some of them would die in error and a mistake. An error he would try to remedy in the future. Mistake, never to repeat and often would. But even that would not bring back the dead. All his errors. All his mistakes would forever haunt him. Just like any innocent whose life he ended during the war would, because in a way he was the one responsible for the deaths of those ninjas. Looking at the sleeping form of Naruto, Saratobi swore he would correct this mistake. He placed his trust into the wrong basket. It was time to place it with Naruto. He owed the boy and his deceased family that much at least. He called out to his nearby Anbu before doing anything. Cat, summon the head council to the meeting chamber I, in 30 minutes. 1. The Anbu in question simply nodded and went to fulfill the task she was given. Promptly standing up, he addressed Inoichi who was still in the room, waiting for his further instructions. Walk with me, Inachikin. After making sure there were at least two Anbu guards with Naruto, along with giving a warning to the doctors not to speak to anyone about it, Hiruzen made his way to the office. In the meantime, Inoichi wondered what his Hokage planned to do with the council. It was no secret among the ninja population that Sandame and his former teammates had a clash of ideologies ever since his reinstatement, particularly regarding Naruto. Yudatane Kaharu and Mitakado Himura certainly passed the transition from firm supporters of Sandame to biggest supporters of Shimura Danzm, another elder and rival to Sandame. Inoichi, himself being the member of the head council as representative of Konoha's intelligence division, was a witness to their constant debates, but found himself supporting the Sandame for the most part. As he, in Inoichi's mind truly embodied the will of fire. At the meeting chamber I, a half hour later, in one of the rooms, specifically meant for these kinds of meetings, the head council was gathered. Aside from the Sandame Hokage and Inoichi who represented Konoha's intelligence division, present were. Shimura Danzm, Yudatain Kaharu and Mitakado Himura as the village elders and more in Shimura's case. Inin commander Nara Shikaku, the Anbu commander, and lastly, the head of Konoha's military police force at Chihafugaku, were present as well. Without a preamble, the Sandame decided, or at least thought to start a meeting that way. However, impatient as ever, Kaharu interrupted him anyway. I assume this meeting is about today's incident with the Jinch Kriki. Growling at being interrupted, which Kaharu had seemed to have noticed, if her sudden flinch at Saratobi's glare was any indication. Hiruzen nodded in any case. What else could it be about? Though, he would have to investigate how they actually knew about the incident before he told them. Perhaps, a purge in the ranks would have to commence, regardless of to whom the information such as that one, would be delivered. Instead, Saratobi said. Yes. The three academy students attacked Narutakan at the playground, during which he unintentionally unleashed his chakra in the form of the wind element. Unintentionally said with absolute firmness, leaving no place for an argument. Have you decided what to do with him then? Kaharu continued, compassing herself. Though, a small hint of fear was present. Saratobi said nothing, except closing his eyes and pursing his lips, and giving a quick nod. However, Himura, more compassed than their female teammate, in a more authoritative voice proposed. Regardless of everything, perhaps it would be for the best to place him under Danzm's protection as was suggested before. Hiruzen was not surprised by his idea. If it could be called one. He was going to deny it in any case. But he allowed Himura to continue speaking, at the very least to hear more of his reasoning. Even though it was not the first time he made such a proposal. Given his mental state and the future development of the same, I believe it would be in the village's best interest that the Jinch Kriki be trained by Danzm. His affinity for wind, a strong one, is an even bigger reason for that. He nodded towards Danzm, who in turn, nodded as well. I agree with Himura. He looked towards Hiruzen then. The boy should be given to me, at least while he's still young and malleable. You know this incident will affect him even more than the general treatment by the populace. 
with me, he would not only become a trained shinobi, but a loyal one to the Konoha as well, with a better childhood than he could hope for at the moment. Anzm placed the accent on the word treatment, almost as if he was proud of that fact. Whatever your plan was for him, I doubt it would work in the long run. Loyal to you? Hiruzen scoffed inwardly. Anzm looked towards the other members of the head council. But aside from Himura and Kaharu, he only found disapproving frowns and glares, causing him to scowl lightly. He wouldn't get their support. The Anbu commander was loyal to Hiruzen first and foremost. Shikaku and Inoichi were Minato's friends, and they knew about Naruto's parentage, and were thus even less likely to support him in such a case. He was on bad terms with Yugaku ever since the Kikbi's attack and subsequent transfer of the Achiha clan to the edge of the village, causing Fugaku to always speak against Anzm's proposals and voting against them when such an opportunity arose. Lastly, he looked towards Hiruzen, his former friend and rival, who strangely had a small smile on his face. I have already decided what to do with Narutakin, Shimura. You need not bother with your proposal any further. The same goes for you too. Kaharu, Hamura. This time there was a little disdain in Hiruzen's eyes when he looked towards his childhood friends. Their knowledge of Naruto's mental state would have to be investigated. The three of them were the prime suspects of revealing Naruto's status to the village, no doubt hoping he would give the young boy to Danzm for training Kanoha's ultimate weapon, while on the surface sugarcoating him that it was for the Senju heir's protection. Well, he would enjoy crushing their delusions even now as he did any other time. Narutokan will live in his home, by the right of his birth. This caused some of the council members to widen their eyes at the Hokage's decision, with Nara Shikaku being the first one to speak. Well I do think this is the best case of action, Hikaji-sama. Who will take care of his basic needs? After all, he is still just a child. And if word gets out that the deaths of three academy students are connected to him. His treatment will get even worse. No idle boredom was present in Shikaku as he said that. I have a few people in mind whom I trust to take care of Narutokan without problems and I will brief you all once I convince him to accept this job, Hiruzen told them. In regards to the general populace, it would be best that what was said at this meeting remains here. He looked at all of them for a few moments. His gaze lingering on the three elders who sat on his right side for a bit longer. Unsupervised elemental manipulation. Inoichi, Fugaku, I trust the military police and analysis team can cover this. Both of them nodded. Inform their parents that they experimented with elemental manipulation without supervision, the same goes for the rest of the village. No connection can be made to Narutokan. I don't want seeds of any conspiracy theories to be planted anytime soon, or ever for that matter. Inoichi, just like Shikaku and the Anbu commander, were his loyal supporters during these types of meetings. Fugaku supported him as well more out of resentment towards Dan's than the loyalty from the heart. Still, it was better than nothing. While the council couldn't overrule the Hokage in any matter, discontent could be transferred onto the rest of the village. He was lucky that three clan heads were on his side. Hiruzen knew that Higaku knew about Naruto's parentage, as Kashina and Makoto were best friends, even if he and the rest of the Achiha clan resented Minato for becoming the Yandame Hokage on top of being a Senju as well. However, for all his dislike towards Minato, Fugaku was a man of honor, who rarely questioned orders, only when it would hurt the interest of his clan like relocation of the Achihas to the other part of the village. Something which Hiruzen started regretting as he supported Dan's men in that regard. However, it was too late to remedy that, for now at least. He had to fight on another front at the moment. Hiruzen's gaze lingered on the head of the Achiha clan and briefly wondered if it was him who revealed Naruto's status to the village. It could certainly wash away some dirt that was placed upon the Achiha name after the incident. And any suspicions along with it. Aside from us. Six of my Anbus and two doctors at the hospital whom I trust know this. Before coming here, I briefed them all to not speak to anyone about this incident. I expect the same from all of you as well. From now on, this isn't class secret. They were silent for a moment before each council member gave a silent nod of confirmation. You can go now. They all nodded once again, with the clan heads and the Anbu commander standing up to leave. The three elders lingered for a bit longer hoping to sway Hiruzen, but when Danzm stood up to leave, Kaharu and Hamura followed. However, before they all went on their way, Hiruzen called out the three elders you three. Stay. As the room emptied, Saratobi addressed them, slowly ticking the table in front of him as the seconds passed. You know what the penalty for breaking this glass secret is. It was not a question, but a statement, although the elders did not appreciate that the Hokage had so little faith in them. Hamura and Kaharu at least did not. Danzm remained impassive as ever. Kaharu decided to speak on that, her eyes nearly closed and narrowed. Of course we won't speak about she would have said more, but was interrupted by Saratobi. Like you three couldn't be silent in regards to Narutokan's Jinchkriki status. No proof, but a word of warning that he would be watching them. Amura and Kaharu tensed for a moment, Danzm was silent and unmoving as ever. Hamura decided to retort. We didn't say anything about that. 
you have no right to accuse us of such a thing. Indeed I have no proof, but it's not as if you gave me reason to trust you on that matter. Harrison simply smiled wryly. In any case you've been warned. You can leave now, but know that I will not be merciful if you betray me here will not be merciful like I was before. This is your last warning. He narrowed his eyes as he finished his words. The three of them nodded, even if Kaharu and Hamura were displeased with their council being shut down without any argument, along with being a target of suspicions. But before they left, the sand aim spoke once more with clear disappointment dripping from his voice as the words left his mouths. The Biramasensei would be disappointed in you three with how you want to treat his only living descendant. Anzm spoke this time with a sneer, his visible eye narrowed down, and a look of disgust being sent towards the sand aim. Nadeima Samba would not place the interest of one child, even of his own blood over the good of the entire village. You forget the reason why he and Shada Sama wanted to create this village in the first place, Danzm. Saratobi retorted, and then he smirked. It's one of the reasons why he chose me as his successor, and not you. No retort came this time, just the sound of the elders leaving. Hammer, however, has definitely hit the nail. Slowly breathing in a tired manner, Hiruzen in his mind thought. I wish Tarifu and Kagami were my teammates, or at the very least alive. God knew it would have been easier to deal with the other three with them there. An idea passed through his mind, an idea of a merciless action. Of the walls and floor covered in blood. But it vanished quickly as it came. And Hiruzen felt both sadness and shame. The next day at the hospital, slowly opening his eyes, Naruto found himself staring at the white ceiling of a room he has never been in before. He rubbed his tired eyes, clearing them from the morning eye crust. Why am I here? He wondered for a moment before the flashbacks of the previous day suddenly hit him like a pair of bricks that crashed onto the sloppy workers. Struggling to catch his breath, he felt the arm of a stranger patting him on his back, calming him down a bit. Easy there Naruto, it's alright. The stranger urged him in a kind manner. When Naruto lifted his head up, he saw a tall man with a strange mask that looked like that of a dog's face and a tall, spiky silver hair. Memories of three dead bodies around him, before he passed out, still fresh in his mind, propelled him to ask. I I killed them. He whispered weakly in a questioning tone. The man with the dog mask was quiet for a few moments before saying. The Kajasama will explain everything to you once he comes here, in the meantime, try to relax a bit. Naruto nodded, while the dog mask Anbu gave him a glass of water. Hakajasama, the old man as Naruto called him most of the time, was the only person who would talk to him, who would tell him stories, just like a real grandfather would to his grandson. He hoped that the dead bodies of the older kids in his memories were just a nightmare, and that the old man would tell him that as well. The dog masked Anbu motioned for his colleague to tell the Hokage about Naruto's current status, after which he remained with the blonde boy for a time, looking sadly at him. He was no stranger to the first kill, especially at Naruto's age. He had his own first kill when he was as old as Naruto albeit not on a fellow villager. If the word fellow applied to his sensei's son in this case. Since the deceased boys didn't think of him like that when they pushed him to the limits where he ended their lives. Five minutes passed and the Sandaim Hokage arrived at the hospital room in which Naruto was staying. Seeing his grandfather arrive, a small smile formed on Naruto's face as he spoke in a hoarse voice. Old man. In return, old Hokage gave his own small smile to the young boy. How are you feeling, Narutokan? He asked him, moving to sit beside him on the white sheets of the hospital's bed. A bit tired, but it's more that my stomach hurts. I had a nightmare. Naruto scratched his hair, trying to make sense of that nightmare as he spoke. What was the nightmare about? Saratobi carefully asked. At the follow-up question, a small frown graced Naruto's face. Saratobi suspected what Naruto was going to say. Certainly, the first time experiencing death and first kill, it was to be expected. Especially at Naruto's age of six, when he didn't even mean to do it, it would lead to initial denial. I dreamed. I dreamed that I killed three older kids who bullied me. But I didn't mean to do it, I just. Wanted them to stop doing it. He remained silent after that, most likely still trying to deny such a notion, with his hand scratching his head, running wildly through his blonde hair. Trying to make sense of it. The part of Saratobi wanted Naruto to remain that a child, ignorant of his burden, even if it was impossible to do so anymore. If he evaded answering the question now, he could risk hindering Naruto's growth or even worse, direct it to the wrong road. The young boy, who was always brighter than his peers, as much as the situation and ways of upbringing allowed him, carved for two answers. He knew that the villagers disliked him and wondered why they did. The second question was, who were his parents? It was almost like fate. A parent's love was the ultimate form of love a child could receive. A love that could be a sanctuary for most problems. But many children who grew up in the orphanage didn't know about it and thus wouldn't question why they didn't receive it, at least in Naruto's age of four, when he first asked him that. And as the Senju clan, Naruto's clan was known for their love, it was no surprise that Naruto subconsciously upheld their values. 
blood is not water after all. Avoiding the answer now, or giving the wrong answer, Saratobi risked Naruto resenting him, or even the village later on. If this incident doesn't make him resent it anyway. Do you know something about that, old man? Naruto asked him after a short silence. Looking at him, Hiruzen decided to tell him the truth. I do know, Narutokan, he paused again and then sighed, feeling his eyes heavy with the weight of a hundred stones being pulled on them. And, I'm afraid, what you dreamt wasn't a nightmare, but the actual reality. Naruto's eyes widened again, and his body began shaking, making Hiruzen grab him by the shoulder to calm him down. Calm down my boy, nothing will happen to you. I certainly have no right to punish you, as I'm partially responsible for this entire mess. A moment of silence passed before Hiruzen continued. After a quick investigation. We have found you did it unintentionally as they had provoked you first. If anything, they got what was coming for them. Saratobi didn't like the way he addressed the three deceased boys, but Naruto needed to calm down and more than anything needed moral support. He wasn't at fault anyway. And he did not need to know about the fact that Hiruzen had someone well into his mind, less to frighten him even further. As they started beating you. You unleash your chakra in the form of a wind element, after which it hits all three of them, causing them to lose their limbs, damage their internal organs, thus ending their lives. He waited for Naruto to process that. The end result was far worse than those simple words. What? What will happen to me now? Naruto asked quietly. His eyes are full of fear of the unknown. Worry not my boy, nothing bad will happen to you. As I said, this is partly my fault. I could have done more to protect you and more to prevent something like this from happening to you in the first place. After saying this, Saratobi stood up and walked towards the hospital's window, looking at the village, contemplating how to explain this to Naruto. He had to know the truth, but needed to be sure he would keep it a secret for now. This conversation, while not the way Hiruzen imagined to have with Naruto at this young age, and not under the influence of these circumstances, had to happen. Narutokin, what I'm about to tell you. You must not tell anyone else. At least until you grow up and become stronger to defend yourself from anything that could harm you. Again. Went unsaid. Hearing what he said, Naruto looked towards the Anbu with a dog mask, who was with him when he woke up. Seeing this, Hiruzen smiled. Minato's boy certainly inherited his sharp mind. If he did this right, he would set Naruto on the path of greatness, ensuring the boy to have a fully normal life one day. Normal as much as it was allowed to one shinobi. And he definitely needed to become one. It's alright Narutokan, he already knows what I'm about to tell you. Naruto nodded. Kakashi already knew Naruto's parentage. And who knows, he might even become a sensei to Naruto one day. Breaking from his musings, Hiruzen started speaking again. Have you ever heard of the nine-tailed fox? A silent prayer was sent for this to pass without a problem. One hour later, explaining about the kick beat to Naruto passed with no yelling or crying from the Senju boy. Only of his little fists clenching the bedsheets in whatever emotion he felt at the moment. The first significant emotion he saw was when he started talking about his parents, his remaining family and both the blood and bond. They were tears, tears of both sadness and happiness, especially when he mentioned to him how much his parents loved him and how happy they were to learn he would be born. Naruto more or less accepted what Hiruzen had told him, along with his new living arrangements. As Inoichi told him before, the orphanage, where he was shunned and ignored, was certainly not a good place for him to grow up. So Hiruzen, just like he told the council before, decided for Naruto to live in his clan's home with a caretaker, who would regularly visit him and help him whenever he needed help. Especially with the shinobi education, which Naruto gladly would have to check the compound first before he arranged everything. Naruto's academy time would start in one week anyway on the 1st of November. Still, he was glad that the young Senju had accepted what he told him. He couldn't go around with his real clan's name for some time, at least until he became a Chknin, maybe Jnin. If he was anything like his father or other ancestors, he would become one in a short time after he graduated. But, Saratobi also told him to not rush and graduate early. It would be better to do it like the rest of his peers. Many Senjus had died early because of that, and the clan was nearly wiped out in the Three Shinobi World Wars, simply due to graduating early and going to the front lines. Ego, fame, acceptance or legacy means nothing if you die too soon to experience the benefits of any, or to actually leave some of them behind. Being in the safety and hidden from the outside would allow Naruto to grow and get an adequate strength to defend himself to become strong, before embarking on the outside world to complete his missions and make a name for himself. Rest for one more day here in the hospital, Narutokan. I will make arrangements for you to move into your new home. Saratobi told him. I understand. Naruto nodded before he remembered something else. You said I will get a caretaker, who will it be? That, you will find out tomorrow. He is due to return from his week-long mission today, maybe he already did. Here is amused in the end. After which he left Naruto to rest and went on his way to do his hokage duties. 
The next day at the Senju compound, following his recovery in the hospital, Naruto was escorted to his future home by one of the Hokage's Anbus, a woman with long purple hair and a cat-like mask, whose codename was apparently Cat, just like how the other's Anbu, who was with him when he woke up after the incident was codenamed Dog. His new home, previously populated by his deceased Senju clansmen, was the compound located closest to the Hokage's tower and the academy, but still isolated enough from the rest of the village, lying quietly under the same hill on which the faces of all Hokages were carved in. Nowadays, the compound was abandoned, its only residents were dirt, dust, and the occasional birds that had made their nests on the various tall trees that were growing strong in the backyards of the no-abandoned homes. Maybe even rats in various holes of the buildings. Even if his clan was known as the Senju clan of the forest, mostly thanks to his great granduncle, Senju Hashirama, it was no less true that the rest of them loved the trees as well. As a testament to their devotion, this compound could be considered Konoha inside of Konoha, albeit abandoned. As they reached what looked like the main residence of the clan, they had to stop for a while in front of the building's front door. As apparently, the main residence was protected by seals that would allow only those of Senju blood to enter, or those who were permitted by the creator of the seal. The person who created these seals in the first place was Senju Minato, the Yandame Hokage, his father. One of the reasons was so that his wife could walk freely inside and out, and also to have bigger protection from potential Uwagakur ninjas who sought revenge for their loss in the last war. The old man also told him that when she was young, his mother, Yuzumaki Kashina, was the target of kidnapping by Kumagakur, who wanted to use her for her special chakra. All of that made Naruto even more convinced that he must keep his secrets for now and to become strong in order for something like that to never happen to him or his family one day. Strong enough to never get into a situation like the two days ago. The deaths of those three older kids still haunted Naruto's thoughts. Would they ever stop haunting him? Shaking his head, Naruto tried thinking about other stuff to clear his mind. It was still hard to imagine that he was a member of the legendary Senju clan. Even if they had largely died out. With the two members remaining, Naruto knew that another heavy burden was placed upon him. Not only would he need to revive his clan one day. He needed to be sure that he would make his ancestors proud as well. All Senjus, aside from his great granduncle, didn't possess any particular or unique bloodline. The members of the clan were known for excelling in various ninja arts. As well as having powerful and large chakra reserves, according to the Sandame. He wondered who his caretaker would be. Maybe his godfather, Jiraiya of the Sanin, or perhaps his aunt Tsunade. No, the old man said it would be a man. As much as he was wondering who it would be, curiosity propelled him to wonder what he would find in his future seals protected home. Maybe a library with his clan's techniques. The old man told him that when the village was created, as a clan known for a thousand techniques, the Senjus donated much of the lower rank to mid-rank to the Kanoha Shinobi library so that it could help non-clan aligned potential ninjas to develop. However, they kept much of the higher ranked ones for themselves. It would have been dangerous to give them away, as you would never know what damage could have happened if they found themselves in the wrong hands. For the first time in his life, Naruto wanted to explode with excitement. Not long after, Saratobi Hiruzen arrived with another elderly man, whose gray hair was tied in a small ponytail, all the while his face was marked with a kind smile that never seemed to fade away. Narutokin, allow me to introduce you to Marubashi Kasuk, your new caretaker, Hiruzen announced. Pleasure to meet you, Narutokin, Kasuk said with his usual smile. Likewise, Kasukasan. Responded Naruto with a smile of his own, extending his hand to greet the kind old man. As I already told you before, Narutokan. The main residence of the Senju compound operates with seals that were placed here by your father. However, after his unfortunate death, I had Jiraiya place alarm seals around the house to warn me if anyone ever tried to break inside. Naruto nodded and proceeded to ask a question. Has anyone ever tried to break in? Tsuritobi nodded. Indeed it has. But there was only one such case. A newly promoted Chiknin, Mizuki, attempted to break through around four months ago. He walked over to the wall and simply knocked two times, for which a small wave of blue chakra was sent on all sides, like a rock falling into a puddle, eventually fading away into nothingness. See. The examples of seals your father has made. Even if you hit harder you will find it hard to break through. Mizuki of course tried to do it, but the additional seals Jiraiya placed alarmed me, and so we had him apprehended. So how will Kasukasan here actually be my caretaker if he can't even enter? Hiruzen simply smiled at the young boy. Indeed he won't be able to enter the main residence. However, not the entire house is covered in seals. There is a segregated part, specifically meant for guests. Kasuk will live there. Suratobi explained. However, it will be up to you to clean the rooms of the main residence, as only you can enter inside, Narutokan. Naruto nodded in understanding, while Kasuk was silent. He certainly didn't expect this turn of events. He didn't even consider himself worthy of becoming a caretaker or tutor to Naruto. But he owed that much to both Yandame and Nidame. 
Hiruzen told him that out of all the people in the village, Naruto could grow up to become a good man, only under him and his nearly 50-year-old experience. Asuk knew that Hiruzen was not sugarcoating, but actually meant every word he said to him. Equals equals flashback equals equals Sende Masama. Well I don't doubt your wisdom in regards to arranging a new life for Naruto-kun, I must politely refuse your offer. I'm not worthy of teaching young Naruto, and I'm certain there are more worthy shinobi in the village who are. Kasu quietly answered to Saratobi after hearing of his offer. Saratobi only sighed and looked at him. Kasuk, I honestly doubt there are. I refuse to allow any of the clans to adopt Naritakan on the principle that it would create unbalance and division or even jealousy among them. Had he not had problems with Orochimaru, I would have put him in the care of Jiraiya, but as we do, I have no choice but to look for an alternative. He paused for a moment before continuing. Jiraiya has tried to locate Tsunade on a few occasions, but aside from running into her debt collectors or casinos she visited, he had found nothing. And we discarded that option. If Tsunade doesn't want to be brought back to the village, then so be it. Bakashi is in the Anbu and is needed on the field constantly. Plus, with his emotional trauma from the losses of the last war and from the Kikbi's attack, I fear he is not suitable enough to raise Naritakan with his psychological condition. I'll give him a few more years to find a way to cope with his losses, and then I might place Naruto on his team if he gets better. Asuk remained silent as Sandame's words flooded his ears. Asuk, I know you still blame yourself for your comrade's death, but just like Tabira Masensei had told you once before, I will tell you now. Use that mistake, that experience, your knowledge, and pass it to Naruto. I made more mistakes than you, my friend. But breeding and punishing yourself will not bring back the dead. Ensuring we don't repeat them will prevent new graves, tears, and hatred from emerging. For we are shinobi and we endure. And I'm sure Tabira Masensei would not want you to beat yourself anymore. He would be glad that someone like you is tutoring his Greek Rinsen. Saratobi remained silent after that. Kasu thought about many things. Would Taburamasama approve of this? Would he find him worthy of training and educating his Greek Rinsen? Those questions loomed in Kasuk's mind. But knowing the man and his personality and fighting alongside him on many occasions answered Kasuk's question. Almost like he heard the words of the man himself. I accept the assignment to become Narutakin's caretaker, Hakajasama. Said Kasuk professionally. Equals equals end of flashback equals equals. After that, he and Hiruzen have talked about how Kasuk would raise Naruto, how his education and shinobi training would be delivered, and many other plans. Kasuk was sad to hear about the new burden that had been placed on the boy. He hoped he could help him to overcome the guilt of unintentionally killing three academy students, even if in Kasuk's opinion, Naruto was not guilty at all. But if he did feel guilt for it, then it only convinced Kasuk that the young boy would grow up to become a splendid man one day. Well, I will leave you two to get to know each other now, Sirotobi said. Listen to what Kasu tells you about Narutokan, you won't regret it and will learn much from him. He addressed the young Senju. I will, old man. I won't fail you. I promise. Naruto announced with a smile and conviction in his blue eyes. It was rather refreshing to see this new aura that emanated from Naruto, Sirotobi thought. He had high hopes for this arrangement. Now, he only needed to inform the council of it and to make sure certain members do not meddle in. Even if he warned them on their last meeting, he doubted that all of them would fall in line immediately. Those three have become too confident with their positions in the last few years. But even if he didn't trust them as he used to, Hiruzen still recognized their value. Danzm's root was a necessary evil. And despite all of their faulty views, Kahara and Hamura were good administrators who had kept the village's hierarchical system running, thus easing the burden he had to carry for the village's sake. One thing he did know is that the next few years would be interesting, particularly watching Naruto's progress. He didn't remember when was the last time he was this interested in the development of one of his ninjas. He had faith in Minato's boy. After all, the blood of the cages coursed through his veins. Naruto could one day surpass his father and greet grandfather and earn the respect of not only his home village, but the entire world. Equals equals with Naruto and Kasuk at the same time equals equals. So, Narutokan, shall we introduce ourselves? Kasuk asked, to which Naruto eagerly nodded. November 1st, the academy. The excitement was a feeling that Naruto didn't have very often. In fact, he could list the times he'd been this excited in one breath. His birthday, when the old man visited him and took him for some ramen, the moment when he moved into his new home were those moments and having a caretaker, a substitute for parents in his case. And now he had another one. Remember what I have told you about Narutokan. Listen to your teachers at the academy, do what they tell you. And when you finish your classes, we shall begin your shinobi education right away. The voice of his caretaker brought him from his thoughts. Better we don't waste our time. Naruto turned to him with a determined look and answered. I will, Uncle Kasuk, however, he suddenly faltered which made Kasuk frown. But will the teachers at the academy be okay with me there? No doubt, they know about the kickbee. 
he asked in a hushed voice so the others would not hear him. You need not worry about it, Narutakin. Hirazin told me he made sure that the staff knows not to sabotage you or anything, and he has picked the teacher for your class by himself. Kasuke answered him. He could see the look of suspicion from Naruto. They were standing in front of the academy's entrance, along with more than a hundred parents and their children who aspired to become shinobi of Konoha, yet still a bit away from the rest of the crowd. Some of them looked at Naruto with a look of disdain, but did nothing more. The sand aim could control them that much it seems. Furthermore, I think you might find some good friends in your class. He told him with one of his usual smiles. This made Naruto raise his right eyebrow. How can you be sure? I didn't have much luck in finding them until now. He kicked a small rock that laid by his feet, sending it flying away. You will see. That was the only answer he got. But Kasuke knew that Hirazin picked this class specifically, for it included seven of Konoha's strongest clan heirs and members. And some of those clan heads apparently knew about Naruto's heritage, so they might not be against their children being friends with him. They were at least more informed than your average civilian, but only time would tell. I hope so, Naruto muttered. Not long after, one of the academy's staff members arrived at the front door and told the students that they must be at their assigned classroom in half an hour. As some of them scrambled to enter, Naruto decided to stay aside for now. He had time after all. Good luck, Narutokin, Kasu told him and bid farewell. Thanks. As the dust settled, Naruto moved into the academy. While walking through the hallways he saw many of the older kids either walking or standing around, chatting, and whatnot. No one paid him any mind, but that was good enough for him. He looked around the signs that pointed to room I-4, hoping not to get lost. Luckily he didn't, and before long he arrived at the place where he would spend his early mornings till noon for the next year. As he entered the room, he noticed that the desks were covered with accessories, bags, and various items that belonged to his classmates, even if not all of them were sitting in their seats at the moment. Looking around, he saw a free seat at the back row near the window, only two boys sitting there. Perfect. It would be better to remain behind, away from the center, and attention. No doubt, once the parents of his classmates hear that he is in the class as well, they try to influence their children negatively on him. Finally knowing the reason why the adults disliked him brought a semblance of peace to Naruto's mind. He didn't like it, but he could understand them. It wouldn't mean that he would allow them to walk over him though. Is this seat taken? He asked the two boys with caution once he approached them. No, feel free to sit. The boy with black hair, tied in a spiky ponytail, answered in a bored manner as he looked up. Naruto proceeded to sit, even if the boy's mannerisms were a bit weird, he didn't detect any ill intent behind his words. Let's give it a try. I'm Namika's Naruto, happy to meet you. He hoped to make friends with the two of them. Or at least try. Narashikamaru. The black-haired boy answered him before motioning his hand to the chubby boy near him, who was currently engaged in eating chips. A and D, this is Akamichi Chinjai. Now revealed Chinjai, nodded, offering some of his snacks to Naruto. If you don't mind, thanks Chinjai. It was good that he read the book about the first introductions, as the two boys didn't seem to mind his company. Maybe Shikamaru and Shinjai were different. A flash of lightning passed through his head. They were from the Nara and Akamichi clan, one of the stronger clans of Konoha. Are you two from the Nara and Akamichi clans by any chance? He asked, just to be sure. Yeah, as our surname suggests, Shikamaru answered plainly, as if it was the most obvious thing in the world. Shikamaru eyed him curiously. You're from a civilian family, right? Something like that, I guess, Naruto said. I'm an orphan, but my caretaker is a shinobi. By any chance, did you two receive training from your clans already? He asked, hoping to change the subject as soon as possible. He wasn't keen on divulging his private life to others, even if he meant to make friends with them. Not yet. My old man said not to rush things, it would be troublesome. The Nara said. What do you mean by caretaker, anyway? He didn't adopt you. Naruto looked at Shikamaru, he didn't think anyone would catch on to that certainly not a six-year-old. Well, something like that. He vaguely said. Old family bonds. As I'm an orphan, he took care of me. Naruto hoped his answer would satisfy Shikamaru. He needed to keep his heritage a secret, at least for now. Luckily, Shikamaru accepted the answer. Do you know anyone else from the class, by the way? He asked them, further changing the subject. Blonde girl with short hair is Yamanaka Ino. This time it was Shinjai who answered his question pointing at the said girl who was engaged in girlish conversation with another pink-haired girl with a piece of chips in his hand. There are some other clan children here. The boy they are giggling at is a Jess Sasuke. Shikamaru said, rolling his eyes. Instinctively, Naruto narrowed his eyes for a moment. While Kasuke didn't start his practical training yet, he did tell him a lot about the village's history. Together with the old man Hokage, when he visited a few times last week. Naruto knew little about the Senjuchiha rivalry from their stories, but hoped everything would be good between him and Sasuke. The loudest one out there is probably an Inuzuka. 
the one with glasses looks like the Aburum. There's a Haika Eris as well, from what my dad told me, though, I don't know which one it is. Shikamaru pointed individually at two recognizable boys. There are probably more clan children, both larger and minor clans and other classes. One of my cousins is in another class. They continued to engage in conversation on various topics for some time. It was a good feeling, having someone your age to talk to. Both Shikamaru and Shinjai seemed friendly. And Naruto hoped they would stay that way. From their conversation, Naruto found out that the two of them knew each other from before, as their clans kept close ties, together with the Yamanakas. Shikamaru initially seemed bored about everything, which worried Naruto that he was a boring company to him. That is, until Shinjai whispered to him that it was a characteristic of Nara clan members to act that way. Their conversation came to an end when a female shinobi, presumably their future homeroom teacher, entered the classroom, causing those that didn't sit before to scramble to their seats. As they settled down she spoke first. Good morning class. To which all of them responded in kind. My name is Taktori Sadoru 2 and I will be your homeroom teacher for the next six years. She said with a kind smile on her face. Her eyes were of a dark blue color, while her hair was black and was tied in a top knot bun. She wore the standard chknin vest, but not pants. Instead, she used the simple hot pants that left much of her curvy legs revealed. I'm 16 years old and have been a chknin for two years now. The woman sensei. Troublesome. Naruto heard Shikamaru mutter beside him. Before I begin the introduction to your curriculum for the next six years, we will have a roll call, like every other day from now on. Right then, let's start. Sadaru sensei said in a melodic voice, after which she started calling out names, checking that they were present. When she got to his name, no incident happened, to which Naruto was grateful for, as it seemed that he would be treated no differently than the other students. Okay, now that we're finished with roll call, I'll explain to you what you're going to learn for the next six years, before officially enlisting to Kanoha's regular forces, Genin in your case. She paused to make sure they were listening. She continued explaining for the next half hour their future education, which will be divided into practical and theoretical parts. At the end of every fourth month, they will have an evaluation from the subjects that were taught during that year, in both practice and paper theoretical part. From practical, during their first year, they will learn to mold chakra, basic chakra control, that they will have to expand to other versions when they become genin, hand seals, and initial to jutsu and. From the theoretical part, which will be more present in the first four years, less in the last two, but present for the entire time, they will have mathematics, history, geography, and shinobi culture, which Naruto assumed will cover the shinobi hierarchy, organizational system, ideology of will of fire, etc. Human biology will come in with further branching of. Jinjutsu will be covered from the third year on, later on with the basics of genjutsu, and the introduction to medical ninjutsu in the last year, for those who are interested in such art. Remember one thing that our esteemed Nade Misama used to say that is important for shinobi to take care of. Those are mind technique body. She told them in the end, before dismissing them during their first day. Great grandfather's words. It stuck to Naruto. Mind technique body. It was easy to memorize them, and all in all, Naruto couldn't wait to start. After the academy, hey Naruto. He heard Shikamaru calling him as he exited the academy. Me and Shinjai are going to the playground now, want to come with us? He asked him. At the mention of a playground, Naruto's entire body froze, and his eyes widened immediately. The playground was the last place he wanted to be, memories of dismembered limbs and hands, and three dead bodies suddenly hit him, but he managed to compose himself. Um, maybe next time, I have something to do now, see you tomorrow, Shikamaru, Chijai. He quickly told them, before running back home, making sure nobody saw him as he entered the compound. Seeing his blonde classmate running off so suddenly and his demeanor from before made Shikamaru grow slightly and made him wonder if there was something more regarding this. From the little time he spent with Naruto before the class started, he could see that he was rather smart for his age like him in a way. Naras were known for their intellect, which was a trademark they were famous for. But the orphan such as Naruto was knowledgeable about many things. Not to mention his eyes, who were a bit uneasy from time to time. Was he missing something here? Maybe Naruto was simply shy before getting more familiar with someone. He would investigate it some other time, for now, he would go with Shinjai and play, probably before his mother started nagging him for not coming home early. As Naruto reached his home, he found Kasu clearing the large pond from leaves that had fallen from the nearby tree. The backyard of the main residence where Naruto and Kasu lived has been covered in grass and bushes that have spread around due to the years of neglect. For the first day after meeting Kasuke, the two of them decided to clear the main residence's backyard, which took the entirety of their day. During that time and the following week, Kasuke told many stories to Naruto, missions he had with Naruto's father and great grandfather, and a Lacerknan grandfather, Senju Bishiman, who died during the middays of the Second Shinobi World War, leaving his son, Minato, practically an orphan. 
just as many other Senjus like Tsunade's younger brother Nawaki, died during that war, further crippling the clan, whose numbers already dwindled in the first one. According to Kasuk, Bishaman was among the most powerful shinobis of Konoha at that time. While he never mastered the flying thunder god technique like his father or like his son later would, Bishaman was a master of every branch, especially when he combined it with his wind element. Dying during the battle against the Sandame Rakage, sacrificing himself to hold off the enemy so his comrades could retreat. Similarly how his father held off the Kankaku unit, protecting his students. Albeit, unlike the Nidane who died from wounds in the village later on, but not before killing the gold and silver BROTHERS3, Bishaman did not survive or kill the Sandame Rakage in the process. While spending time with him, Naruto learned many things about Kasuk as well. His caretaker apparently, even after 40 years, still blamed himself for the deaths of his comrades during a mission a long time ago, which caused him to always try and sacrifice his life during the missions, something which many people, including the Sandame Hokage, constantly reprimanded him about. Noticing him approaching, Kasuk stood up from the pond before greeting him and asking him about his first day at the academy. It was great, Uncle Kasuk. Turns out, there are a few clan heirs in my class. I got to know two of them, Nara Shikamaru and Akimichi Chinjai. We sat together and talked about countless things. As Naruto continued retelling about his first day at the academy, Kasuk could only smile. It was good to know that the Nara and Akimichi were not prejudiced against the young Senju. Their parents knew about Naruto's heritage, so they might have instructed their children to be nice to him, or at the very least like they would to everyone else. Although from Naruto's words, no such thing could be detected. It seemed they were genuinely nice. You picked a good class, Hiruzen. Asuk knew that he would need to help Naruto overcome his guilt sooner or later, after hearing why he came home earlier. He, himself, needed to fight his own demons. But he was six Ditwo, while Naruto was only six. The boy must not make the same mistakes as him. Teaching Naruto to become a shinobi and more importantly, a good man, was part of the legacy he wanted to leave behind after he died. Well Naruto-kun, seeing as the academy is over today, how would you like to start your training early? He asked him. I'm ready, uncle. It was a nice feeling of having someone refer to him like that. He never married and his family was long dead. He considered his village as his family. A notion that the Nidame told him to follow. But this was different, it was far more satisfying. Let us begin then. Three months later, that would be all for today, Naruto-kun, Kasuk said to him as their daily training regime was finished. Every day after the academy, where Naruto would spend around eight hours from the early morning he would train with Kasuk for the rest of the day. Initially, it was just like in the academy, only chakra control. A long and tiresome exercise that seemed pointless at first. Learning necessary hand seals was at least somewhat more interesting. After the first two weeks, he began learning the basic tojutsu katas that were also the first steps towards the more advanced tojutsu styles. Those were taught throughout Kanoha to the standard shinobi forces, which were largely composed of the ninjas with a civilian background, shinobi who didn't have the clans to rely on for their progress. But instead of those standard ones, Naruto, for his tojutsu training with Kasuk, took one scroll which had Nidame's tojutsu style written on it. Fortunately for him, Kasuk, even if he did not know that particular style, was able to help Naruto get into its initial forms. But the style itself was a lot more complex than it seemed at first hand. It was based on agility and speed, which had also made his great grandfather famous. Speed and agility that Naruto didn't have at the moment. I must also regrettably inform you that I have a mission tomorrow. Naruto's face morphed into a frown as he heard that. How long will it last? One week at most, unless something drastic happens. Ever since the first day he met him, Naruto knew that Kasuk would have to, sooner or later return to do missions albeit not as often as he used to. I have prepared everything that you will need for the time I'm not here. He continued listing things as they sat on the nearby garden bench to rest. If you need anything from the village, don't hesitate and use the transformation technique you were taught. He could do that. It was the first technique Kasuk had taught him after he properly learned how to mold chakra. Aside from that, he had also learned the body replacement technique and the body flicker technique just last week, but not after being drilled into the long chakra control exercises of the tree walking and the water walking, much to Kasuk's dismay, after finding out that the tree and water walking were taught only once one became a genin. Being a jinch cricky and having the large chakra reserves, both from the beast that was sealed inside him and blood of his clans, it was prudent for Naruto to know them. After finishing his duties with Kasuk, Naruto went inside his house, getting himself something to eat, before going to his father's working room within the building. Which was also the office of his grandfather and great-grandfather in their time. It was a rather large room with no windows as it was located in the middle of the residence, flanked by other rooms from both sides, plus connected to the Hokage's hill directly. The first time he entered the room, he was in awe of the countless books he found. 
from history books to geographical, religious, adventurous to even the three romance books that the old man always read. And the dust. Everything, along with the rest of the house was covered with it. Naruto had to clean it all himself, for no one else could enter those parts of his home but him. For the first two days after moving into his new home, Naruto had spent his free time reading whatever had caught his hand first. There were countless instruction manuals on how to be a shinobi, introductions to different ninja arts, including the elemental manipulation and the training regimes that the Senju clan practiced during the Warring States era. But aside from the introductions, there was not much more on those topics. There were various other scrolls with different techniques, but they were up to the brank at most, apparently. Still, you do with what you had at hand. He showed some of the training regimes from the Warring States to Kasuk, to which the man smiled and told him that the Nidame would also drill all of his students with the same heat. Nonetheless, Naruto easily found out why his clan was feared during their time. To even use the resistance seals contrary to the more common weights. It not only increased their already large chakra reserves, but also the speed during the battle once the seals were turned off. It made Naruto ponder on how his clan got decimated so easily with the power they possessed. The Sandame had told him that many of his clansmen, being the prodigies in their own rights, graduated early from the academy. And considering the village was in a state of war with other nations for a large part of its existence, they had no choice but to deploy the young when needed. Naruto sighed. As the old man said, you learn from your mistakes. He hoped not to die early, as life was just getting better. Since Sunday was the day off with no classes. The only day during the week they had that generosity, Naruto could stay awake a little more. Currently, he was reading the official history of the Third Great Ninja War, battles that were fought, particularly the battles in which his father has fought, and his rivalry with the son of the Third Reikage, who was also a designated heir to the seat of the Reikage, being the Yandane Reikage now in his own right. Along with a dictionary book for any word he did not know the meaning of to help him right away. Completely lost in time as he read, Naruto ignored a loud hooting of the owls from the outside. Eventually, a small yawn caught him, and he accidentally pushed a wooden cup to the back of the table, which was a mere inch separated from the wall, with just enough space for the said cup to fall through. Luckily it was empty, so the floor wouldn't get wet, and no damage to the parquet would be made. Plus, he wouldn't need to try and move the supposedly unmovable table that it looked like it grew from the ground floor itself. Ugh, getting clumsy like this, Naruto grumbled as he stood up over the table to try to pick up the cup. But as he leaned forward and moved his hand over the small space between the table and the wall, the built-in bookshelf to his left side started moving slowly further left, catching him off guard. Well, what is this? Waiting for the bookshelf to stop moving which it did, Naruto completely forgot about the cup and turned his attention towards the bookshelf. Now fully moved, a place where the bookshelf was formerly in place, an entrance to the Madaritasized tunnel that went deep into the hill with staircases going down and sconces at the wall, supporting the potential torches was revealed. Looking down the place between the table and the wall, Naruto saw a glimpse of a wooden cup that was on top of a rather unnoticeable switch from a normal point of view. Cup must have triggered the opening. And a bookshelf acted as the door. As he had a free date tomorrow, Naruto decided to investigate it further into the night. Taking a nearby lampshade with him he started walking into the tunnel. At the very entrance, he saw another switch with a similar shape like the one behind the desk, only on the wall. Figuring it will simply close the door, he turned it on, proceeding to walk further into the cave and carefully stepping on each stair, his right hand holding the lampshade, the left one leaning on the wall as walked down. The wall on which he leaned was layered in the invisible chakra, invisible to the normal eye, similarly to the walls of his home, a layer of chakra that prevented outsiders from coming in. I will need to have some torches placed here one day. After 10 meters or so of the quiet walk, he finally got to another room, larger than his own. There were various bookcases on the edges and one working table to his right. This must be the clan's secret library. One that only the current clan head would have known of. What would happen to this place if my father had died childless? He didn't want to dwell on that thought, proceeding to look around. Bamboo and wooden scrolls instead of the usual paper ones were, for the most part, the most populous inhabitants of the various bookcases that graced this large room. Probably to survive the test of time. That didn't mean there weren't other books as well. Books that his normal library didn't have, as he saw some titles for the first time. What is seduction and how to counter it? Was one of the titles he saw. One of the titles he saw for the first time. In one corner of the room, there was a large shelf with various weaponry and armory, from the flying thunder god kunai that were hanging on the wall, to the beautiful colophilar kusirigama and one katana that had the senju clan symbol engraved on its sides. There was one object that greatly resembled Bajra from the symbol of his clan. Gently taking it as it was a religious relic well to Naruto, anything from his family's possession was, he inspected it with curiosity. 
due to his excitement, with both blood and chakra running wild through his body, like a river torrent on a stormy day with winds making it faster than usual, a strange object suddenly lighted itself, full in bright yellow color and magnificent glory, almost making him drop the lampshade. Like lighting. Naruto instantly thought. Wait. Lighting. This must be the Sword of the Thunder God, great-grandfather's sword that he used in battle with his own Horatian kunai. He knew about it from stories Kasuke had told him. Those stories were always spoken with a great deal of awe and respect that his caretaker held for Naruto's ancestors. Amazing. He uttered out loud for the first time since coming to this room. Turning it off and gently laying it down, he looked at other objects that were there. There was one of his father's coats he wore after becoming Hokage. But what mesmerized Naruto the most was the blue armor that stood attached to a wooden doll with dirty white fur and spider webs around it. This must be Nadeem's battle armor. One he wore during the Warring States era and in which he fought his last battle. He said to himself as he made the line from dust, tracing his small fingers across its stomach. A picture he saw in the history books flashed in front of his eyes as he imagined the man who wore it during his time. I can't believe a place such as this actually exists. He looked towards one part of the room with its entire side filled with a line of bookcases that had the ninjutsu written at the center above it. Approaching it, he looked around the various wooden scrolls that each had its own small sign on what it contained. Shadow clone technique. Shrugging off his shoulders, Naruto took it, perhaps he would be able to learn it. If it was different from the one the academy is supposed to teach from the second year onwards, maybe he'll be able to master it. A regular clone was borderline impossible for him to learn, no matter how much chakra control exercises he performed he could mold chakra the correct way. But he would always produce one sickly clone laying on the ground. Half drooling, half sleeping. It won't hurt to try. He hoped. Apparently, this technique was created by Nidame himself, who also created its various other variations, Naruto noticed as he read the scroll and its contents. Having to fight the Ichihas since I could walk, I learned that there is nothing more infuriating than having your hard work stolen. Spending weeks, even months, creating, perfecting, mastering, new techniques, only to have a member of that cursed clan flash his red eyes and simply copy it, it would make even a member of the Nara clan roll up. Hidden clan techniques are generally harder to copy as other clans do not fight the Ichihas as much as we, Senjas do. Not to mention, reducing hand seal is necessary to perform it. So why not create something that could kill two fleas with one hit? But what? The answer is the shadow clones. All the Achihas tend to be predictable fighters, even with their Sharingan, I'd rather not have someone sneak out from the fight and later distribute my hard work to them. To even use it against my own clansmen. Unfortunately, it has happened already. The Shadow Clone technique, while splits the user's chakra, can also kill the user if he doesn't have enough of it. Something which the Achihas in general do not have. At least by the Senju and Yuzumaki standards. There is nothing more satisfying than having your opponent cripple himself during the fight, making your job a lot easier because that's what shinobis do they win. Not by honorable means, for we are not samurais. We simply win. The following part of the bamboo scroll contained the drawn explanation of a simple hand seal, required to make the shadow clone, and the way chakra should be molded to create it. Naruto found it easy to learn, and given his already large chakra reserves, he doubted the jutsu would have had some negative effects on him. The Nidame himself had a large and powerful chakra, but even he didn't have one like the Jinch Krikis did. The rest of the scroll explained the other purposes of the jutsu, the jutsu that had more flexible use than Naruto originally thought it would. It could transfer anything the clone learned to the original. It was also good for spying and intelligence gathering missions. Ideas running through his mind, Naruto imagined what he could do once he mastered it. Sending clones to the academy for theoretical work. Yes, he would do that. Help him with elemental manipulation once he starts learning it. Yes, he will do that. Help me in a fight and overcome the opponent with sheer numbers. It was an unorthodox approach to fighting, sure, as it would pointlessly waste chakra. But still. This jutsu was a goldmine of possibilities. He did not fight a foolish grin from appearing on his face as he fantasized about it. At the thought of elemental manipulation, Naruto looked around the other bookcases of the room and found a few that had countless scrolls for each element. While his regular library had those as well, this one had the advanced and hiring techniques, as well as the theory and explanation from which he could develop some techniques further. Looking around he saw one book about the theory behind the bloodline mutations. But for now, he would not touch that. He would go step by step. He returned to his room not soon after and went to sleep, snuggling in his warm bed. Though the snow was not present, it was still January, and the nights were cold. He had a free day once he woke up and he was going to use it the best way he could. Tomorrow, outside of Naruto's house, standing in the middle of his backyard where he had usually practiced his tojutsu and basics with Kasuke, Naruto prepared himself to perform the shadow clone technique he had read about last night. Kasuke already went on a mission. 
and Naruto had to imagine his face once he saw him do it. Inhaling rather than exhaling a few times, Naruto made a shadow clone hand seal, molded chakra the way it was needed, and poured as much as he could into use, in the end saying. Shadow clone jutsu. As soon as he did that, everything around him was covered in smoke. The Hokage's office, sitting in his office, overlooking some paperwork that he was buried in, Saratobi suddenly felt a large surge of Naruto's chakra coming from the east, his home. Not thinking about paperwork for a second anymore, Saratobi body flickered out of his office, his Anbu guards following him in his wake. As soon as he arrived at the Senju compound, he was astonished by the sheer number of blonde heads that covered the surroundings. Even the roofs of the nearby storage buildings had been covered with them. Quickly compassing himself, while some of his Anbus were still in a state of shock, he decided to approach the young Senju and get some answers out of him. Oh, good day Hikaji-sama. What brings you out here? Naruto asked grinning like he never did before. Proud of himself with the amount of shadow clones he made. Senju Tabarama in the scroll suggested that those who had large chakra should make 10 clones at most, even if he himself could create more than that. Mostly for the sake of effectiveness. Although chakra would return to the original user, unless of course completely wasted from the clone side or dispelled during the combat. It would be a strategic blunder to leave the main body weak, even for a moment. Neither Sharingan or Byakugan could see through it. And Nidane was not the man to take the risks needlessly. Naritakin, what were you thinking using this jutsu? Don't you know it is dangerous? He questioned sternly. What was Kasu thinking of teaching it to you? Uh? Uncle Kasu didn't teach me shadow clones. Naruto said, the mirth in his eyes was still present, though his face looked like it was made of flat stone. Then who did? The Hokage questioned further. Naruto for a moment looked towards the other Anbus who were present, all of them looking at him behind their masks, but the gaze of their eyes was felt upon his body, then towards Hokage himself. I found a scroll about it in my library. He omitted saying which library. If an old man could figure it out somehow, he would keep it to himself. As the head of his own clan, he should understand the need to keep some things secret. Saratobi in the meantime wanted to slap himself for forgetting that it was his sensei who created that jutsu. Of course he would have it personally, even if he declared it to be a. One of the few that many shinobis didn't want to use even if they had some desire. I see. But you should know it is dangerous. Some ninjas died trying to perform it. He told him, still serious from the entire situation. I know, the scroll said as much. But it is still easier for me, as I already have large reserves plus my tenant who constantly expands them. Among other things. He didn't need to mention resistant seals that Kasuk showed him how to place on himself. It was much safer if the user did it himself, as it could prevent someone else from using it against him during the fight. And adding additional levels later when he wanted. Not to mention, he wanted to surprise the old man one day when he decided to test him. Suratobi sighed. Very well, but please for my sake, don't use it around the village. I don't want people being suspicious of you and complaining later on. For whatever reason they may come up with. I understand, old man. Oh, I almost forgot. Don't use it with its variations, at least not on this scale. If he had a scroll for regular shadow clones, shadow clone explosion would be no exception. With that said Saratobi and his Anbu left Naruto and returned to the tower. Naruto simply smirked and promised he wouldn't before he left, after which he ordered his clones to dispel. Which might not have been his brightest idea as he was suddenly hit with memories of all 100 of his clones. Clutching his head in slight pain, Naruto moaned. Ugh, I need to learn how to sort out memories in a better way. Scroll explained that it would be best to do it one by one, or if one had very good chakra control, to sort the memories out in his brain with more numbers. In the meantime, Saratobi thought as he walked towards his office. I wonder how those three would react if I told them the amount of shadow clones Naritakin can make. That very thought brought a smile to Hiruzen's face. Ever since he was young, he enjoyed seeing flabbergasted expressions on their faces. Danzen was better at keeping his emotions in check and away from the public's eye. Saratobi couldn't remember when was the last time he saw his rival speechless or dumbfounded about anything. When Minato was chosen as Yandane, he could at least see him growling. Heart attack maybe? He continued imagining how that conversation could develop. Danzen's potential expression could make it to the history books, but the thought of it in him suddenly made Hiruzen frown. Anzm would no doubt attempt to kidnap Naruto and brainwash him into his personal drone if he knew Naruto's almost limitless potential. Even if he didn't tell him about Naruto's progress, the Warhawk would no doubt find himself. Gritting his teeth, Hiruzen knew he would need another conversation with him. Despite all the warnings, he could never be sure. As Kasuk went on a northeastern border with the Land of Hot Water to help the teams there reinforce the defense of the borders of the Land of Fire. He would need to place additional guards around Naruto's home for the duration of Kasuk's absence.
On any sane day, he would execute the man for defying him, but since the new year, the Achuha clan has been even more restless for being suspected of being guilty of the Kikbi's attack. New arrangements would need to be made for the time being. Hat. Sandane called out one of his Anbu who momentarily appeared before her leader. Yes Hikajusama. Arrange with Boar and Falcon to do guard duty for Narutakan for the duration of seven days. The mission might be prolonged depending on the situation. At least one of you has to be watching him while he is out of his house all the time, even when Kasu comes back. Dismissed. The Anbu in question nodded and went on to make the arrangements for the mission. Three Anbus from six who knew about Naruto's incident from a few months ago. Kasu could hopefully finish his mission on time. There weren't many Shinobis older than 60 with his experience and knowledge of the Land of Fire's terrain. That's why his presence was needed there. Otherwise, Saratobi would need to bring in some other people into this case, omitting certain truths of course. But Naruto at the same time, after resting for a bit, Naruto decided to do the basic physical exercises that he had done with Uncle Kasuk before. The next thing he did was perfecting the body replacement technique and body flicker technique. Kasuk told him that he should never underestimate low-rank jutsu such as that one, for it was a life savior on the battlefield. As he performed various katas, Kasuk taught him, Naruto realized it was better if he had a partner to spar with. Quickly making another shadow clone he began sparring with him careful not to dispel the clone. He didn't need to worry himself regarding that. Another clone would take his place. But following Nidame's words mind technique body, it was prudent of him to know how strong of a hit he would land on his opponent, when he would land the hit, and how he would land a hit. Genjutsu was an art he had not only hoped to learn but needed to, given his status. While initially resentful of his father for placing such a burden on him with passing time, the anger lessened. Now Naruto understood the dilemma his father probably had. The Shadai Hokage, Senju Hashirama, was the one who captured the Kikbi and other tailed beasts. Forcing someone else to carry the weight and balance of the elemental nations was out of the question. Being the Hokage at the time didn't help either. Village was founded on the principle of will of fire, an ideal that his clan embodied most of all sacrificing your own happiness for the greater good. If he wasn't ready to sacrifice the happiness of his only son for the sake of the village, how could he expect others to do the same, even if many of them spat on his wish later? Hearing his stomach grumble in hunger, Naruto decided to go to the village and get some raiment to eat. Using a hinge, he transformed into an older, imaginary version of himself with red hair without whiskers, and went on his way. Gucci and his young daughter were always welcoming of him in their shop, and they knew about his hinge as he told them. It wouldn't do good to freak them out if his hinge dropped, or even for them to freak out, hearing an order of nine bowls of Maizo Raymond from someone that was not him. Few times, Naruto noticed people suddenly leaving if they saw him enter the shop, or even if they approached it, they would pass it by with disdain in their ugly eyes when they saw him in. After all, eyes are the reflection of the soul. The Academy, 1st February, the day we will be having our first traditional shinobi spar class, Satoru Sensei told them. Please be quiet as you step out of the room. We don't want to disturb other classes. There was an immediate chorus of happy and excited shouts from the children. Sidoru sighed at the utter disregard for her order. They'll learn in time. Hopefully. Troublesome. I hope I won't have to fight today. Shikamaru mumbled beside Naruto. For three months after meeting Shikamaru and Shinjai, Naruto remained friends with them. While he still didn't go to the playground. He would always have lunch with them at the academy. On a few occasions, Shikamaru brought a shogi board with him and asked him if he wanted to play. While never playing it before, Naruto quickly started catching up after Shikamaru taught him how on one of their breaks, if the serious expression on Nara's face during their last two matches was any indication. As they arrived at the academy's field that was meant for practice, Satoru Sensei started explaining rules and rituals before and after every spar. Regarding the actual spar itself, for now, they would pick two students randomly by opening their sheet record to see if they practiced any of the actual kata they were taught previously. Okay, the first draw is Ichiha Sasuke, Satoru Sensei announced. At the same time, many of the girls squealed in delight at seeing him in action. The other one is Namika's Naruto. She told the men looked towards him, smiling. Good luck, Naruto, Chijai told him. Shikamaru offered his support as well. As they stood across each other, making a seal of confrontation, both boys were studying their respective opponents. Sasuke had a confident look on his face. The only thing he knew about Naruto was that he was an orphan, coming from a civilian background, but he had a strange aura around him which made Sasuke wary. Senses, he didn't know he had until now warned him not to be overconfident. Naruto, on the other hand, knew quite a bit about Sasuke, or better said the Ichiha clan. He knew nothing about Sasuke personally. He spent yesterday evening in his clan's secret library. Unlike his son and grandson, the Nidame had much more prejudice and distrust against the Ichihas. And while Naruto never had any bad engagement with them, he started understanding his ancestors' paranoia. 
losing two of his brothers, father, and countless other relatives during the Warring States period didn't help it either, for Tabarama was a man who neither forgive nor forget easily. But he could pass by his prejudice for the good of the village, as he had an HS student himself. Reading about some of Tabarama's ideas and personal thoughts inspired Naruto that he could do the same for the villagers. That, he would muse about later, as Sadarusensei soon announced a match with. Begin. Neither boy moved but stood in their own respective katas. Sasuke in his own Ichiha style, a predecessor before he awakens his Sharingan, after which the style itself needed to be adopted to conjure better movements with his eyes. Naruto in the meantime stood in his great-grandfather's style Sujin's FURY1, which was based on cooperation with the Suetan element, in addition to Nidame's famous speed and agility. Although Naruto didn't practice or even knew if he had that element, the style itself was flexible and focused on speed and precise hits. Similar to the Haikas clan gentle fist, yet different all the same. Sasuke narrowed his eyes. That's not the academy style. No matter, I'll still beat him. He thought confidently as he leaped forward. As Naruto saw this, knowing he was faster than Sasuke, now with his resistance seals off, stood calmly, preparing to evade when the time came. Sasuke had his fist ready to hit Naruto, exactly 30 centimeters distance between the two, before Naruto jumped and swirled around in the air, as Sasuke's arm passed where Naruto's body should have been. For a second, while he was in the air, Naruto prepared his own fist and quickly punched Sasuke right in the face, his cheek to be more precise, which caused the young Ichiha to fall to the ground immediately. The silence was a bit unnerving as everyone watched what happened. Sadaru Sensei quickly announced. Winner. Namaka's Naruto. Naruto approached Sasuke and offered his hand, which the Ichiha accepted, proceeding to ask what was that. It wasn't any of the academy's kata we're taught here. It's not. It's a work in progress, for now at least. Well, it was, even if you don't have the water affinity mastered, you still need to have your body adjusted to the style, and Naruto started learning it for give or take three weeks now. His muscles were hurting a bit now. Well, it's good. Will you teach me once you master it? Sasuke asked bluntly. Naruto raised his eyebrow in curiosity but answered nonetheless. Only if you teach me your chess style. Sasuke looked at him with a blank expression on his face, but then he smirked. Not a chance, but a fair point. Nice fight buddy. Chujai congratulated him. Thanks. What was with that style? I've never seen it before. Shikamaru asked him. It's a work in progress. Naruto only said. Shikamaru looked to accept the answer, after which three boys resumed to watch a few more spars, chatting between them in the meantime. You like gardening? The question came from Chijai. Yes, I do. Or at least I'd like to try. Naruto told him. There was a strange sense of euphoria on the notion of having such a hobby. Training and reading were fun and all. Notion of gardening almost seemed integrated in him. Do you guys know where I can buy some seeds? Try the Amanaka flower shop. Aside from flowers, they also sell seeds for those who want to garden. Shikamaru suggested. I didn't know the ninja clan did that type of business. Naruto wondered. All clans do. Shikamaru said it was the most common thing in the world. At Naruto's raised eyebrow he continued. Troublesome. But all larger clans have different sources of income. Yamanaka, Nara, and Akamichi have a partnership between us. Yamanaka supplies us both with various plants from which the Nara clan makes medicines to supply Kanoha's hospital and shinobi forces, just like Akamichi's make food pills. Other clans have their own type of income growth, though I'm not familiar with them. That is what my old man told me once. I see, it would be hard to keep the income high as not everyone in the clan is shinobi. And those who are with most of the time have their own families within the clan to support, in addition to the clan itself. So these businesses are generally safe from the dangers some hiring missions can possess, but still give you guys a fairly good source of wealth. Am I right? Naruto concluded. Shikamaru smiled and said. You are. So, will you visit the Yamanaka flower shop today, then? Naruto nodded I would like to. Will you show me where it is? Sure, my mom wants me to pick up some flowers for her, even if she could do it herself. Says it's to cure my laziness whatever that means. So, meet you here in the afternoon today, is that okay? It is. Two years later. Naruto age. 8. Okage's office. Rubbing his temples, Saratobi sighed as the thoughts about the events from four months ago appeared in front of his eyes. He always tried banishing hatred from his heart due to his profession, as it was one of the emotions that would hinder his ability to be a shinobi and could potentially be his downfall as the Hokage. Just like Sensei told him before he died. But he couldn't feel anything but hatred and sorrow right now. Hate towards Fugaku for his plan to start a coup d'etat and to try and use Naruto as a means to divert Hiruzen's attention away from his clan. But also to later use the boy as a weapon to have better control over the village. Fugaku was not as honorable a man as he had led everyone else to believe. 
Two weeks before Itachi did what he did there was a break in the security, as the information was leaked to the rest of the village that it was Naruto who killed the three academy students who bullied him. The bullying part of the information being omitted from the rumor. Well he wanted to simply execute Fugaku for leaking it, as it was he who did it according to Itachi he couldn't. The Ichiha clan as a whole was far too involved in the coup. Had Danzm not ordered Itachi to eliminate them, a civil war might have broken out in the village anyway. The Ichihas may not have possessed the manpower to overthrow him. Far from it. But it would cause much wider damage, as they could use the civilians to gain wider support. The worst part. Many Shinobis originally came from civilian backgrounds. Some of them could be swayed. The village was weakened enough from the Kikbi's attack. More bloodshed was not needed. Ironic. Though, the villagers were a double-edged sword, as many of them held a deep sense of distrust towards the Ichihas as well. It was a gamble that Fugaku was willing to take, but Hiruzen was not. That's where he planned to use Naruto for his vile goal. Danzm was the second person Hiruzen hated. Had he not created friction with the Ichihas in the first place, none of this would have had to happen. Saratobi ordered him to disband the route, but he had doubted that his rival would simply do as he had asked. He probably just went further into the underground. Hiruzen would let him continue to defend the Konoha from the dark, mostly because he didn't know what to do with more than a hundred highly trained drones. At the very least, he could stop him from recruiting this way. This made him hate the third person most himself. Had he been the true shinobi as Tabiru Masensei always envisioned him to be, the day Orochimaru escaped, countless problems could have been avoided. Jiraiya would not need to run around the elemental nations, chasing after him, fixing Hiruzen's mistakes. Jiraiya could stay in the village with his godson. Naruto would not be alone for the first few years of his life and would not need to unleash the wind element to defend himself at the age of six. Had he not been a sentimental craven, he would have executed Danzm a long time ago and would not have walked around and did as he pleased. Now, too deeply involved and in order to defend Konoha from potential threats, he allowed Danzm to walk freely, again. The result of his weakness. 455 dead Ichihas, including 47 children from which six were just out of the cradle. Ichiha Sasuke being the last Ichiha alive. Last loyal Ichiha. Hiruzen corrected himself mentally. Naruto Namek is the last loyal Senju becoming even more introverted and slightly misanthropic toward certain villagers. Kasuk reported that the boy was pretty normal outside of the wider circles of society, contrary to his appearances in public. But it wasn't healthy behavior. He didn't want the boy to become a certain type of eccentric person. While he still had two friends in Nara and Akamichi boys, he was distanced from the rest of the class much like Sasuke was. But while for Sasuke, his classmates reserved pity, for Naruto they felt fear. This was all too much for him to bear. If only Tsunade would decide to return to the village and become the Hokage. She was young, in her own way. But she had a reputation of being a hothead who didn't take a no for an answer. If she ordered the villagers not to shun Naruto, they would probably kiss the ground he walked over. Maybe he was exaggerating, but she was the perfect candidate, as Jiraiya didn't want the job. Sometimes he felt that the two world wars, during which he led the village, were far easier than the political climate ever since Minato died. Rebuilding the village from the damage of the Kikbi's attack. Reorganizing shinobi forces and forcing retired ninjas on active duty. Funding for the orphans from the war and the attack, the latter of one leaving many more than the war itself. The Haika affair, Naruto's incident, and finally the latest one, Ichiha's plan for the coup d'etat. If only Jiraiya was here right now. Did you miss me, Sarita Bisensei? Speak of the devil. Jiraiya. Hiruzen happily exclaimed, his eyes lighting up in a joy he rarely felt in the past few years. What's with a gloomy look, old man? You're fifty years too late to refuse the job. Jiraiya joked as he entered the office through the window. It's yours if you want to take the carriage from this old man's back. Ass. Sanin raised his hand in defense, smile still intact. Hiruzen smiled, he needed someone to talk to. Someone he could trust with no reservation. Ordering his Anbu to leave and setting up the privacy seals, he turned to his student. You have no idea how happy I'm to see you Jiraiya. I've been looking everywhere for you for nearly two years. Jiraiya, still keeping a small smile on his face, took a seat in front of the Hokage. You know the spymaster's job, Sensei. I needed to lay low for a while. Especially when searching for Orochimaru. Settling up in a serious expression, Hiruzen asked him. What have you last heard of him? Did he defect it to some other village? It would be even more prudent to eliminate him. If he defected to Kumo or Iwa, there was no question that they would need to reorganize their entire defenses. There was no telling what Orochimaru would tell them. But that was a low possibility. For all their rivalry and hate with Konoha Kumo and Iwa hated Orochimaru for killing some of their top shinobis and being one of the most militarist figures among their prime enemy forces, the one who pushed for further war with them. Kiri was a possibility as it had a lot of bloodline holders. Something Orochimaru loved dearly. 
but being a caste-based society with paranoiac leadership, suspicious of its own citizens. Kiri would be hard-pressed to accept him. The most likely scenario is that they would execute him and try to figure out Kanoha's weaknesses, by themself. No. At least not in a traditional sense. Jureus started. I found out that he was keeping some connections with a few of the clans in the land of rice fields ever since the start of the Third War. One branch of the Fma clan, Cheyenne, and I, and various others. There is also rumor of a hidden village forming in that country. Aren't they 60 years too late for that? Saratobi snorted and as did Jiraiya, but his expression turned serious after a while. We'll need to investigate that in any case. If Arachimaru is behind its creation, he will definitely pose an even greater threat to us in the future. A new hidden village that borders us is a potential threat. Especially if Arachimaru is behind it. We've never had good relations with those clans. There is more, Sensei, Jiraiya said after a small pause. Shortly after fleeing the village and before formally creating his own, Arachimaru joined a criminal organization, the one named the Akatsuki, composed of a few other Srank Masingans. Hirazan's eyes widened. Srank Shinobis were not so easily found under a rock. In fact, right now, they could be listed in Kanoha on one hand, all five fingers not needed. Do you know any of their members? Aside from Arachimaru of course. And? He slowly asked. He himself knew one already. The one who said he would join, Hirazan remembered. No, but you know one of them. In fact, you placed him in a position to join them, didn't you sensei? Jiraiya said, not letting Hirazan even finish his thoughts. Keeping his straight face, Hirazan closed his eyes and nodded, muttering. Itachikan. Yes. Him. Jiraiya confirmed, nodding as he spoke. You don't know how shocked I was when he sent one of his crows and caught me in that of his for a second, Jiraiya said, smirking. I must be getting rusty lately. Anyway, after he caught me, he told me of his mission against his clan. Political climate in the village, prior to the massacre of course. Including the incident about Naruto. Jiraiya glared at Hirazan after mentioning the name of his godson. Hirazan simply continued nodding with his eyes closed. I will tell you everything about Narutokan, Jiraiya, after you tell me of this Akatsuki organization. Before he left, Itachi told me he would join them, but nothing more. Jiraiya sighed and stood up, approaching the window of the Hokage's office, looking at the village in the distance. In truth, I don't know that much about them. The actual members are ghouls. Itachi told me he will deliver more information on them after he establishes himself for some time. Smiling at the next thought, Jiraiya continued. But he did tell me just before I arrived here, again via his crows, that Arachimaru tried to take him and his Sharingan. I see that the deluded student of mine failed in his endeavor, Saratobi smirked as he spoke. What happened after that? Not much, aside from Arachimaru fleeing. Possibly towards the clans of the land of rice fields. Jiraiya answered. We can safely assume that the Akatsuki and Arachimaru will be at each other's throats for a while. Initially, I wanted to suggest you send a few teams and investigate those clans, but if the Rice Daemon has given him asylum and word gets out we're having incursions into a country that is not in any sort of alliance or agreement with the Land of Fire. It could cause an international incident worse, a new world war. It would be best if I go there and try to investigate it myself. Indeed, Saratobi said. I know that the Fire Daemon would support us if it got to that. He always did, ever since he ascended to his position. But I don't want to abuse his fondness for us. If we did send a few platoons, the Rice Daemon could call upon other neighboring countries and make it like we're invading them for more land, where we would be drawn to war with other smaller villages. I have no fear that we would beat them, but it could potentially weaken us and give more leverage to either Kumo or Iwa to take the chance and act against us. I don't want another episode of the Haika affair. One was more than enough. The last words were spoken by Saratobi with gritted teeth. After lighting his pipe, inhaling and exhaling some smoke, Saratobi spoke. Officially. We will do nothing but watch, for now, that is. With all that has happened in the last few years, there is nothing more we can do. You on the other hand should try to find out as much as you can. Gureya nodded. I'll keep my eyes open on this small war between the Akatsuki and Arachimaru. If they end up destroying each other in the process, good for us. One of them should be weakened by the end. We could use that. Saratobi grunted in affirmation. Now? Tell me about these incidents with Naruto. Jiraiya said with a serious expression, taking his seat once again. Saratobi waited for a few moments before replying. Very well. For the duration of the following half hour, Jiraiya listened to everything that Hiruzen had told him. From the first time Naruto had unintentionally used the wind element to his time at the academy. Listening to Saratobi speak, Jiraiya had to occasionally frown and sometimes smile after hearing that Minato's boy was a top student, not just in class, but the entire academy. It seems that the talent passed from father to son, each generation of the Senju clan. Jiraiya had no doubts that Kasu thought of him well. It looked as if the eternal genin had finally decided to leave his shell of self-loathing. 
it especially pleased him when he heard that Naruto was friends with the heirs of the Nara and Akamichi clans, even after the truth about the incident was revealed to the public. Shikaku and Shmza had good sons to lead their families one day. Even if Minato's boy was a bit introverted, according to what Sensei said, he was highly intelligent. He hoped that Naruto could see the reason for his prolonged absence. He should be at the academy now, right? Jiraiya asked after hearing the full story. Yes, they're having a Tejutsu class right now, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I'm going to watch it. Saratobi raised his right eyebrow no research right away. That's unusual. He smirked. Some other time, Sensei. This is my priority now. Jiraiya said, smiling, but in a serious tone. At the academy's training ground, Atano Anagi against Namika's Naruto. Begin. Satoru Sensei announced after pairing them together for Tejutsu Spar. Anagi stood at his side of the sparring field, looking at Naruto with fear in his eyes. Why the hell was he paired with him? For the first year and a half of the academy, Anagi didn't think much of Naruto aside from being good at everything he did. Good didn't do him justice. Naruto was the best at everything. Shuriken and kunai throwing. He'll hit every target he was told. Geography. He'll tell you about the types of trees that grow in the land of waterfalls. History. He'll tell you about the battle Nidame Hokage had with the Kinkaku unit like he was there himself. The most disturbing part about him was the story about the incident that happened two years ago. The incident where he killed three older academy students with wind ninjutsu, as some rumors said. What was he? Why was he allowed to enter the academy after doing that? Anagi remembered the time when he and Hibachi called him a geek, nerd. Out of jealousy. Thoughts about what his blonde classmate could do to him after revelations brought shivers to his body. But standing in his academy kata facing Naruto, adjusting his glasses, he tried putting his false sense of courage. He practiced with his older Chiknin brother. He would put up a fight, even if he lost. But fear in his eyes and shivers in his body never left him. Shinobi rule number 18. Were the words that left Naruto's mouth before he leaped forward. Inagi's eyes widened at the show of speed as Naruto surged towards him, his own fighting style in place, hitting Inagi's shaken hand away before leaving his straight hand in front of his eyes. A shinobi must never show any weakness, Naruto said seriously before leaving the sparring ground, not bothering to do a seal of reconciliation. But what if you don't have strength against a demon? At the academy's rooftop, this is what I was telling you about, Siratobi said. He goes leaps and bounds compared to his peers. I could let him graduate early, he could have been made Chiknin now. Kakashi certainly did before him. But you know how many Senjus died doing that. In times of peace we are, but nothing is certain once you go outside. Saratobi finished and inhaled smoke from his pipe. Gureya said nothing but kept looking down from the roof at his godson. He knew that style of fighting, at least from the history books, when he saw the fighting pose of the Nidame Hokage. Deadly fighting style, Naruto looked like he was adept at it, if his standing was any indication. He hoped his godson would open up to him, even if he failed him as a godfather for most of his life. You can talk to him after classes, for now, let's go and eat something, Saratobi suggested. And I want you to tell me if you found anything new about Tsunade. After the academy's classes, see you tomorrow. Later. Shikamaru told him after departing from the academy and going in his own direction. Naruto continued on his way home. Uncle Kasu had an entire free week, so he could help him further his water elemental manipulation. For now, he was at the second stage of the said manipulation, while the wind would come later on. He found out that he had an extremely strong affinity for the water, in addition to an equally strong affinity to the wind. Offensive and defensive elements. His clan's library said that if one could master the wind to its fullest extent, he could utilize it as a defense as well. The water could be offensive too, although he did not need to master it to the fullest if he wanted to use it that way. Nonetheless, Naruto was adamant in mastering both. Entering through the backyard door to his home, Naruto found Kasuke, the Sandame Hokage, and a tall white-haired man talking friendly to each other. He looks kind of familiar. Naruto thought before it clicked him. This was Jiraiya of the Sanin, his father's sensei, and of the finest shinobi that Kanoha has ever produced. And his godfather on top of that. Now, what would he look for in eight years? He would find out anyway. Uncle Kasuke, old man, Naruto called with a small smile on his face. These people never shunned him either for the fox or the incident. Uncle Kasuke was not just his trainer, but a family as well. Old man as well. He would occasionally invite him for lunch at his tower when Kasuke was away for a mission. Gureyasama, Naruto said formally, trying to keep his tone as flat as possible. No need to be formal around me kid, I'm not the one for it either, Jureya said smiling. Since you already know about Jureya here, he wanted to speak to you about some things, Sandame said a bit awkwardly. Granted, he already told Naruto who his godfather was when he told him about the fox. But some things happened over a period of two years. 
Anyhow, I have something to say with Kasuke here, so I leave you two to talk, Sirotobi said, and, along with Kasuke, left two of them alone. Silence stretched between them, and it obviously became unbearable for Jiraiya. So, uh. I guess since you already know who I am, there is no need for an introduction. He. He said sheepishly. Let's go inside, Naruto said, leading Jiraiya to the part of the house that was not covered in seals. As they walked in silence, Jiraiya looked around the house, memories of walking through it with Minato, sometimes, when he was at the village, sleeping here. Minato always invited him in. The man was like a son to him. Hopefully, Naruto would let him into his life as well. After a short walk, they arrived in the living room. Naruto motioned for Jiraiya to sit at the nearby furniture, while he himself sat on another. Silence stretched once again, and Jiraiya decided to break it once it became awkward. So, uh. Look, Naruto, I know you're angry with me for not being the. He didn't continue further as Naruto held his little arm up. I'm not angry with you. You're not. No. Well, I was at the beginning and later when the village found out about the incident. I resented you for a time because if you took me with you, none of it would have happened to me. But, the old man had always told me about your missions and how dangerous it would be for me outside the village. Not to mention your other teammate who is a dangerous enemy. Naruto said. It was true. Old man told him about Jiraiya's job. As well as the fact that his godfather did take care of him for the first few months of his life, just before Rachimaru went rogue. No, I could have done more. I could have found Tsunade, so at least she could take care of you, but then Rachimaru betrayed us, and I had to hunt him down. Naruto cut him off. No need to worry, I'm not the one to wallow in self-pity anyway. So I won't turn you away. I would be a hypocrite if I did anyway. Huh? Jiraiya was puzzled. As I said, I was initially bitter at you for abandoning me, but as the time went by and I spent time reading some of my father's writings, I changed that opinion. He always spoke highly of you and said you were one of the most responsible Konohinans at his time, doing the best of your abilities for the good of the village. Jiraiya stood up and walked over to Naruto, sitting beside him and placing his hand on his shoulder. You don't need to feel so let down, my boy. And you don't need to be so lenient towards me either. I failed as a godfather, and I'm sure Minato will not forgive me either, regardless of the duty I had. Not to mention Kashina. Jiraiya said with a sad smile. Well, I always wanted to have a large family myself. I have a wise and experienced uncle, old man Hokage is a grandfather, and what is another grandfather as well. Even if he's a pervert. Naruto smirked in the end. Wait, wait, wait just a second. How the hell do you know I'm a pervert? I didn't even do my introduction. Jiraiya asked, completely cut off guard. Dad had your pervy books in the library, along with your first one. Which is a good book by the way, if a bit too idealistic and unrealistic in my opinion. Oh, so you read them? Jiraiya exclaimed happily, but then shivered. Wait, you read Makeout Tactics? Uh, no. Just a backside and seeing the front cover the first time was enough to let me know what it was about. Naruto said smiling. Good, because Kashina would kill me double once I die if you did, Jiraiya exclaimed relieved. So will you stay in the village for now? Naruto asked. It would be good to have more people around him who are not afraid of him or outright hate him. Jiraiya nodded. I sure will. I'd like to get to know you better, Naruto. And I'd like to train you sometimes when I'm in the village. Great. After that, they talked for the next few hours. Jiraiya already knew most of the things about Naruto's private life from Sandane, but was curious about Naruto's training nonetheless. Suffice to say, he was in awe of the shinobi knowledge Naruto possessed. As well as an amazing repertoire of, given his age. By the time he graduates, he would be far ahead of anyone from his generation if he continued with this road. Maybe I should test him? Jiraiya thought. I'm still a beginner with Kenjutsu, but that's because I haven't touched that art as much as I would like to, Naruto said. Jiraiya nodded. You're in luck. Because I'm a Kenjutsu master myself. I'll gladly help you advance your knowledge in the art. And I also have a few techniques I'd like to teach you myself, ones that I invented. Jiraiya said. Really? Which ones exactly? Naruto was excited at such a notion. You'll find out tomorrow. Jiraiya grinned. Fine. But I was wondering about something. How come you never managed to find my aunt Tsunade? I thought she would be easier to find than your rogue teammate. Jiraiya sighed, massaging his temples after taking off his forehead protector. You can never know with that woman or what she's up to. I admit I didn't try as hard as I wanted, but I tried nonetheless. I only run at her debt collectors. It seems she's adamant about not being found by anyone from Kanoha, but at least I can breathe easy knowing she's alive. Jiraiya finished. You mean she's angry at Kanoha for losing her brother and lover? Naruto proposed. Not only in Kanoha. But she was angry at your father as well. Jiraiya said. My father? But he never wrote anything bad about her. Ha! Jiraiya exclaimed. Of course Minato would not write anything bad about anyone. Especially her. She was his family. 
What I meant was she was angry at your father for not letting her use some of the clan's money for gambling. He snorted. Man, I remember her leaving the village for the last time cursing Minato and her own foolishness. Her foolishness? Naruto asked, confused. Yeah. Originally, she was the head of the clan but passed that title to Minato after she retired from the shinobi life. But, I'm sure she would return and raise you if she knew that you exist, though. For all her faults, she is a good person. Jiraiya told him with a nostalgic smile. I hope so. Now that I think about it, Minato's death must be the reason she doesn't want to return to the village or have anything to do with anyone from Kanoha. Last time I saw her was before Kikbi's attack. She must have been thinking that Kanoha is being cursed towards her and her family. Jiraiya muttered in the end. Two years later, Naruto age. 10. Sitting under one of Kanoha's waterfalls, Naruto, with another nine shadow clones, was focusing on splitting the waterfall with his wind chakra. This was the third out of the five steps of elemental manipulation, particularly, the wind manipulation. The first one was splitting the leaf the number of times he wanted, the second one splitting the rock the same way. The third one was splitting the waterfall. The fourth one would be drawing the sign on the hard ground using nothing but wind. The fifth part was simply using all that he knew to shape the wind around him with his chakra, with the help of the respective hand seals, although it wasn't as easy as it seemed. The wind was infamous as the hardest element to master for a reason. Chakra control had to be perfect in order for the wind techniques to be as deadly as they were in theory. Wasting as little chakra as it was possible as well. The third and fourth steps were optional. As Shinobi could utilize this element with his battle fan. The element itself was tied tightly to the user's own affinity and control of the air on the field around him. But, Naruto had a very strong one anyway, so once he mastered the element he would be as unpredictable for such an element as it was possible. Contrary to the wind, the water elemental manipulation was of course different. Naruto had to dampen the leaf for the first step, pull the water out of the lake for the second, stop the flow of the waterfall for the third. He finished the fourth step already, which was pulling the water from the trees and plants during meditation in one of the denser forests of Konoha. Fifth step he would finish after the fourth step of wind manipulation. This one would possibly be the hardest one. For he needed to turn the aqueous vapor into the liquid state on instinct. Not many ninjas bothered with this step as it required very good chakra control, better than average reserves, and pure dedication. He could use both the wind and water techniques after the second step. Third, fourth, and fifth would only make it easier and make him a master of those elements as well. Most of the ninjas didn't bother mastering their element further after the second step and occasionally third, jumping straight towards the fifth one. Even in Sun Agakur, they preferred a battle fan to help them with wind in combat. While in Kiri, Shinobis having primary affinity for water, for most of the time only went up until the fourth step, with cages doing the fifth. Yet even with the fifth step, no one has ever got to his Greek grandfather's level. Yet. Unlike two of Naruto's affinities, the earth element, which could easily help its user in 90% of situations, simply due to the fact that it didn't require the user to master various steps which could take years. Larger chakra reserves and better control was needed if one wanted to call himself a master of that element. The Wagakur loved that fact, henceforth they preferred quantity over quality of their forces, unlike Kanoha. Although, they did like experimenting with advanced nature transformations. Lighting and fire were different from the other elements. While wind and water required its user to have control of the nature around him, in addition to having mastery of his chakra and element within his body, fire and lighting depended only on its user and his own body and chakra. That would be enough elemental training for today, Narutakan. Let us practice for a while. Kasu called him out from his elemental training. While not adept at various styles the Senju clan practiced, Kasuk was quick to correct Naruto's posture whenever he made some visible mistake. He was a master at Kanoharik and its sub-styles, Kanoha's most famous school. For the next half hour, they engaged in spar, with Kasuk being better than Naruto, but it was expected anyway. Very good, Narutokan. Dare I say, you will surpass me in the near future. Kasuk complimented with one of his traditional smiles. Naruto grinned. Can we go for Tojutsu next? This was the part where Naruto would soon enough surpass Kasuk, mostly due to his speed and youth. Still, Kasuk was no pushover at his old age. That would go on for the next few hours before the evening, with Naruto and Kasuk sparring in various shinobi arts, like every other day. As he had tomorrow day free from the academy, Naruto would spend time in his clan's secret library, reading whatever came to his hand. Bidding goodbye to Kasuk, Naruto went on his way towards his home. For the past four years, ever since he found the room, Naruto was influenced by the writings of his ancestors, but most of all, his Greek grandfather, Senju Tabarama. Despite his pragmatic nature, which he claimed to have possessed, and as history books have described him, Tabarama was very antagonistic and biased in his view towards the certain villages, particularly Kumo and Iwa. It was funny to Naruto because those two fought against Konoha in every war. 
with the former one influencing Nide more than anything, but particular theft that would later help the formation of Kumagakur. And two brothers who were responsible for it. As he sat in the library, he took a book titled History of the Sage's Blood and Divergence from its main lines. Written by none other than Senju Tabarama. Naruto read the first seven chapters already. They described the history and formation of both the Senju and the Ichiha clans. Their diplomatic relations with their various customers, to their influence on the development of the shinobi world and other clans, but from Tabarama's point of view. The book was written from the time of the ending of the Warring States period to the time when he became the second Hokage. The two clans apparently descended from the two brothers who were sons of the legendary Sage of Six Paths. His name was nowhere mentioned, but the name of one of his sons was Asura. Dutabarama reasoned that the name of the sage was lost due to the destruction of certain documents and papers, similar to the name of the Achiha clan's progenitor. To fill the gap between the information that was not available, Tabarama would present some of his own theories regarding their origins. But aside from the Senju and the Achihas, there were an offshoots of both clans, with one of them claiming to possess the blood of both, the Hagoromo clan. Naruto started reading the chapter that described that clan. The Hagoromo clan is an offshoot of the Senju clan, or rather one particular Senju man and woman, claiming to be part of the Ichiha clan, although there was no evidence to support this claim, aside from the commonly known Hagoromo legend, one where their founder, Senju Hagoromo and woman of the Ichiha clan, fell in love and produced seven children together. I'm not someone to believe that every black-haired and black-eyed woman with a slightly bigger ego than usual is a member of the Ichiha clan. That, however, did not stop the Ichihas from allying with them. From the clan's genealogy that was looted after the attack I led on them, no evidence was found about intermarriage with either the Achihas or Hyktas. But there were few shreds of evidence that I found among them that suggest they may have connections to both of those other clans in a rather unorthodox way. Naruto continued reading through the next few pages which described their daily life, founding date, their fighting style, techniques, and political alliances with mission records that were looted from them by Tabarama Senju shortly before the formation of Konoha. Naruto looked up towards one of the bookshelves with various wooden scrolls that had the Hagoromo clan symbol with the name under it. Records of their missions and other stuff must be there. Naruto remembered. He knew about it already, but didn't divulge further until now. He continued reading the rest of their history and battles with Senjus. Reading it, he found out they killed many of his clansmen as they were allied with the Ichihas during the Warring States period. Three part that piqued his interest particularly was Tabarama's own theory about their origin from gathered pieces of information after their destruction. A few following sections and paragraphs said, Many clans possess the bloodlust, or at least claim they do, but many of them use it simply in the thrill of battle, usually conducted with their techniques and styles. The Hagoromo clan does that too, but on a far wider and far more savage scale than the others. But even with that there aren't many clans who do that. Although one other clan comes to mind in particular. The Kagaya clan. It is no secret that for all their conservative attitude, the thrill of taboo cannot escape even the Haikta clan. So it is not surprising when a woman of the Haikta clan decided to impregnate herself with a bad boy Ichiha. Naturally, the Haikas didn't like that, for it brought a great shame upon the clan, causing them to expel the woman and her bastard son. The Haikka woman, named Kagaya, went on with her son, Kimro, initially to the Ichiha clan, but was refused entry. In order not to get off from the subject to question here, but after it was formed, initially in the land of hot water, the Kagaya clan gained an infamous reputation as being a clan of bloodthirsty savages, but with a powerful gift Shikatsumyaku, the dead bone pulse. No doubt that the imbalance from mixing the Achiha and the Haika blood caused this, but resentment of their banishment as well. The Kagaya clan, however in my time held their bloodlust and lust for battle more as a conservative tradition and their trademark, with an occasional clan leader trying to increase their savagery. As only 14 of them and all of their existence possessed Shikatsumyaku. Their Tujutsu prowess is undeniable, however, in other chapters, dedicated to them, I will give more space to this clan. If Senju Hagoromo fell in love with this woman, it could be that she was of the Kagaya clan, or at least offspring from some of the Kagaya's rape campaigns. In addition to having the blood of mad Kagayas who themsel have blood of the Achihas and Haikdas. The next generations of Hagoromos inherited the madness of Kagayas and large chakra reserves of Senju. From one side, they could become one of the most powerful clans to ever live, but luckily for us, they were only mad savages like initial Kagayas, if a bit more intelligent than them. The main evidence to support this claim lies from the fact that the first matriarch of the clan had two marks on her forehead, as their revered illustration I found suggests. In no other clan can this be found but that of the Kagaya. Imbalance by mixing the Achiha and Haika blood created the Kagayas. Now, a new imbalance by mixing this fusion with Senju's created further imbalance, resulting in the Hagoromo clan. Pace closed. Try picking mushrooms around your own fields. Naruto drank everything his ancestor wrote for a second. It made sense, in a certain sort of way. 
as the first bloodlines were unbalanced initially, thus resulting in bloodline clans having to only marry among themselves to balance it out and keep it to themselves. It wouldn't be that different for the same thing to happen with more powerful and more mythological clans. Still, unlike those other clans, it seems that Senjus don't generally need to marry inclin only, but do need to be careful with whom they marry. Every man must have his own forbidden fruit to avoid, it seems. Try picking mushrooms around your own fields. Naruto had to laugh at his ancestor's advice. It wouldn't be possible now to do that. Would it? But his clan didn't need to resort to incest to keep their blood pure in the first place. Ashurama and Tabarama's mother was not from the Senju clan, yet two of them were hailed as the strongest Senjus to have ever lived and one of the strongest Shinobis to ever exist. Downfall of the Hagoromo clan, Ashurama's dream of creating a peaceful environment where children of all clans within the land of fire and beyond as he likes to point out every single day, could grow up to actually become adults was coming to fruition. While it was only a matter of time before the Ichiha surrender, the Hagoromo still stood loyal to Madara and opposing Senjus, more than Madara's own clansmen did. If Hashirama actually wants his dream to come to realization, he should know that it cannot be realized with Hagoromos walking around. Even Ichiha has surrendered. As he is my brother, I know Hashirama better than anyone, no matter how many times he claims it is Madara who knows him best. Because I know him, I knew he would try to bring Hagoromos to the fold eventually. But will the village and society work after that? The answer is no. The Senjus are not the only ones who are at war with Hagoromos. While they are allied with the Achihas, it is only for the purpose of defeating us, Senjus. The entire land of fire knows about the raids Hagoromos have committed upon the clans of Yamanaka, Nara, Akamichi. Does Hashirama think those clans will be willing to join the village if it means living next to them? I had a problem with coming to the reality that I live next to the Achihas. And we have fought them since the dawn of time. The Hagoromo clan had to fall. Before the actual talks about creating the village came to the wider masses. The attack on Hagoromos was the first joint mission of the future village. Hashirama can't think of this as a prototype. Allying with the Yamanakas, Naras and Akamichis brought downfall on the Hagoromo clan. During the battle, I sensed all of the ones we knew of within the compound. With my sensory skills, I tried to pinpoint if any of them were outside of the compound during the attack, and there were. Approximately 28 of them. None was spared in the following campaigns. The next few pages described the battle with the clan itself. Tabarama Senju led it, with clan heads of Yamanakas, Naras, and Akamichi acting as support, supplanting the assault with their own clansmen. Planning the attack and the subsequent execution. Everything went flawless, which made his great grandfather even more famous through the elemental nations. But it also helped the creation of the village as three clans that helped Senjus, accepted the invitation to join eventually. But before that came to be, first, Madara had to be dealt with. For that reason, I can safely assume that the clan was completely eradicated during the attack and following campaigns with no survivors. I took their scrolls, records, and letters for further investigation. The most disturbing documents this clan had possessed was the idea and wish to have the ability to revive the dead. While no actual technique to do so has been found in their compound. Theories and ideas to actually create it are there and very close to accomplishing it. But I have to give credit where it's due. Had they actually created it, they would possibly be unstoppable. Still, it doesn't mean that I won't try to finish it. If Madara Doe's decide to go rogue in the village eventually, it seems Izuna will have to beat it out of him. 4. Hunternans will be needed once the village is formed. Hunting the remaining Hagoromos made sure of that. It is almost certain that there will be Rouges in the new system. But I will prevent the rise of renegades like Hagoromos were. Fighting with this clan solidified my belief that shinobi need to set aside their emotions within their profession and to control them outside of it. Naruto closed the book and looked at the dark ceiling of the secret library. He knew that the times of warring states were brutal, but he never thought his family was capable of exterminating another clan like they did to Hagoromos. He didn't feel any shame, instead it was satisfaction and pride. Standing up, taking the lamp with him, he walked over to the jutsu sections of the room. By his estimates and with the help of shadow clones, he would master all five steps of elemental manipulation for both his primary elements by the time he graduated from the academy in two years. After that, he would focus more on kenjutsu and space-time ninjutsu. He would continue improving his skills. He could be considered far better than average in those skills than your everyday ninja, but he should never stop training, same with tojutsu. Although he would need to constantly train all three things. Mind-body technique. In Jutsu, he would probably never be able to master to its full potential, which would include lower ranked ones. The Kikbi's chakra constantly expanded as already large reserves. For him to be able to use normally like everyone else, he would need to find a way to either completely synchronize his chakra with that of the Kikbi or to separate it, which would include reinforcing the seal. 
well, the second option is out of the question, as he was glad to have his reserves expanded, while the first one could cause potential damage to his mind, with the influence of the kickby. Hiraya had told him that Jinch Krikis could accomplish good chakra control, even with the amount they had thanks to their bijk. But for some reason, it was different in his case. It was either due to the seal that he had been draining the kickby's chakra and expanding his chakra coils. Or the sly fox was just being an asshole and wanted to mess with him. In the long run, this wasn't as bad as it seemed at first. Well, he couldn't use everything that he got his hands on only rank and hire for him. Well, he could already use some of those as they weren't hard to master, once you got the theory right. The Bringer of Darkness technique and the Temple of Nirvana technique he had already learned. Those were probably the strongest outside of those of the Achiha and Karama clans. Those under Brank were not important, but it was a slight punch on his pride that he couldn't use them. Genjutsu was an interesting topic for many reasons. After the creation of the village, Senju Tabarama had created a seal he marked on his heart, which would in turn in conjunction with his own chakra, protect his entire body with a layer of chakra that would prevent the Sharingan user from seeing the way chakra was molded in the user's body, thus being unable to copy the techniques the sealusser would do. While the Byakugan user couldn't see chakra points. Later only a theory remained. As a proud clan, the Haikdas would never admit deficiency of their eyes. Especially during the early days of the village. 5. Ability to revive the dead. Naruto remembered that section from the book. If Hagoromos had manuscripts to create that jutsu, or at least its prototype, no doubt Taburama finished it, just as he said he would. If his jab at reviving the deceased brother of Madara Chia was any indication. Even if he didn't know every jutsu or information from this room, Naruto did inspect all the bookcases in detail. But aside from a few mentions here and there there was nothing about the Sido Tensei. The Nidane either hit it well or never actually created it, aside from that one jab at Madara. Maybe it is better that way. Forests outside of Kanoha, 8 March, Naruto. Age 12. Calmly drawing his bow, Naruto concentrated on his target at hand. A rather large wild boar to be more precise. Target was around 50 meters away from him. Soon, the boar noticed him and turned towards him, preparing to attack. But that was all that Naruto needed. As the boar turned towards him, so did his head at the front, exposing his weak point the eyes. Naruto let loose his arrow, enhanced with chakra, and it hit the boar straight in the eye, instantly killing him. He approached a downed animal and waited for a moment for the remaining life to leave it. As he waited for the process to finish, Naruto focused on his sensory abilities to pinpoint if the boar was sick previously. As an omnivore type, the wild boar could very well eat anything his mouth could devour. Healthy. Naruto concluded, after which he proceeded to unseal his equipment for meat preparation. As he sat down his equipment, in the distance three men stood, watching quietly as Naruto did his work. You taught him well, Kasuke. Here is incomplimented. He knows how to act in the wilderness, with nothing but his ability to hunt as a primary tool. It will use him one day, that's for sure. He uses his sensory skills for something like this. I'm amazed. If I ever take him for a training trip, I'll make sure he's the one hunting our meal. Jiraiya commented with a smirk on his face. You honor me, Hiruzen, Jiraiyakin. Kasuke said. But all I did was point Narutakin in the right direction. Just like with his shinobi training. You are being too humble, old friend. Narutakin would not be the person he is today if you didn't guide him. Hiruzen told him. He became a good shinobi, but more importantly, he became a good man. He smiled. We'll fully test him later on. Let's go and see how he's doing. Jiraiya suggested. Equals 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 with Naruto equals equals equals. Skinning and cleaning the boar was not a pleasant task, but it was a fulfilling one. The meat was delicious, especially when grilled. The boar this big will no doubt taste great once he was prepared. While he was slicing the now shaved skin of the boar, one of his other clones was preparing the fire. Another one was helping him, and the last one was storing the separated meat for later use. If he periodically ate this, it could last him for nearly one year. He hunted wild boars before, but they were much smaller than this one. Something smells really delicious here. Voice of his godfather trailed in the distance. You could at least help, it would be ready much faster. Naruto pretended to be annoyed. The division of labor was a key to a successful economy. Preparing a dinner from a beast this large was no exception. Not a chance. Jiraiya said. This is part of your test after all. What kind of tutors would we be if we helped you now? No need to act all smart with me, Uncle Jiraiya. I know it's a test. Said the smirking Naruto. In the meantime, Jiraiya just pouted while Hiruzen and Kasuke watched in amusement. For all his serious attitude, Naruto was more relaxed with them, especially Jiraiya. As Jiraiya said, we will test all that you have learned until now, Narutakan. But first, let's eat. Hiruzen said. As they ate, four men talked about various things, from their battles and missions during the three wars, to even Jiraiya's books. Hiruzen and Jiraiya at least did. 
During that time, Naruto's clone stored the remaining meat on his scrolls, while the four men held grilled meat at the skewer at the top of the campfire. Naruto. Jiraiya said with a serious expression. From his seat at the log near the fire, Naruto looked up, still holding the skewer with grilled meat he was about to eat. What is it, uncle? It was not like Jiraiya to suddenly turn serious from such a carefree situation. Naruto didn't sense anyone else nearby, so the attack was not a possibility. As you know, as Kanoha's Yinchkriki, your status should have been a secret until someone rattled it up to the general populace. Jiraiya began. Naruto simply nodded. He was told that before, even the potential suspects by the Sandame. When the villagers found out, Sensei did everything in his power to stop the information from leaking out to the other nations. But as there were some merchants from the outside during that time in the village, probably will it in spies, too. There is a high possibility that the other villages know about you. Naruto grunted in affirmation and Jiraiya continued, while the other two men listened in silence, both having serious expressions on their faces. As there is a possibility that they know about it, there is also a probability that some dangerous Masingans know about it too. I'm talking about the Akatsuki organization composed of 10th rank Masingans. Since you mentioned them, I'm probably one of their targets, right? It was not hard to figure it out, Naruto mused. What Ten Rogues could do with the power he had was anyone's guess, yet confusing at the same time. Indeed. Jiraiya nodded. They won't start collecting tailed beasts for some time, maybe even years before they do. I don't know what they plan to do with them or how they plan to keep them in their control. But if you ever meet someone wearing a black cloak with red clouds on it during your mission's run. It was not advice. It was an order. Naruto was silent for a moment before nodding. It was strange seeing his godfather this serious, but if he was worried, then he should be too. Do you know any of their members? Two of them. They usually work in pairs of two. The only ones I know of, however, are Hashigaki Kisum and Ichiha Itachi. And they are paired together. Naruto widened his eyes. He had heard some stories about the monster of the Hidden Mist, but to this day he never would have thought he would be partnered with Konoha's infamous clan killer Ichiha Itachi. The more he thought about it, the more dread arose within him. If the two of them were paired, then there is a possibility that he would be their target. Itachi was a former Anbu and he knew Konoha's defenses, maybe even to bypass them. And he probably knew many things about him as well. For a short time, he was one of Naruto's guardians when Kasuk was away. The memories Naruto had of the Kinslayer was that of a distant but kind, all the same young boy. Old as Naruto was now. Do you know any of the other members? Surely there are some indications of who could join them. Naruto queried, trying to clear his mind. Unfortunately, I don't, Jiraiya replied with a frown. That was one of the more considerable recent problems for him. While well, Itachi reported that Kisum was paired up with him and of their task of currently only tracking down the Jinch Crickies there was nothing more. Aside from the fact that they are still a few years behind their original goal and won't start hunting them for the time being. It was infuriating, as now he did not know if Itachi could be trusted completely. For all his talk about being loyal to Konoha, a lack of more detailed information was suspicious. It could be that he cooled off after the massacre and started regretting his decision to ally with Konoha over his own clan and family. Killing off his clansmen, including children was no easy task. Easy task. Jiraiya thought bitterly. Well he didn't like the Achihas all that much, he respected many of them. That was one of the reasons why no one would suspect Itachi of being a double agent. Maybe he was getting too paranoid. But still. The lack of information regarding the other members or at least the leader's village of origin was irksome. He would need to contract Itachi again. Soon. I'll try to find out more about them in the following months. Jiraiya promised. And he would deliver it. This wasn't just to protect Minato's only son. But it was for the safety of Konoha and the entire world. There was a familiar sense of dread of who could be the leader of the Akatsuki. But for the world of it, Jiraiya couldn't put where that feeling came from. Okay. By the way, who is going to test me? Naruto asked. This was one of the reasons why the old man wanted to have this picnic. At this, Jiraiya stood up smiling and pointing his thumb at himself. But before he could say anything, Saratobi interrupted him. That would be me. You, old man. You're joking, right? Naruto asked surprised. And judging from Jureya's and Kasuk's expressions, they didn't expect this either. Yeah, what's the deal, Sensei? I thought I would be the one to do it. Jureya questioned. I don't remember saying that. Besides, this is a nice opportunity to test this new generation myself. It is up to Naruto and his peers to carry on the will of fire one day after all. Said the smiling Hiruzen. Very well then. Naruto conceded. Hiruzen nodded and took off his Hokage's robes, revealing his battle armor. I thought this was a simple test, not a battle to defend the village, old man. You can never be sure when the war will erupt or when the village will be endangered. It is the duty of the Hokage to always be prepared. Saratobi said. Indeed. 
replied Naruto, unsealing some of his shinobi gear from one of his scrolls in the meantime. One katana and pair of fingerless, chakra-channeling gloves. With them, his hits would be more damaging if he managed to land them. Zeratobi in turn summoned his personal summon. Monkey King. Enma. The summon. Isn't that an overkill for a simple test? Naruto asked. You don't want me to summon Gamabunta, do you? Ha ah, Hiruzen exclaimed. Feel free to do so, although I don't know if the Chief of Toads would appreciate it. You got me there. In the distance, Jiraiya and Kasuk stood looking at the clearing where Naruto and Siratobi stood opposite of each other. He could summon some other toad, if not Gamabunta. He doesn't want to hold back at all it seems. And from the looks of it, the old man doesn't want to either. Kasuk nodded. It looks like they will start with the simple weapon spar. It has been a long time since Hiruzen summoned Enma. Is it not? Indeed. Last time it was when Arachimaru fled the village. Jiraiya said, his mood turning sour at the memory of his rogue teammate, but he quickly pushed Odd aside. This was not the moment to sulk and brood. Not everyone gets an opportunity to be tested by the current god of Shinobi. How do you think Naruto will fare with Sensei in weapons combat, Kasuk? Hard to tell, if I'm being honest with you, Jiraiyakin. Kasuk began seriously. I know Narutokan is very proficient in it. But it all depends if Hiruzen is holding back or if he ever stopped practicing with his BM staff. In any case, we'll see for ourselves now. I can't remember when was the last time I saw Sensei in combat. This will be great to watch. I just hope he goes easy on the kid in ninjutsu. Ho ho. Kasuk laughed. You underestimate Narutokan there. You don't have much faith in our students. Do you, Jurayakin? Oh, I have enough faith in him, alright. Jiraiya smirked. Still. I shudder when I remember how Sensei used to test my team when I was younger. We'll find out soon if Hiruzen has lost his touch or not. In the meantime the clearing separated from each other by 20 meters. Naruto and Siratobi stared at each other. Hiruzen already had Enma transformed into his adamantine staff form, while Naruto stood in his place, katana in his right hand, resting its teal on his left, positioned just above his face. Since this is just a simple test, we are going in different fields, right? Not a full-out fight in which I would probably be crumpled over. Old man didn't get his position for nepotism or anything else. He deserved his position and has proven to be a great leader and a shinobi. His reputation was probably one of the reasons why Kanoha survived for so long after the Ninetales attack and in turn not being attacked by the other villages. Haika affair being the only exception due to the Rakage's greed. Indeed. I want to test every field you studied. You'll soon find out why I'm called the professor, in addition to the god of shinobi, my boy. Hiruzen said. Bring it on, old man, just don't break a hipper spine. Naruto taunted, smirking in the process. Picking on the elderly, huh? Siratobi replied. Let's show him why our generation shouldn't be underestimated, Enma. If only you were this enthusiastic when you cornered Orochimaru. Enma thought. No point in sulking now. I want to see how much Minato's boy grew up. Lead on, then. For a moment they were silent and unmoving, that is until Siratobi decided to go first. The elderly take precedence as they say. He attacked Naruto with his adamantine staff, causing the Senju to take a completely defensive position. He really doesn't hold back. Slamming his staff towards Naruto's head, for a moment Siratobi was afraid that he went too far. That is, until Naruto's sword appeared above his head, blocking the staff. Naruto held the hilt of his sword in his right hand, while his left one was pushing the edge of the steel by the end, upwards, giving him the balance needed to block the attack. Seeing this, Siratobi slid his staff down, crouched, and went to attack Naruto's legs. Fortunately for Naruto, he saw this and jumped, evading the attack. You are good at blocking attacks, Narutokan. But let me see some of your own skills. It has been a long time since I saw the Biramasensei's style, and I know you are proficient in it. Naruto grunted and went for an assault. Just like he was adept at defense with a sword, so was the old man with his staff. Attack went for a minute or so until Sandame smiled and went for his own attack. He is good. Dare I say, in a few years he will be without competition. All he needs is experience and height. Hiruzen thought amused. In the end, Saratobi managed to kick the sword out of Naruto's hand, positioning his BM staff under his chin. Naruto smiled. I see now why they call you the professor. And I can see why Kasu and Jureya say you are a prodigy with no match in your generation. Saratobi complimented. Let us go with ninjutsu and tijutsu at the same time for the next test. I want to see you go all out on me. With pleasure. Grinned Naruto. And so they began. First with Tijutsu, where even with his amazing speed, Saratobi was able to counter Naruto's hits. But at the same time, he found it hard to land stronger strikes on him. Maybe we should include resistance seals into the academy's curriculum from now on. Don't you think so? Naruto asked. Indeed we should. That is if children don't quit the academy after the first week with such training. First with ninjutsu. 
Naruto thought as he went through the few hand seals and exclaimed. Wine style. Drilling air bullet. Inhaling the air into his stomach then pounding it and sending the cannon-like air towards Hiruzen who evaded it. It was followed by the three additional attacks which Hiruzen managed to evade as well. Attacks themselves ended up hitting the small rock hill behind the sand aim, causing the small crack holes to appear in it. Hiruzen didn't waste his time waiting for Naruto to attack again. So he went through his own hand seals, exhaling. Fire style. Fire dragon flame bullet. His dragon made of fire flew quickly towards Naruto, and for a moment, Suratobi was again afraid that he went too far. That is, until he saw the defensive barrier of water surrounding Naruto. Just like Tabura Masensei. Hiruzen thought nostalgically. Naruto made one shadow clone after the fire attack, while Hiruzen went for another Tajutsu attack until darkness started surrounding him. Sensei's infinite darkness Jinjutsu.1 Jinjutsu? Bringer of darkness technique, Naruto's clone muttered as he made a tiger seal. Naruto himself went for an attack himself while the clone stood at his place. It was much easier to hit the old man now as he couldn't see anything. The infinite darkness was hard even for the Ichihas to escape from. But there was a slight downside of the Jutsu. Enemy, if trained well enough, could sense the attacks coming at him. As the sand aim did just now. He managed to land a few minor hits enhanced with his chakra on Naruto, but the darkness still remained. So he left a clone in charge of maintaining the darkness while he himself went for the attack. Hiruzen concluded. Smart move. He then charged and attacked the clone, dispelling him and the darkness around him. As you figured it out, how to break off from the illusion? Naruto asked. You have vast knowledge, my boy. But the knowledge itself is only a puddle without the experience to back it up. You will learn that in time. After that, they went to the spar for another 15 minutes. Before long, the Sandain placed his kunai under Naruto's neck, smiling and saying. I win. Naruto could help but grin. The spar was amazing and he conceded defeat. They sat near the fire once more after the fight. Hiruzen wanted to give his own reassessment of Naruto's skills. I must say that I'm not only impressed but also proud of you as well, Narutokan, Sirotobi said. Naruto couldn't help but feel proud too. He was many times complimented, even grudgingly by some of his peers or some academy's teachers. But this was different. He supposed this was a feeling when a grandfather was proud of his grandson. It was just like when Kasu complimented him for mastering his affinities, or when Jiraiya praised him for his advancement in Kenjutsu. I will never get tired of it. Thank you Hikajusama. Suddenly getting formal. No need to do that, my boy. This won't go to your record or anything, Sirotobi said. So what is your final grade, old man? This time it was Jiraiya who approached them with Kasu beside him, who asked the question. Impatient to know what his sensei would say about his godson's skills. From what he saw from the hill with Kasuk. Naruto could easily advance to the rank of Takibetsu Jimin. Granted, he didn't have the experience necessary. But still. If Itachi was in the Anbu at this time and Kakashi himself a Jimin in his own right, there weren't many obstacles for Naruto to advance easily and become one. I know what you all are thinking. Sirotobi began. You really are skilled Narutokan. But you will need experience if you want to advance quickly through the ranks. Your skills are easily near the Jimin level. And your mastery of the wind and water element is something I haven't seen in a long time. You've been spending a lot of time in your library. And you don't hold back any punches, Gramps. Your skill in ninjutsu would have left me with months-long bruises had I not had the nine tails to heal me. Naruto added, rubbing his arms and tights in the process. Well the damage itself was not very dangerous and with the fox healing him would heal him completely in a day. There was no doubt about the old man's skills as the muscles were still sore. Well, thank you Narutokan, Hiruzen replied. And just like Minato and Tabira Masensei, I can see you are going to be a devil at speed. And with the Bringer of Darkness technique, I won't have to worry about your lack of skills in that regard. By the way, how many do you know? Seven in total, Naruto said. The Bringer of Darkness is the strongest I know. I have one more rank and the other five are rank. Lower than that is borderline impossible for me to use, just like the clone Jutsu. Jinjutsu in general wasted little of chakra. That's why they were one of the favorite tools for the Ichiha and Kurama clan. And the favorite tool for women. Saritobi nodded with a serious expression on his face. With the amount of chakra Naruto had it would be hard for him to use the low-rank techniques, as they required too little chakra. And while he could see that Naruto had very good chakra control, it was still impossible. How would Naruto develop had that incident at the playground never happened? Saritobi shuddered at the thought. It could have been his biggest shame if he left Naruto to grow by himself without an adult figure in his life. Though he initially considered doing that brought a great sense of shame to him. Even with all the hardships he endured, Naruto never went towards the path of darkness, becoming a good shinobi and an even better man in the process. That was something he wanted Kasu to do when he assigned Naruto to his care and was glad his old friend accomplished his task without downsides. 
I must also thank you Kasuk. You really did a great job in being Naritakin's caretaker. The eternal Genin who was silent thought the conversation smiled and gave something of his famous humbleness. Thank you for your praise, Sande Misama. But I did nothing aside from giving a few pointers here and there. All his skills are directly coming from his own hard work and family's legacy. The three other men sided. Kasuk was infamous for his humble attitude. As ages go by, you still remain the same, my old friend, Siratobi said with a smile. Sometimes I wish more people would have been that way. Memory of his prodigious student appeared before him, but just as fast it disappeared. You shouldn't beat yourself over that, Sensei, Jiraiya added. I certainly don't. Anyhow, let us not jump from the subject, right? As I said, your mastery of your affinities is nothing but amazing. And your use of them during the battle is at its place. With all your skills at where they are, I would say you will quickly advance throughout the ranks. It should be within the year. After all, in agreement with our allies of Sunagakur and a few other minor villages, Chknin exams will be held in Kanoha in about six months after you graduate. So we won't have to risk exposing your identity in a potentially hostile environment. Now, regarding your teammates. Saratobi trailed off, lighting his pipe in the process. I'm placing you under Kakashi. He told me long ago he wanted to be your Jinnin-sensei once you graduate, but as you're going to be the rookie of the year, I was going to place you under his jurisdiction in any case. Naruto nodded. He already knew Kakashi. He was a student of his father back in the day. While he usually showed a lazy attitude towards his surroundings, he was interested in teaching him. Helping him with Rasengan training. Particularly when Kasuk was away on one of his border inspection missions. Who are my other teammates? Naruto asked in the meantime. Hiruzen was silent for a moment before answering. Ichiha Sasuk is one of them. Naruto simply stared at Sandame, as did Jiraiya and Kasuk. Are you sure that's wise, Sensei? Jiraiya questioned. From what you told me he is as unsociable as it can get, even for the Ichiha standards. And as Itachi is in the organization that is hunting Naruto, there is a chance they cross their paths. I had no other choice but to place him under Kakashi, Jiraiya. Sasukakin has the potential to awaken his Sharingan, and Kakashi would have to teach him anyway. There is no one else. If he awakens it. Many Ichihas did not. Jiraiya retorted. But I guess it won't change your mind. Right, Sensei. It is also for another purpose. At this, the three men looked up towards him. Naritakin, I mean no offense, but it is also for your temporary safety. While I know you are strong, it is because of your status. Being Kanoha's Jinch Kriki, it is up to Kakashi to calm you with his Sharingan if you start losing control of the Ninetales. Do you understand? Naruto nodded calmly. That will only last while you are Genin as I have no intention of having Kakashi babysit you all the time. Aside from getting the experience on these missions with your team. You will also need to learn how to cope with the real of Shinobi. I know you already drank every book about emotions that Tabirama Sensei wrote, but the theory is different from the action. Again, Naruto nodded in understanding. It is no problem. Although, I have never spoken to the fox, and quite frankly I have no intention of doing so. I was thinking of going with it like my mother and Midasama did. Maybe you could, but then again, the seal Minato designed was there in order to help you to control the fox's power if ever need be, Jiraiya added his two cents. Seal on your stomach helps expand your already large chakra reserves. And it will only continue growing. It might be prudent that you learn to control at least some of its powers. Especially to help you against the Akatsuki if they corner you. I'd rather not. But I see your point, uncle. Naruto conceded. And who is to be my other teammate? It has to be a Kanoichi, right? Correct, Siratobi said. I originally thought about placing Yamanaka Ino with you, but I will not break off from the traditional Ino Shikacho trio. It has proven itself effective for centuries, and I hope it remains for the centuries to come. Chikamaru told me once he was going to be placed on the same team with her and Shinjai. He couldn't help but complain that it would be troublesome to have Sasuke's fangirl to nag him all the time. He snorted in the end. Typical Nara I guess, here is amused. My other option was the Haika heiress, Hinata. She had the secondiest practical score after Ino. But there's a slight problem there. He trailed off. You mean the fact she's deadly afraid of me? Naruto blankly stated. Well the rest of his classmates got used to his presence even with all the gossip that ran around the village, Hinata was still frightened of him. For reasons completely unknown to Naruto, but he could guess. I spoke with her father, Hiashi, and he can find me with some information regarding her attitude towards you. It seems that the young Hinata was a witness to the incident at the playground, and quite frankly, it traumatized her of your presence. Does Hiashi blame me for her timid behavior then? Naruto asked with annoyance in his voice. It would be really troublesome if he got on the wrong foot with other clans, especially clan heads. No, that is a completely different matter within the Haika clan itself, Hiruzen answered him. I decided to go with Haruno Sakura, the third strongest Kanoichi of your class. 
Strongest is the generous word, old man, Naruto said. Sakura is a smart girl, and her theoretical results are always at the top beside mine and Sasuke's, yes. But she is rather weak in the physical department. Indeed. Your homeroom teacher, Sidorichan told me of this strange phenomenon among the young post-war Kinoichis. Many of them get starstruck by the most popular boy in their class. The one who usually comes from the great clan background. Strangely enough, your class had rather high scores from the boys, much better than the other classes in years. Siratobi rubbed his chin as he said the last part. That is because of the Sadaru-sensei, Naruto answered him now with a hint of laughter in his voice. Every one of my classmates, including Shikamaru, loved getting a pat on the head and a friendly smile from her whenever they would do something right or correct. At this Jurei raised his eyebrows and whistled. Oh, are you suggesting we should place a female Kinoichis in charge of every future class from now on? I never took you for a pervert, Naruto. I'm not like you, pervy sage. Naruto deadpanned. But as you mentioned, maybe we should. I could even see Sasuke sometimes getting more relaxed when he got praise from Satoru Sensei. See. What did I tell you, old man? We should definitely go with that route Jureya would have continued rambling about his perverted dreams had Saratobi not smacked him on the back of his head. We can talk about that some other time, Jureya. This is more important. Hiruzen scolded as Jureya pouted. As I was saying, the quality of the new Kinoichis has dramatically decreased in the years after the Third Shinobi World War, Saratobi said. For that, I don't have many options of giving you this placement, and I have to look to somehow balance out the rest of the teams. While you and Sasuke-kun are exceptional in both physical and theoretical departments, Sakurachan is only theoretical. It should balance out the teams and prevent the wider circles of shinobi populace to be discontent with this decision. I understand, old man, Naruto affirmed. But is there something more with this? I figure you wouldn't simply tell me this in order for me to know about my team before everyone else. Indeed there is more to this, Narutokan, Hiruzen nodded. I personally selected this team as part of Kakashi's assignment, as well as your first long-term mission. I'm listening. Ichiha Sasuke is a flight risk. Saratobi bluntly stated. He has no close connections to anyone in the village, and I'm afraid he would try to leave the first chance he gets if he doesn't get enough training and feels we are somehow holding him back from his quest of killing Itachi, there is a high possibility he leaves the village. And I hope I don't have to tell you how much it would hurt the prestige of Konoha if that happens. It deteriorated with the time when many of your clansmen died in the wars, culminating with Minato's death during the Kikbi's attack. But even still, we survived by some sort of miracle. He finished gravely. Naruto was silent for a moment, contemplating what the old man told him. While he wasn't a friend with Sasuke or even a close acquaintance, he did respect him for what he went through. Despite the history of their families, Naruto would not blame Sasuke for the blood he carried in his veins and hoped that Sasuke would do the same. We are similar in more ways than not. And if the legends are true, we share a common ancestor. I accept this mission, Hakajusama, Naruto said formally. Saratobi smiled, as did the other two men. But I'm not sure how I am supposed to help here exactly. You don't expect me to train him, right? No, of course not. Your task will be more as a temporary goal that Sasuke needs to surpass in his mind. I refrained from giving him a personal tutor because I wanted to give him space to mourn his family for a time and hopefully create new bonds with the village. Training him early would only make him more detached as he would not have anything in the village holding him to it. Sasuke needs to see that he can be both loyal shinobi of Konoha and strong at the same time. That's where you come to the picture. In Sasuke's and in the eyes of most people, you are but a simple orphan, ignoring your other attributes. Do you understand what I need you to do, Narutokan? You want me to become an inspiration for Sasuke to remain loyal to the village. By presenting myself as a clanless orphan who is stronger than him, he can see that the village won't hold him back. Although, I don't think it is up to me or Kakashi to make him loyal to the village, but up to himself. If he leaves then it won't be anyone's fault but his. I do know that, Narutokan. And for that reason, this won't go to your file as an official mission. Saratobi told him a bit too gladly. Naruto nodded in appreciation anyway. However, but because of that, you won't be getting paid either. It's only fair to do so, isn't it? I guess, Naruto muttered. Figures he would do that. I only hope Sakura becomes serious with her training, although from what I see, I might need to jump in there and make her serious. It was true. He might need to do it. However, how to actually do it was a question to be answered for another time. Kasuke, on the other hand, had an answer right away. Try not to create a wrong reputation for yourself while doing so, Saratobi said to him with a laugh as they continued eating the remaining meat. As they ate, Kasuke decided to give him his own advice or two. You must not become too proud, greedy, and angry when you deal with this mission once you graduate, Narutokan, his surrogate uncle told him seriously. It is true that you may face hardships when making your teammates go with your flow. 
but remember that patience is one of Shinobi's greatest virtues. Becoming too proud of your abilities, discarding your comrades will only be your undoing. Never forget that. Kasuk was sad a bit mournfully for the entire atmosphere around them. His words were true in any case. For Kasuk had to learn that lesson the hard way. Becoming too proud of his abilities and being sure he would be promoted to Chknin, combined with the greed of a young mind coming from a non-clan background, wanting to prove himself equal to the clanborn Shinobis in the end, caused his comrades to die because of it. And that resulted in anger at himself for his pride and greed, compelling him to go almost suicidal for the sake of his other comrades of Kanoha. I'm not saying you shouldn't be proud of yourself and your accomplishments. But don't let it go over your head. Kasuk finished. Tabarama was known as a proud man, and it never held him back. More so, it made him an even greater shinobi. Pride and greed were in combination worse for a ninja to have than an ocean of emotions. I understand, uncle. I will do as you say. On Hagakur no Sato, the academy, April 1st 9am, Naruto sat on his usual seat in the classroom as the room filled in with potential future genins. Uncle Jiraiya left the village last week, promising he would commission a new battle armor for him, in the land of iron. Naruto hoped it would be ready for the next Chknin exams. Old man said they would be held in Kanoha six to seven months after he graduated. For now, Naruto was wearing a simple mesh gray shirt with bandages on his arms and black fingerless gloves that could channel chakra and strengthen his hits. And on top of it, black Hayori with white rope around his waist. The rest of his clothes consisted of dark blue flexible standard shinobi pants with bandages wrapped around his ankles and traditional shinobi sandals. On his forehead, he wore Kanoha's forehead protector with a long black cloth tied around his head too. A nice contrast to his sunkissed blonde hair. Sadaru Sensei said he looked handsome wearing it. Naruto would miss Sadaru Sensei a lot. She never looked at him with contempt, even though she was slightly tense around him when everyone found out he killed three boys who bullied him. Old man probably explained everything to her as she was assigned to his class and there was never any problem with her. As he waited for the team assignment, the classroom began to be filled with other gen in Hoppative. His future teammate, Sakura was engaged in constructive debate with Ino on the subject. Who does Asuka can like more? She will be handy. Not soon after, Sadaru Sensei arrived and gave her speech on how they are no longer simple academy students, but full-fledged ninjas of Konoha, needing to take their duty towards their comrades and village seriously. Right, then let us begin with the team placements, Sensei announced as she began listing new teams and their team senseis, but Naruto already knew his. Two hours later, they waited for their Jinin instructor to show up. The rest of the new genins had already left with their respective senseis, only Team 7 remaining in the classroom. Where the hell is our sensei? Sakura complained. He has a tendency of being a few hours late for most of his appointments, Naruto answered her in a slightly distant tone. Huh? What kind of ninja is he, if he is so sloppy? Unironically, one of the best that the village has to offer. He bluntly told her. Sakura looked skeptical, Sasuke even more than her, though both said nothing to that. Being the person who knew why Kakashi was late propelled Naruto to tell them, at least bits and pieces. I know him from before and he really is a great shinobi, so you don't need to worry about him being lame or anything. He has his own way of coping with the life he has and loses he has suffered. He finished with a sad look. His parents were among those Kakashi lost. Kakashi knew them better than Naruto ever would and might even suffer more from their loss than he did. Because even if they were his parents, Naruto never knew them, Kakashi however did. That still doesn't excuse him for making us wait this long, the Ichiha's Avenger said this time, uttering those words with a slight annoyance, while turning his attention back towards a single dot on the wall in front of him, his hands folded in front of his mouth. Naruto shrugged it off. No point in arguing there. Kakashi would hopefully change his ways. Hopefully. The man was very keen on teaching Naruto a few times he shadowed him over. At best, he would do the same with Sasuke and Sakura. As they waited, the three genins indulged themselves with their own favorite free time activities. Sasuke brooded, Sakura gushed over him and Naruto meditated. His chakra control constantly needed to be improved and kept in place. Meditation was a rather good way to help him do it. All three of them were quiet in their own way, until surprisingly Sasuke broke the silence with a question directed towards Naruto. How are you so strong? He asked without looking at him, simply staring at one dot at the wall as he did for the past hour. Sakura stopped daydreaming about Sasuke and looked towards Naruto with an unsure expression. Question was probably directed at him, she deduced. Naruto opened his eyes but remained silent. Many reasons. Was his answer. He did not know how to answer. Many reasons. Yes. Naruto's blunt response forced Sasuke to turn around with an angry look. You're obviously much better than me or anyone else in this class and even the entire academy. Yet, you only come from a civilian background. I want to know. How? You know the shadow clone technique, yet you can't do a simple clone the rest of us are taught. How is that possible? 
he hated to admit that, but for a long time, he has come to the realization that Naruto was far ahead of him. He needed to know why. Naruto briefly considered what type of answer he should give to Sasuke. He didn't need to make an excuse, but for the time being his identity was supposed to be a secret. The fact he was with the last Uchiha and the same team was both ironic and dangerous. The last loyal Senju and the last loyal Uchiha. It really was ironic. Their two clans spent most of the Warring States era killing each other, creating this village in order to stop the endless circle of conflict and destruction of their families. Yet now, only two of them remain. And on the same team as well. A recipe for disaster. Depending on how the assignment Hokage gave him goes on Naruto and Sasu could lead to a new age of prosperity for both of their clans. Or they could lead the both of them on a path of destruction. While not as prejudiced as his ancestor, Tabarama Senju. Naruto did hold the slight wariness of the clan of the sockled curse of hatred. Equals equals flashback equals equals. The ten-year-old Naruto sat in the secret room of his clan and read a book about the Achiha clan and particularly their Sharingan. While his great-grandfather disliked Achihas for their clan's enmity. He could give credit to their strength where it's due. Even grudgingly. His ancestor, however, hated the Sharingan, its background, and the way it was needed to awaken it. The way Sharingan was awoken and his further manifestation was total opposite to everything Senju stood for. He read the following part of their ability section, the clan haunted by evil, no clan feels the love deeper than the Achiha clan does. For that reason, they feel a need to suppress it. Once an Achiha knows about love, all his previous senses are forgotten. One could say that the love of Achiha's bear would go along the lines of the love Senju's feel. But Achiha's love is unbalanced. The greater the love they feel, the greater the possibility of it going out of control. When a person close to you dies, you feel a need to mourn. Some for a longer time, some for a shorter time. You feel a need to prevent that from happening again if a person died violently. For Ichiha's result, that unbalanced love comes to fruition when someone close to them dies. When they feel great agony over the loss of someone close, or just deep disappointment in themselves chakra in their brain gets released, in turn, reacting to the optic nerves and changing the appearance in the person's eyes. A phenomenon called Sharingan. Eyes that reflect the heart. 3. Equals equals end of the flashback equals equals. The old man said that Sasuke never showed any indications that he had awoken his Sharingan. He probably didn't, but for all intents and purposes, he should have. There are some things you don't know about me, Sasuke. And it will remain like that for the time being. That is all I will say to you. He finally answered him. Sasuke was silent, but in the end, he accepted his answer and went back to his staring while Naruto went to his meditation, closing his eyes as he did. The atmosphere however remained a bit tense. Sakura, curious as she was, decided to ask Naruto a question that bugged her for a long time. Um, Naruto. May I ask you something? Personal. At Naruto's raised eyebrow, Sakura proceeded to ask. Is it true that you killed those three academy students and why did you? The question ended quickly, as it seemed Sakura wanted it out of her mouth. Yes. Was the only answer that came from Naruto. Sakura blinked, while Sasuke snorted so uncharacteristically for him. What a way to bond. Naruto inwardly mused. Do you guys know something about the Genin test? My parents told me it exists after we graduate. Point four. Sakura asked again. It's true. The key of the test is to see if we have teamwork and to see if we are eligible to actually become full-fledged Shinobus of Konoha. Naruto told her, trying to lift the tense mood. It's only teamwork. But that sounds too easy. There has to be something more. It is only that. Any sort of test will probably try to force a disunity among us and see if we actually possess the will of fire. Basically, if we prove we do, we pass. Naruto answered and smiled as he sensed their sensei standing by the door for the duration of this conversation. Soon after, Kakashi entered through the door and presented himself with one of his usual goofy eye smiles. Sorry I'm late. Got lost on the road of life. Naruto smirked, Sasuke glared, and Sakura was ready to explode. Meet me at the roof in five minutes. Don't be late. And now it begins. Hanahagakur no Sado, the Hokage's Tower, Jinin Meeting Hall. 1st April, 8 a.m., the Sandame Hokage, Saratobi Hirazan just finished announcing the placements for the new Genin teams. Sitting on his throne-like chair with the symbol of the Will of Fire standing tall behind him, he looked towards the 36 Jinins that would take over the same number of teams this year. 108 Academy students had passed their exams with only 12 failing this time around. They might quit or just take another year in the Academy for the additional training. And from these 36 teams, some, once again, might return to the Academy for another year. There are always such cases. In any case, he needed to make sure his Jinins knew of their duties regarding the new generation. Some would take a team for the first time, while others would just have to be reminded of certain things. As you now know of your potential teams, I must also brief you with your main duties regarding their training. You can implement your own style into it if you want, but 
what you're going to read in those envelopes in front of you is a musto, regardless of your own ways on the matter. As Jimin's, sitting on the floor in front of him, nodded in understanding, taking the envelopes in front of them and proceeding to read the contents. As some of them continued reading it, Siratobi decided to give another one of his advice. As you all know, after the Achiha clan's massacre, I, alongside with both the hiring shinobi and the clan council, have decided to implement some changes to the academy's curriculum and the standard training of the shinobi forces that every active ninja of Kanoha must abide by. He continued retelling them the story, not for the first time. And they had listened just as they had obeyed his orders. Both his shknins and jmins. Jinnin says for the past three years, since this rule was passed, have upped the training of their students, which resulted in better performance of the new genins. While the title of Chknin actually meant more than a simple promotion from being a simple non genin ninja wearing a fancy uniform. Now, the academy students had to know more advanced chakra control exercises of tree and water walking, at the very least. It would save time during their genin training. Among other things. Saratobi thought. Saratobi loathed that the Achiha clan's massacre had a role in his wacky call. But as they had lost a significant portion of their forces there, and given the reports from Jureya that Arachimaru was presumably building his own village. It was a necessity. Anahagakur had always prided itself in being in favor of quality over quantity, in contrast to the Iwagakur's quantity, and to an extent who favored the mix of both, resulting in the hybrid composition of the armed forces, depending on the time and the rakage himself. They had faced some defection from a small number of ninjas who abandoned the village in pursuit of their own selfish ambitions for many years. And Hirazin was adamant to lower that number as much as he could before his successor one day could take the mantle of the fifth Hokage. He had someone in mind, but for the sake of both his heir presumptive and the village, Hirazin would warm this seat for a few more years if the heavens were kind to him. Ignoring Arachimaru, cases like Mizuki or Rakish Maui were threatening to the development of the future generations. He used the veteran Shinobis and those who had decided to retire previously to form a special unit of the Anbus for cracking down the potential spies and traitors. It was a risky move, for one could never be sure where a traitor would make his nest. And he was getting paranoid as the time went on. But he needed to. Too many incidents happened for the past 13 years for him to simply be laid back. Even so, the rooster for the academy staff had to be under constant surveillance. Mizuki and Aoi were the instructors at the academy, after all. Jennings now had to perform at least a minimum of the training regime required, one that he devised during each day of the training. One the starting date of their first mission was also arranged. It was a tradition for the Hokage to wish the new youth a bit of good luck, after all. And it would ease his schedule in the office a bit. Jennings, for the high rank missions, had to perform various types of lower rank missions first, before they could be even signeted for the Chknin selection exams by their respective senseis or be promoted on the field if they were ready for it. In any case, they had to have the experience of understanding how border patrolling works. Something he had to arrange with the Kanoichi village of Natashiko from the land of T. It wouldn't do well for Kanoha to get another one of their traditional international incidents or disputes on the table. Wars have been started for less. So the Kanoichis from Natashiko would know that Kanoha means to have no military drills on their borders. And in turn, they would not try to snatch some of their young virgin genins or their senseis for their seed. He couldn't forbid them to interact during those encounters on the other hand. As Siratobi mused about it in his mind, a longing wish to be young again filled his body for a brief moment. He mentally shook his head to forget about it. Jennings would also need to know how escort missions are performed, delivery, interrogation, tracking, and so on. All those things they would have to learn the experience on the field would help them advance further. And help them stay alive. Quality over quantity. Turning his attention back to his Jimnins, he addressed them once more. Bear in mind that I will have someone report to me the progress of your students, so it would be in your best interest that you do not slack off with their training and further education. Or even your own, for that matter. He warned them. We have been dealt with many heavy blows for the past decade and more. I don't want the village and its future to suffer because of it or because of slothfulness of our own. It is up to us to leave a better world for the younger generations and it is up to them to look at us as their role models. When you take them under your wings, you are not only making sure that the name of our village rises further, but also of your own families and yourself. Isjimnin nodded, with one of them raising their hands, wanting to ask the Hokage something. Irohakin, Saratobi said, granting the Jimnin opportunity to speak. The Kajusama. The Haikajinin in question bowed slightly, proceeding to ask his question. Is there any particular reason why there was such an imbalanced team placement this year? I'm referring to Team 7, under Jinin Sensei, Hada Kakashi. The Kashi, for his part, turned his attention from his orange book and looked towards his Hokage, while the other Jinin's in room started whispering among each other. All of them wondered the same. 
that is classified information, though I have no doubt that many of you understand the reasons for such action, here is in replied. However, you should know that I was the one who arranged the Team 7's membership for this year. And that it will not be changed. The Hokage answered. Shiranui Genma raised his hand this time, exclaiming his own curiosity after getting permission from the Hokage to speak. Considering the new arrangements for the Gen in training, Hakaja-sama are the teamwork tests to remain the same, or are we supposed to upgrade the difficulty? Sandame shook his head in a negative way. The tests, as you see them fit, are better if they remain the same. We have probably lost some good potential in the past because we sought to focus on the teamwork from our geniusistad without introducing them to the importance of the concept itself while they were in the academy. For that, we have placed a bigger focus on that subject before their graduation. In the past, they wanted selectively to pass their students. Only those who figured out the meaning of their tests would pass. Now on the other hand, by imparting into the young minds both the necessity and the positive sides of teamwork, they would pass with a better performance than they would have some three years ago or before. Previously, those who passed their Jinin-sensei's tests for the second time were the prime material for becoming the Masingans. Bitterness, anger, and shame all played their parts in corrupting their psyche. By ensuring they were familiar with the concept of teamwork early on, new Shinobis would figure out the meaning of the test right away. For the most part. Working together they would pass. And when they passed they would always remember that it was the teamwork who got where they were. There was a low-key chance for them to turn rogue. With this new module, they got better Shinobis in training and more Shinobis in numbers, in turn. If that is all, I believe you have your future students to meet soon. I wish you all the best of luck. May the will of fire brighten your way and your future. The Sandane finished with a smile, getting the chorus of, yes Hikajusama. As he did. With Kakashi, Ada Kakashi walked towards his destination Kanoha Shinobi Academy. After Sandame's briefing and spending two hours at the memorial stone in memory of his deceased teammates, he decided that it was time to go. As he walked at a slow pace, he didn't even pick up his book to read. Contemplating on how he would train his team. He had no doubts they would pass. With Naruto on the team, it was expected. But. His team also consisted of a self-centered Avenger and an Avengers fangirl. The orders from the Hokage were clear though. He was to be Sasuke's watcher, and in turn, he had to make sure that the last loyal Ichiha stayed loyal to the village. Sandame told him that Naruto also knew of his missions, so he would get some help there. If he was honest with himself, Kakashi didn't know what to do with Sasuke. With Naruto, all he had to do was prepare his mental state for the more advanced missions once he was promoted. It'll be fast. Minatosensei's son was a prodigy, in a similar fashion to him and Itachi. Kakashi didn't know why he compared the sensei's son to one of Konoha's most infamous traitors. He knew Naruto for some time, and despite what he went through he would remain loyal to the village. It was the only home he had and the only home he knew. In addition to that, he had few bonds within the village. The chance of him fleeing was slim if non-existent. But he had to be on alarm for his mental state now. Kasuk did a good job in any case. And with the inclusion of Jiraiya, all the initial suspicions flew away like wind. It was the total opposite to his other teammate. Sasuke. Sasuke is the problem. It was no secret to the shinobi population that the Ichiha clan as a whole liked keeping it to themselves regarding anything. Few exceptions existed, of course. But even they were in a minority in the entire clan. The curse of hatred. Minatosensei once mentioned. Regarding his teammate Abito as an exception to such a curse and a complete opposite to the general conduct of the said clan. Abito was a towering example of the will of fire in Kakashi's opinion. His unfortunate death established his esteem within Haddock's mind. The Kashi sighed as he stood in front of the door to the classroom his future team was currently in. Hearing Sakura questioning her teammates about the Genin test he didn't fight back the smile that was prowling onto his face. I'll do this the right way. Abito, Rin, Minatosensei. He decided that they waited enough. Opening the door, he walked inside, presenting himself with his usual goofy eye smile and lame excuse he always had. Sorry I'm late. Got lost on the route of life. He could see Sasuke glaring in such a prickly way. Well, at least he can control himself. Kakashi thought. He could see Sakura being ready to explode. She'll be handy. And Naruto simply smirked. He knew about his coping mechanism at least. He would need to find another. Perhaps it was even the time to let go of the past and resentment of it. He needed to live by Abito's legacy, not drown in its memory. Meet me at the roof in five minutes. Don't be late. He told them as he disappeared in a swirl of leaves. I'll do this the right way from now on. Three of them are the future. In the capital city of the land of iron, with Jiraiya, am. I always forget how cold this land really is. The toad sage, Jiraiya of the San and thought as he walked over the snowy streets of the samurai homeland's capital city. His footprints were getting covered by the falling snow as he walked further and further through the town. Being deep in the mountains of the land of iron it was expected. 
Still, it didn't mean that Jiraiya had to like it, but Naruto was rather adamant about getting new armor for the Chiknin exams. For all his talk about setting his emotions aside, Naruto has asked him to commission an armor set for his match in future missions. And from the land of iron of all places. Maybe it was a mistake to tell him about the quality of metal from this country. Jiraiya thought. Bah. Even if I didn't, the kid would figure it out somehow. Name of the country aside. But the fire wasn't very common in the land of fire, affinity of their ninjas aside. Only when some sort of catastrophe happens. He wouldn't think that the iron in the land of iron was the best. Would he? As he walked through the snowy streets, Jiraiya had noticed that many people were uneasy as they were running amok. It was a Friday and the streets were busy with people going around on their way, scrambling around the food stores in order to acquire the goods that were usually unavailable. However, there were many more samurais and many more civilians than before, as Jiraiya recalled his past visits to this place. The capital city wasn't that populous in the past. A breach in the security? Most likely. Perhaps his old acquaintance would know something. Samurais didn't wage a war with neighboring countries in a long time. They must have experienced a population boom, he thought with a lecherous grin on his face. Not soon after, he reached his destination. The best armorsmith in the continent. Sadamun. Jiraiya walked inside the shop. A rather exuberant place. Well, he was always the type of guy to show off his fame and skills. It was a large building built in traditional architecture, like every other building in this country, with wooden dolls standing on the outside with a pair of different armors on them, signifying it was an armory. If a sign above the door was missed by a passenger by any chance, the bell rang as he entered through the door, but no one came from behind the shop. Maybe he took a break. Gurea proceeded to look around the shop. Various types of battle gear were hanging around the room. Both of the armor and regular weaponry. It took you long enough to come out, Jiraiya said smirking as he turned around and faced an old man in his late fifties, of mid-height, bald of head and long black beard, with a few shades of grey here and there, and a pair of glasses on his eyes. It's not like anyone would dare to steal from here, not even ninjas. Even your kind has some sense of honor when it comes to business. The old man replied in a harsh tone, but his face immediately cracked a smile. It's good to see you Jiraiya. How long has it been? Fifteen years. More. Thirteen. It was just after the third war, Jiraiya corrected, still smiling. It is good to see you old friend. He approached Sadamune and they shook hands. It's good to see you too, Jiraiya. But tell me you're not commissioning something for any of your ninja wars. I don't want to have problems with Mifunodono. Despite his calm demeanor, he gets prickly if I were to start dealing with you people during your fights. It's nothing of the sort, Sadamune, Jiraiya said. I want to order an armorset for a boy of 13 to 17 age group to last for a few years before he decides to buy a new one. He moved his hand to his pocket and pulled out a sheet of paper and handed it to the blacksmith. The sheet of paper contained the current measures of the Armorsid, as well as the Senju clan insignia on its chest, that Naruto wanted to be present. Hopefully, Sadamune would not recognize it. Taking the paper in his hands, the blacksmith nodded, but then widened his eyes suddenly. Or would. You have some explaining to do Jiraiya. The blacksmith said with furrowed eyebrows as he pointed a crest on a paper. The toad sage sighed. I can't say much for now. You'll hear the news in a few months anyway. Looking towards the old blacksmith and his skeptical face Jiraiya sighed once more. Fine. How much? It'll be 600,000 rim, Sadamun said. 600,000 Jiraiya shouted. What the hell? Since when did you get this expensive? And just to keep a secret. Ever since I've been dealing with Shinobis. Don't worry I won't say a word about your Senju boy to anyone. But, do you know about the bureaucracy I'll have to deal with in order to get you this set? All the material I need to buy first. Sadamune retorted. I assume your Senju boy wants it to be chakra enduring, right? It would be nice if you could arrange it, Jiraiya said with an automatic smile, but then turned serious. It won't cost more, right? No worries, Jiraiya. It won't. The price is just for the armor and the materials I need to buy first. The blacksmith said. But it'll take much longer for me to have it ready than usual, with this crisis we have at the moment. He grumbled at the end. So there was something suspicious happening. I was about to ask you regarding that. What's the deal? I don't remember samurais being this uneasy, like ever. Jiraiya pointed out, crossing his arms. You guys don't go around waging wars on neighboring countries. Is someone attacking you? There were more people than usual. So it wasn't a population boom. Maybe refugees from the battle-affected regions. Hardly, Sadamune muttered as he moved behind his counter. From what I have heard, there's a number of young children missing from the villages at the border with the land of rice paddies. Two Mifunodono has sent a missive to the rice daemon, but all he has got is a denial of such accusations. It gets worse as the rice country now has the hidden village of Togakur no Sado. He sneered at the mention of that name. So those were the refugees. A new war. 
the land can never get rest it seems. Gureya knew that while Sadamun respected him and supplied him with the intelligence, during the Third Shinobi World War, he disliked the Shinobis and what they stood for. While not a samurai himself, he had their sense of honor. And the two professions were so different from each other that it was a miracle how the blacksmith was friendly with him. Gureya guessed that saving another man from a group of rogue ninjas has never given a better result in the new friendship. A number of young children are missing. Jiraiya muttered as he considered many options. There is only one man that comes to mind. You know something about that. Sadamune raised his eyebrow as he typed the bill for the armor. Maybe, Jiraiya paused for a second as he closed his eyes. Before he fled Konoha, my old teammate Rachimaru was discovered experimenting on the young children, being responsible for their kidnapping. Doing all sorts of experiments on them. If there is someone to be the prime suspect it's him. I should have known it was one of your own doing that. Sadamun snorted bitterly. Anyway, here's your bill. Give it to the kid that wants the armor. A six into thousand rims. Naruto will have to take something from his inheritance for this. Not that it would harm his income in any case. I can have your word you won't mention anything about this armor to anyone. He needed to be sure. Naruto's heritage would be revealed anyway in a few months, but it was better to make sure the kid was safe until he got more experience. As safe as the life of a shinobi could be. I'm not a woman, Jiraiya, nor do I have the benefit of being in their company as much as you do. But tell me this, who is the kid? Your old student son. Sadamun peeked from the side. Not telling. Jiraiya snorted as he started walking out of the shop. Jiraiya. Sadamun called him once more before he left. Please go and see Mifunodona regarding this. It'll mean a lot to us. He nodded. If Arachimaru really was behind all this, then it would be wise to ally with Samurai to stop him. By the way. How long will it take you to finish that armor? A new schedule was needed to arrange his traveling plans. Many things would need to be checked. Money to be picked and messages to be delivered. Come back in about a month. It should be ready by then. A month to finish all this. I should get to a nearby onsen before I leave. Jiraiya thought mischievously. Some pleasure for his soul won't harm anyone after all. And it would be good to get a little warm from all this cold. Well then, see you around old friend. Anahagakur no Sado. 9th April. A week has passed since they became genins, and today would be the first day when they would take their first mission. Ever since the day they passed their test, before starting the training, Kakashisensei had them do the new training regime for genins that was required 200 laps around the training field, 100 push-ups, the same number of sit-ups and back stretchers. And that was only for warm-up. It wasn't a problem for Naruto to do them, and neither was for Sasuke. Sakura, however, got tired quickly. She would have to go step by step in order to reach the required hundred without much fatigue. The day was also the day when they would have their first mission. For the duration of the first week, they were doing mostly team building exercises with an occasional spar between the members of the team. But now, Kakashisensei has deemed them ready for them. While a bit disgruntled for the lack of a more practical side of training, Naruto understood the necessity of the training their sensei had put them up to. All three genins had different worldviews and values. While they passed their beltist it was due to Naruto who knew the true meaning behind it. Journals are certainly one way to gather the necessary information that would help you later on. And pieces of information are sometimes lifesaviors on the battlefield. Sakura still had her fangirl moments. But she had the potential to be broken off from that persona. Their missions would no doubt be a great wacky call for her to take things more seriously. Albeit, she already did if only for the sake of Sasuke noticing her. Because as Naruto told her, she needed to ditch her diet and eat more in order to get the Ichiha's attention. A bit of manipulation. As he had ignored her while she was skinny. If she gained more weight he might start giving her actual attention. Although it required a bit of persuasion from Sasuke's side. For now, he should ignore her if she pesters him with anything other than ninja training. What do you think our first mission will be? Sakura asked her teammates as they walked towards the academy where they would receive their first mission. Something within the village most likely. Naruto said. Sensei. Sakura directed her question towards Kakashi. Naruto is correct. Most of your initial missions will be within the village. He told her. Only later on when I deem you experienced enough for the higher ranked missions I can talk with the Hikaju-sama and ask him to allow it. Which will most likely happen soon. Kakashi thought with a hint of pride. Despite their differences, the three of them showed great teamwork during their training. Even if for the sake of just finishing the task early. Sasuke was a bit distanced from his teammates, but Sakura and Naruto at least had a cordial relationship. He noticed during the first three days of their team's existence, Sakura would occasionally be tense around Naruto, but fortunately, she broke from that shell fast, as she got to know him better. Team 7 reporting for our first mission, Hakajusama, Kakashi said as he and his team entered the mission assignment room, bowing slightly to the Sandame Hokage who sat behind the desk with various papers on it. Mission requests most likely. Ah, it's good that you came. 
We have many drank missions for today. Some teams have already come and picked them up. Saratobi said as he skimmed throughout the paper with a list of missions for rookies. Here we are. We have 1. Finding a missing cat. 2. Cleaning the garden. 3. Babysitting three children of the merchant from the capital that is visiting the village. We'll take the finding a missing cat mission, Hakajusama. Kakashi interrupted, seeing his genitals getting a little impatient. Sasuke and Naruto at least did. Sakura had a confused expression on her face. Very well. Here is a picture of a cat. Saratobi handed the photo to Kakashi. And here is the list of locations where he could be at the moment. Thank you Hikajusama. Team 7, let's go. Finding a missing cat. Sasuke sneered once they exited the building. Exactly, Sasuke Kakashi said flatly. Consider this as training for a tracking mission that you might encounter in your career. HN. He turned his head to the other side as he gave his unhappy grunt. Shouldn't teammate be better suited for this type of mission? Naruto asked with a raised eyebrow. They are a tracking team officially, after all. Maybe, but I want you to get experience in different fields before we embark on hiring missions, Kakashi said nonchalantly. At Naruto's continued skepticism, he simply shrugged his shoulders and picked up his orange book from his host and began reading it. Here's the picture of a cat you're supposed to find, and here are the parameters on where he could be. He handed them the photo and map as he continued reading. Good luck. What are you going to do while we search? Sakura asked. I'll oversee you and the result of your team building exercises, Kakashi said as he flipped another page of his book, not even lifting his head as he answered. We should check the closest location first, Sakura said, shooting her sensei a disgruntled look. Right. It's the old Senju compound. Sasuke said, accepting the current situation as it was. Fuck. How could I forget that? Naruto didn't want Sakura and Sasuke to go there now. Curiosity killed the cat. After all, wait. I'll try to sense him and pinpoint his location. He suggested instead. How can you sense it if you don't even know its signature? Sakura questioned. It was true. However, he answered his theory nonetheless. All I need is to sense the male animal, in this case, a cat, that's away from the humans within the village. We can begin the search that way. As the cat escaped, he should be away from the crowds. Or at least somewhere he would not be disturbed or easily found. 3. Fine. How far is your range? Sasuke asked this time. I can go 5 kilometers for now. The range will expand as I grow. It was already strong as it was, allowing Naruto to detect various chakra signatures in the village. With one male having traces of chakra similar to his own in a way. It was one of the Anbus that acted as his guardian when Kasuk was away. He didn't mention that to anyone, yet. Or ask the person in question, anything. He figured that the old man must have known something about it, but kept it a secret for now. Sasuke looked at him strangely for a moment before nodding. Where should we start then? Naruto placed his finger on the ground and focused on his senses. After a minute or so he smiled and answered. Forest near the Nara clan's compound. A perfect place to hide and evade the intruders. A half hour later, I can't believe that she actually was there, Sakura said as they walked towards the academy once more. It wasn't hard to find the cat with a sensor on their team, but catching it was a lot harder. But still, they managed to grab him. The cat really likes you, Sasukakin, Sakura said, watching the said animal peacefully sleeping in the Ichiha's arms. Hey Chen. Are we doing another mission today, Kakashi-sensei? Sakura asked again. Kakashi thought about it for a second. Maybe another one that requires teamwork. Sure, why not? They can work together on a mission while he oversees them and reads his book in the process. You're finished already? Sandam Hokage, Saratobi Hirazin asked lifting his head from a document he was previously reading. The power of teamwork, Hikajusama, Naruto said formally, but there was a small glint of laughter in his blue eyes. I see. Saratobi nodded. Bring Rusin in. One of the Hokage's assistants stood up and went to another room, calling the customer for the mission to come. A short woman, with short dark blue hair and a somewhat emotionless look, came inside, tugging the cat from Sasuke's arms, who scowled at such disrespect. Why have you run away from me, Nachin? The woman asked as she started hugging her cat tightly and exiting the building after paying the successfully accomplished mission. What's up with her? Naruto asked while Kakashi went to ask for another mission. I know her from my neighborhood. I heard she had that cat ever since her husband left her after finding out she cheated on him with a merchant from the Land of Lighting. Sakura whispered to him. He dodged kunai with that one, even if the wound would scar him forever. He gave no comment, only a curt nod. You want another mission for your team, Kakashi? They heard the Hokage ask their sensei. Yes Hikajusama. Let's see. You have. The sand aim started listing available jobs. A week later, what do you think sensei will have us do today? Sakura asked her teammates as they waited for Kakashi to show up. More teamwork probably. Sasuke blurted out. Content that Akrush acknowledged her Sakura continued with the flow. 
Do you think you'll start teaching us any technique soon? Probably. The answer came from Naruto who was leaning on a nearby tree. He actually talked to the old man about this phenomenon. Apparently, there is a new training regimen for all of the standard forces of Konoha. Team building is essential right now. Jutsus will come later. Where would you two like to specialize in? Naruto sat up straight from the tree he was leaning on, scratching his back from the crumbs of the tree that slipped through his clothes. I'd like to be an all-round shinobi, if that makes sense. Or where I can, that is. All except the medical ninjutsu. Same as Naruto, Sasuke muttered. What about you, Sakura? I don't know. She said, Satoru-sensei said I have good chakra control, so I could go for medical ninjutsu. I'll probably go with one of those two. It won't hurt to try both, Naruto advised her. While the medical ninjutsu is useful, it will leave you lacking in the combat part. You could actually go with it and supplement it with tojutsu. Maybe even some. Sakura seemed to think about it. I'll see with Kakashi-sensei and hear what he has to say. She nodded to herself. What do you think, Sasuke-kun? I agree with Naruto. Was the only reply from the Acheha. Seeing as Kakashi was still absent, more so than usual, Naruto took out the advanced Kenjutsu manual from his holster and began reading it. Kenjutsu? Questioned Sakura. I didn't know you were interested in that. I'm still a beginner. But I'd like to be more proficient one day. If I ever want to learn the Flying Thunder God technique. Went unsaid. So how good are you with it? Naruto never actually considered this. While Jiraiya praised him as a prodigy in the art, he did say he was still far from a master. It wasn't that irritating. He didn't bother learning much of it before. But as he was a genin now, there weren't many other things he should give most of his focus on. He mastered his two affinities to the fullest. All that was needed was to expand his already large repertoire of. Hard to tell. I know how to create basic explosive tags and more advanced ceiling scrolls, in addition to elemental traps and a few more that are useful in battle. I'd say I'm slightly better than the average shinobi. But as I haven't given much focus on kenjutsu until now, it's hard to tell. Sakura nodded and Kakashi arrived soon after that. Sorry I'm late, but I had a meeting with Hakajisama just beforehand. Cutting Sakura off as she was about to complain. Naruto raised his eyebrow in curiosity and Kakashi addressed him next. He also told me that he needs to talk to you later on regarding some shipment, Naruto. Naruto nodded. Jiraiya must have returned with his armor or at least the request for money to be deposited for this investment. Right then, aside from the meeting, I visited one of the shinobi gear shops and got some things that should help you in your further training, Kakashi said, gaining the full attention of his students, especially Sasuke who was ignoring him for the first part. How will you do that, sensei? Sakura asked. First. With this. Kakashi said and pulled out a small deck of papers, handing each of them one piece. Now watch. He channeled his chakra into the one he was holding, making it wrinkle. For What does that mean? Kiria Sakura asked while Naruto and Sasuke watched in silence. That means that the lighting is my primary affinity, Kakashi answered. Although, at the same time I am capable of using all other four elements as well. Due to the fact I trained those elements from scratch. But, as they are not my primary affinity, I can't use them that well. These papers can determine your elemental affinity, something that every person has. I see. Was the response from Sakura. Now it's your turn, Kakashi said with an easy eye smile. Simply channel your chakra to the paper and the rest will do itself. Sakura went first getting her paper crumble, indicating earth elemental affinity. Sasuke was second with his paper wrinkling, showing he had a strong affinity for lighting, something that surprised both Kakashi and Naruto, who thought that Ichihas were naturally inclined towards the fire. Congratulations, Sasuke, it seems you have a strong affinity for lighting. Though, judging by the strength of your fire techniques, I suspect that you have a strong and trained affinity for fire, too. Complimented Kakashi. H.N., Sasuke grunted constantly. It would explain why he had a hard time mastering the Grand Fireball Jutsu when he was a child. Something that irked him to no end. At the same time, he was happy that he found the answer to the question he never actually asked. Naruto took the last turn with his paper being cleanly sliced in half in a rather violent way and at the same time got completely wet. Both indicated a strong affinity for wind and water, which Kakashi pointed out to the two remaining students who were left wondering from the minor show. Naruto's paper shows that he has a strong affinity for both wind and water at the same time. Now before you ask this means that he was born with the affinity for both elements. Kakashi explained. Furthermore, this is also common among bloodline based shinobus or clans from other nations. Naruto nodded. He already knew about that, but what he didn't know about was the exact bloodline he had. He had a book about bloodline mutations, but the book only explained how certain advanced nature manipulations turned into bloodlines initially. Other villages certainly do have shinobis with bloodline. Particularly Karigakur. Naruto promised himself that one of these days he would try to combine his elements into a new one. 
if it was even possible to do so, that is. So does that mean that Naruto has a bloodline? Sakura asked. It can mean that, Sakura. Yes. But at the same time many Shinobis are born with two different elements, yet never show any signs of a bloodline mutation. The Sandame Hikajusama is a prime example of this. He was born with the affinity for fire and earth, yet has never been able to create a lava release for example, but is able to use those elements in combination with each other, making him feared throughout the elemental nations, and earning him a title of the professor, in addition to the god of shinobi. Kakashi finished his lecture. Naruto may have a bloodline, but he also may not. It is up to him to experiment and try and find out if he wants that is. Once again, Naruto nodded. He would definitely do that. The Senju name was to resurface once again. Well he wanted to do it with flying Raijin, it may not be possible to do so in the Chiknin exams. But. He could make a name for himself at a later date anyway. On the other hand, it would be beneficial for Konoha to gain another bloodline. Well they had a definite and certain bloodline in Haikta's Byakugan and uncertain in Achiha Sharingan and Karama clan's Ido Keke Genkai. It wouldn't hurt to have another one. Konoha prided itself in a hereditary talent of various clans that dwelled inside of it, unlike the other villages who possessed the various bloodlines in their own right including some minor villages. As the old saying regarding the bloodlines went, Karigakur has. Kanahagakur preserves. Sunagakur watches. Awagakur explores. And Kumagakur takes. 5. Now. Kakashisensei woke him from his musings with his announcement. Sasuke, Naruto. You two will for the duration of my tutoring practice mostly with elemental manipulation and ninjutsu, respectively. Sakura, well I'm proud of you for stepping up with your training. He said, making the pink-haired girl smile. You would do better with her medical ninjutsu supplemented with tajutsu. With your current chakra reserves, it would suit you better as well as be more useful, as the earth element takes a lot of chakra, which could leave you vulnerable to attacks if the fight is prolonged. I understand, Kakashi-sensei. She said with confidence. Good. Now let's warm up a bit and start with the first steps of your individual training. Kakashi told them. Sakura and Sasuke at least needed to go with the first steps. He's yet to figure out what to do with Naruto. Maybe he could start learning a third element as he studies Genjutsu. He needed to step up with his own training too. Arachimaru has been making moves lately. Possibly creating a new village of his own. That didn't bode well. Sandane told that bit of information that he got from Jiraiya only to a selected group of Jinins in order to give Arachimaru a sense of security. The Snake Sandan would no doubt change whatever plans he had if the information that Kanoha knew about his movements was revealed. They're growing up. Kakashi thought as he looked at his students warming up. If he wanted to honor his deceased teammates, he should focus on developing his own team, if anything not to become like his own dead. Somewhere in the land of rice paddies, this is wrong. Walking through the greenery of his homeland, one endogenic Maru 6 wondered why many of his countrymen considered this as a good thing for their homeland. His clan elder deemed that serving the rogue Kanoha Sanin would be a good thing for the clan and the people of the country as a whole. But Genic Maru had his doubts. He wouldn't be a rogue shinobi if he was good. When Arachimaru came to their disgraced country, using their defeat in the war against the land of hot water, it was a too tempting opportunity to pass. Uniting the rather rival, but in between peaceful clans, was no easy task for the individual shinobis of their country to do. But Arachimaru held good connections with many of them, using that as a tool to finally unite them. They passed an opportunity to create their own hidden village back when everyone else did. Maybe another chance would not come to pass. And to kick their pride, even more, a rogue leadership project of Kanoha used them for dishonorable tasks such as this one. Don't slack off. Was the order the blue-haired bitch directed towards the column of children that he was guarding on their way to one of Arachimaru's concentration camps. One child had collapsed, prompting the woman to slap him with a whip into the willingness to walk further. What will be there when his family is dead? The child stood up and joined back to the group, whimpering and shedding tears as he did. The test subjects. The future test subjects enslaved children from the few villages on the borders of the Land of Iron. The blue-haired bitch Gurin appeared before him, while the other twelve shinobis of the Atagakur guarded the column of slaves, while they walked by the narrow cliffs in one of many hills of his country. They finished the last raid on those villages. Arachimaru was smart enough not to use the children of the Land of Rice Paddies, but in order to repay his generosity, they had to perform these types of missions for him. Among other things. Denik Maru thought that Arachimaru probably wanted to use many of them for his experiments, but even he alone would not fare well against all the clans of the newly formed village of Atagakur. Disgraceful. What's up with you, Jenik Maru? Gurin asked him, seeing him frown. Nothing, just tired from having no rest. That's all. The FF. It seems like you and your countrymen aren't as tough as you wanted to believe. She taunted him, but he ignored her provocations. How will an enslaving bunch of children help the Atagakur prosper? He asked her back. Gurin snorted at his question. 
It won't. This is a gift for Rachimara-sama. The feeling of disgust and shame had filled Jenikmaru as he heard her words, but he relented. It was needed. For now. What does he plan to do with them? No idea. And it's not your business to stick your nose into, anyway. You are from the land of iron originally? He asked her after some time. She was very ruthless against these people for some reason. He heard some rumors that propelled him to ask this question. Rumors of a crystal release appearing and destroying the entire village in that country. The only other crystal release user he knew of was her. Yes, Gurin answered emotionlessly. Jenikmaru decided it was better not to provoke her further. He wanted to go back to his new village. He actually wanted to bring glory to his village, his fatherland. Selfish Daemon. Wicked Messingans. Loyal psychopaths. These were the things he wanted to purify his homeland from. One day. One day I will. Denik Mary thought as they approached a northern hideout, delivering the prisoners as was ordered. Anahagakur no Sado, 4th May. Formation 8. Naruto said. Higher style. Great fireball jutsu. Wind style. Vacuum great sphere. Sasuke exclaimed, unleashing the great ball of fire towards the river, with Naruto increasing its size with his own sphere of wind a second later. As a part of his team building exercises, Kakashi had them do a bunch of collaboration techniques to increase their familiarity with each other. For now, they got used to supplementing Sasuke's fire attacks with Naruto's wind ones. Sasuke smirked in pride, thankfully nodding towards Naruto. He has gotten out of his shell a bit for the duration of their team's existence, but was still as antisocial as ever. I'll show you one day, Itachi. By passing his initial surprise at Naruto already having a large arsenal of wind and water style techniques, Sasuke mused that it would help him big time when the time to kill Itachi comes. It was good that Naruto seemed to be willing to help him with his elemental training and was generally interested in collaboration for whatever reason. Swallowing his pride for a moment seemed like a wise decision back when he actually asked for help, it seems. Looking towards the other part of the training ground, Sasuke saw Sakura sparring with Kakashi into Jutsu. She began learning right after the second step in their training that Kakashi introduced. When do you think we'll get higher ranked missions? He asked Naruto. Soon. I hope. Naruto answered. I don't think I can survive these boring dranks anymore. HN. It seems that they're finished as well, Naruto commented once he saw Sakura go to rest by one of the trees after a spar, followed by Kakashi sensei Let's go and see if Sensei thinks it's time for us to do higher ranked ones. As they approached the remaining two members of Team 7, Naruto asked if they were ready for the first crank mission. After all, they already made 28 ranks since their team was formed. You're right. I do think you're ready for a crank mission. Kakashi said, getting a smile from both Sasuke and Naruto. Sakura seemed unsure of herself for a moment, but nodded in support of her teammate's intention. We can go and take one after the lunch break. But the mission itself will most likely start tomorrow or some other day. They're not always instant like the dranks are. After the short break, Team 7 headed towards the Hokage's tower at a slow pace. It was a sunny day like every other, and the streets were bustling with happy folk that went on their own way. What do you think the mission will be like? Sakura asked, placing a pointy finger on her mouth in a thinking pose. Naruto shrugged his shoulders. Probably nothing too dangerous, we're still rookies. Sasuke walked in silence as always, while Kakashi read his favorite book. I just hope nothing bad happens while we're at it, Sakura confessed, feeling a hand being placed on her shoulder and turning her head seeing it was Naruto's who smiled kindly to her. Don't fret about it. You've gotten strong enough for anything we could encounter on the standard crank mission. And if we do encounter something more dangerous, remember we have Kakashi sensei on the team. Thank you Naruto. Words of her blonde teammate were always encouraging, and Sakura was grateful for them. It was more inspiring when she heard some praise from him than a simple grunt from Sasukakin. Yet also she felt that she would be safe with not only Kakashi sensei around, but also him for some reason. Soon they got to the Hokage's tower and entered inside. It was a bit weird that they wouldn't be getting a mission from the standard office in the academy. But it was probably due to the fact it was not a drank or anything. Ah, Kakashi, it's good to see you. The Sandame Hokage exclaimed as he saw their Jimin sensei enter his office. You too, Narutakin, Sasukakin, Sakurachin. The old Hokage acknowledged their presence, getting a bow of respect from the three young genins. I'm here to request permission for the first crank mission for my team, as per your rules regarding the rookie genin team, Hakajisama Kakashi said. Betting a nod from the Hokage, who stood up and walked towards one of the bookshelves by the wall, Kakashi got a scroll that the old Hokage took with the following orders. Give this scroll to the border guard mission department in their headquarters. You know where they are. Thank you Hakajisama. Kakashi said. Betting another nod from their leader as well as the words of good luck, Team 7 bowed once again and left towards the designated building. Border Guard Mission Department was one of the units of the Kanoha Standard Forces that was composed of many Jinins and Shknins who chose to join it as it was relatively safe during the peace times and had a good salary. 
that didn't mean the job itself was easy. It was probably one of the more dangerous ones, even if it was classified as only a brank mission for the borders of the nations from where the attack could be expected. Gen and teams were for that reason directed to the safe borders of the land of T, where no conflict or at very least minimal one could be expected. Okay, Team 7. Tomorrow at 7 a.m., be at the front gate with the clothes you think you will need for a toy trip. As well as the shinobi gear and food supplies. Don't be late. Yes, Kakashi-sensei Kakashi, said Naruto and Sakura respectively, with Sasuke omitting the correct title. Reminder to work on his manners sometimes. Kakashi thought. The trip to the border. After making sure that his team got the necessary equipment for the toy clone mission Kakashi decided to depart. By traveling with ninja speed he calculated they would arrive at the border of the land of T within the five-day time, replacing the current team there for the duration of one week, two at most if anything goes the wrong way, or a new team replacing them becomes absent. After the four-day trip, they arrived at the main base Shmichi, earlier than they thought. The base was responsible for deploying Shinobis to the various patrols. Inside of the minor camp, there were around 12 higher ink ninjas, with few tables around and maps of the border on its walls. The camp itself was basically a cave that housed the Leafnins before they were directed to their own sector to be deployed. Granted, this border was mostly patrolled by the new Genins as a part of their training. Long time no see, hey Amazon. Kakashi greeted a fellow Jinin in charge of the sector they would oversee, handing him the scroll that explained the mission from the Border Guard Mission Department. Strange to see you on time, Kakashi-san. Said the Jinin in charge with serious expression. New rules for Jinins, as you know for yourself, Kakashi said as he scratched his head. The reputation of being late was embarrassing when mentioned in front of his students. Ha. Doesn't matter. Here is your starting point and here is the subsector that you're supposed to patrol. It's five miles long, east and west respectively. In the scroll it stated where you should place your defense mechanisms. We don't want Natashiko Kinoichis to give us problems if some unlucky civilian gets killed in the forest. Hayama said before he turned to the genins of Team 7. My name is Shirakumo Hayama and I'm in charge of the sector. It is a tradition that the sector's captain wishes you good luck. So, good luck. He bluntly spoke with a stern mask on his face. Be sure to listen to your Jinin-sensei and pay attention to everything he says and instructs you here. Who knows, one day, you might become captains of your own sector. Ayama quickly finished and shook hands with each of the Genins, not wasting his time on pointless talk or anything else. Dismissed. Team 7, Cavacamp. Their camp was located at a small cave by the local river. A good place for fishing the meals if need be. Granted, Kakashi had them bring the imperative supplies, which included the reanimate food. Aside from that, they were given the necessary gear and traps to set along the border from Shmrichi base. For the first day, with Kakashi's explanation, they learned how to set the traps properly and where to actually place them, according to the instruction that Captain Hayama gave. Naruto restrained himself from using the shadow clones for this occasion. As per Kakashi's suggestion, his teammates needed the experience too, so countless supplies of blonde heads were out of the question this time. Aside from the regular patrols that they had, Kakashi also had them hunt for food. It was mostly fishing, though. At the end of the fourth day. Sakura and Sasuke were sleeping in the cave as the night fell and the sun settled. Kakashi and Naruto were outside, overlooking the border's forest quietly from the top of the cave's hill. Kakashi had a small flashlight stuck inside his mouth throughout his mask, directed towards the book he was reading with nothing better to do apparently. At the same time, Naruto was looking towards the forest in front of him. Animals were asleep, with owls and other night birds producing sounds of the night. It was peaceful and fulfilling. A perfect opportunity for meditation. Yet, he also felt a bit uneasy. It reminded him of the loneliness in his early childhood as he looked towards the moon. Most noticeable light in a sea of stars. Just like me in the village. He thought bitterly. You know. Kakashi began, breaking the comfortable silence between them. Your breeding is more fitting for the Achihas than the name you have. Did you know many Senjus before they died out to know what they were like, Sensei? Five or six, perhaps seven, Kakashi said to him absently. And none of them were broody, I can tell you that. Naruto smiled as he heard that, but did not comment further. Kakashi-sensei continued talking, however. What is on your mind, Naruto? Kakashi asked him, closing down his book and turning off the flashlight. For a moment, silence appeared before them once more. I'm just thinking about life, that's all. He did not speak further. An existential crisis perhaps. Probably, Naruto answered him. I'm mostly thinking about the mistakes I've made. The Kashi turned towards him, and though his mask covered most of his face, Naruto could still see sadness emanating from his one visible eye. You're too young to worry about that. Perhaps. But I still can't help but do it. Silence. Over the years, I dreamed many times about the incident at the playground. It lessened with time. But in a moment such as this I can't help but remember the day it happened. 
For a minute, Kakashisensei did not reply as he allowed him to linger on his thoughts. Naruto, you know the story of my father. Naruto looked at his sensei and gave him a slow nod. He heard the story about the white fang of the leaf from Kasuk. His surrogate uncle admired the former Haddock Patriarch more than anyone else. Contrary to most of the village after his failed mission. Sakumo had an altar of devotion within the Eternal Genin. When I was seven years old my father killed himself, Kakashi said after another moment of silence. I resented him for years after that and I aspired to be a total opposite of the things he stood for. I never showed it directly to him, though I suspect he knew while well he was alive. The pause. After he committed suicide, I embraced the opposite worldview from him. Where he valued comrades, I valued the rules and mission. Just to ensure something like that would never happen to me. Second pause. It was only when Abito disobeyed me during the mission that I led and went after Rin when she was captured. That was the first time in years that I felt the same way as my father probably did after his failed mission. Abito's words also struck a chord, I admit. Said Kakashi as he chuckled for a moment. Those who break the rules are scum, but those who abandon their comrades are worse than scum. Abito said that. Questioned Naruto. He did. Nodded Kakashi. Nobody blames you for that, and most of the villagers have already accepted that you weren't at fault, ignoring their initial shock. As Naruto looked at him with an unbelieving smile, Kakashi continued. Barring a few exceptions. I guess Ande Misama did well to quell most of the initial anger with the time. Said Kakashi. You have people around you who care about you. Including me. And none of us blames you for that. Before my father died, he didn't have anyone to support him. His closest friends shunned him. The third pause. I presented myself for many things. For Abito's death, for Rin's death. For not being able to help your father during the Kikbi's attack. For letting you live on your own early on. And for abandoning my father in his greatest hour of need. Kakashi said sorrowfully. Don't become like me, Naruto. Learn from my mistakes. Don't let yourself become a self-loathing and bitter man. It will hinder your growth both as a shinobi and as a man. You have beaten yourself long enough about the playground incident, Naruto. Don't waste your youth regretting over things you had no control of. It never ends well. And when it doesn't, it just creates more space for resentment until you decide to stop. But then, it might just be too late, for some things cannot be taken back. I understand, Sensei, Naruto admitted. And do not become something you are not. Do not become the opposite of what you are in order to please the system. His tone became a bit happier as he spoke the next words. Sometimes, I shudder at the thought you could become an Atenshan seeking loudmouth. Worry not, Sensei. I feel a shiver down my spine when I think about it as well. Smiled Naruto. The fourth pause. Your father was a great man, Sensei, Naruto said. I have no doubt that he would be proud of you. I hope so, but I will never be sure. Naruto nodded before he smiled again. Although I don't know if he would approve of your choice of literature. A written porn, Sensei. He told him in a mocking tone. Romance erotica, Naruto. Kakashi corrected with a pointy finger to signify its importance. I was hoping we would run into some Natashiko Kinoichis while we're on this mission. But for now nothing. He said with a low chuckle. Uncle Jiraiya told me once that his second book was inspired by observing their life in their village, Naruto said as he placed his hand on his chin in thought. Though, he was always a bit uneasy when he talked about them. Giving me a strange look as he did. Who knows, maybe he arranged a marriage for you, but was afraid to tell you about it. Kakashi suggested with a chuckle. Ha. Hey. It wouldn't be the first time for a senju man to marry an Adashiko Kinoichi. A notion that he had an arranged marriage was something he would have to ponder, given the reaction he had from Jiraiya whenever the talk about Natashiko came to be. Hopefully, Jiraiya didn't do something like that. Really? Questioned Kakashi. I thought the Kinoichis of their lines only give birth to girls. True. Nodded Naruto. But one head of the Senju clan did marry an Adashiko Kinoichi, and she gave birth to four sons for him. She did. The question surprised Kakashi. Granted, the personal clan history of the Senju clan was completely foreign to him. This was new information and he wouldn't miss it. Indeed. Smiled Naruto. She was the mother of Hashirama, Tabarama, Kawarama and Atama Senju. I never knew that. Admittedly, Kakashi was completely surprised. Well, you do now. Natashiko existed before other hidden villages and for that reason, it is not classified as one. They fought with Shinoberators from the Land of Wind and for that reason they allied with the Senju clan bound in marriage because my clan also had problems with them too. But only for that purpose. They didn't fight against the Ichiha clan alongside us. Is there any reason she only gave birth to boys? Kakashi asked. Two of whom are something akin to mythological gods in the shinobi world. There is. God and the reason is. Kakashi raised his visible eyebrow. Because our seed is strong, Naruto said, grinning from ear to ear. 
the Tori, a minor border town in the Land of Fire. While sitting in the small tavern of the minor border town of the Land of Fire, Rakesh Maui had never hated his decision to abandon his home village more than he did now. Granted, he had three years to reminisce about his past decisions, but he was never so cornered as he was now. Betraying his village because Hans the Salamander promised him a rank of Jinin and Omegakur if he spied on Kanoha for him. As proof of his loyalty, all he had to do was deliver him the information regarding the inner happenings of the village that was harder to get from the outside, occasionally. The status and identity of the Kanoha's Jinchkriki, the state of power after the Achiha massacre, etc. But in order to fully prove his loyalty, he had to steal the Nidame Hokage's Sword of the Thunder God, as well as the secret scroll of Kanoha's interrogation techniques. He easily fooled his former academy student, Marino Idate, into stealing the scroll and the sword from the Hokage's tower. Not to get himself caught in the process. Aoi didn't actually think that the young fool could steal the scroll and the sword so easily. If he had the chance, he would either kill the brat after Hiran to keep the secret. Or he actually would succeed, which was nothing but a miracle in Aoi's book. However, the Biki Marino was quick to chase after him and Idate all the way to the Omegakur after the latter delivered the objects to him. He was fortunate to get to the Rain Village in time for Hansen's forces to help him capture the Takibetsu Jinin of Konoha, though. Torturing didn't help even when Hans allowed him to do it himself. Another test of my loyalty. What a way to prove it if not by harming your previous comrades. Loyalty? Aoi questioned himself. If one betrayed his own village, his own home. What certainty was there that he wouldn't betray his new liege? Hans probably knew that as well. Surely, that's why he had him do all the trials to get there. But. Ibiki in the end had managed to escape just like his foolish younger brother moments before. And Aoi was left to face Hansm's wrath all by himself. Initially, he thought he was safe. The ruler of Omegakur was in conflict with the opposition forces from his own village. Another pawn would be welcome. Right. The pawn. He bashed Ibiki calling him a pawn of Kanoha. But at least Ibiki had a roof above his scarred head. Aoi had nothing. He clenched the wooden cup he was drinking from in rage before compassing himself. Sighing as he watched the pitiful expression of his face in the water of his cup. After Ibiki fled, leaving the scroll and the Nidame's sword, Aoi thought he would prove himself to the salamander. But the sword was a fake replica of the original. Its power is a temporary illusion. And the scroll was a bunch of gibberish that not even an analysis team of Konoha would be able to comprehend. Both of them were fake in order to lure out the potential traders. Ibiki probably chased after him in the first place, just to figure out where the break in the security happened and which village was the perpetrator. Naturally, when he found out Hansm was furious and didn't hesitate to throw him into prison for interrogation. He luckily managed to escape the prison before they could kill him or torture him. So now he was here. Again fleeing another country. This time it was the land of tea because those Natashiko sluts weren't keen on taking a Masingnan as a father material for their daughters. Aoi went there in the hope he could settle and live peacefully for the rest of his life. But Kinoichis of Natashiko had an agreement with Kanahagakur, apparently, like some sort of alliance. He didn't know much, as the information gathering for rogue ninjas was much harder than it seemed. They chased him down, but he managed to escape. Again. Why would anyone become a rogue ninja in the first place? Aoi thought angrily as he took another cup of water to clean his throat. Thinking of his idiocy that has brought him so low in the first place. Looking towards the brown wooden ceiling of the tavern, Aoi considered his options. He could go to the newly formed Atagakur. Perhaps they would accept him. He could try to sell them some bullshit about Kanoha's education and they would place him into their academy. It wouldn't be a bad life to live. He would live. That was important. At one point he dreamed of living peacefully in Kanoha. Teaching brats and then worshipping him for being a kind sensei. But all of that was impossible now. He was a traitor to his homeland. A deserter. With nothing at his side but his newly made battle umbrella and a cloak with a conical hat to conceal his identity from any hunternans out there. And some money here odd from some unfortunate soul out there on the road. Constantly suppressing his chakra was mandatory of course. If any even bothers to hunt me down, that is. It was both a hit of luck and a strike to his pride. But you lived with it. And you actually lived. As he stood up to leave, a new figure entered the tavern. Aoi saw a young boy with blonde hair and Kanoha's headband walking inside of the tavern he was currently in. The black cloth that held the headband flowing behind him as he walked. He recognized him immediately. It was Kanoha's Jinch Kriki. Namaka's Naruto. Quickly sitting down again, Aoi noticed one object on the boy's white belt. It was the same hilt of the replica of Nidame's sword. Did the Kikbi brat steal it? Doubt it. The brat was disciplined back in the academy. Silent and observing everything around him. And a good user. Aoi knew it firsthand as he was the one in charge of teaching to the academy students. That still didn't explain how he got Nidame's sword. It doesn't matter. He was still just a genin. Perfect. 
he would follow the brat outside and ambush him. Nidame's sword would be his. Aoi thought madly as a sense of euphoria overwhelmed him for the first time in years. Forest around the Tatori town, for how long does he plan on following me? Naruto thought as he walked back to his team through the forest outside of the town. He would need to deal with his acquaintance first anyway, but he wanted for Aoi Sensei to show himself on his own. Seeing as this was going nowhere, Naruto decided to act first. He turned around towards one of the trees and said, You can come out now, Aoi Sensei. Pick me brat, Aoi said venomously as he jumped down from the tree where he was hiding and followed him. You know it's forbidden to reveal that to me, don't you, Sensei? As if I care about some dumb law of Konoha. Aoi snarled, standing not far from him in what looked like a battle position. So why are you following me? Naruto said emotionlessly. Whatever I did, I must have done it against the village. A village you're no longer a part of. Are you seeking me for us to join forces together perhaps? The sword? That's the sword of the Nidame Hokage hanging around your belt. Isn't it? Aoi asked with a hungry look in his eyes, ignoring the rest of his question. Naruto smiled as he took the object and lit it up. Indeed it is. Do you like it? You can bet on that. Aoi smiled wickedly. Tell me this. How did you get that sword? Oh. Well, it belongs to me. So why wouldn't I have it? Naruto said acting innocently. The hell are you talking about, kid? How about you come and find out? And so he did, Aoi took out three canned eyes and threw it at Naruto who easily blocked it with the Nidame's sword. Is this it? Naruto questioned himself. But as he threw the kunai, Aoi jumped into the air letting his umbrella flow under him. Senban shower. Aoi said as the rain was sent flying towards Naruto from the Flutinjinthier umbrella. Wind style. Swift wind wall. Naruto went through the hand signs and exclaimed as the wind barrier appeared around him, nullifying Aoi's attack. Only that, sensei. Naruto taunted. I expected more from you. Snarling at the provocation, Aoi charged towards Naruto with his umbrella, attempting to attack him with a clean hit. You might think you're tough, but you're still just a pawn of Konoha's higher-ups, wanting to use you as a weapon, Aoi said, hoping to create distraction and confusion within Naruto, but all he got was a smile and a good defense to his assault. Perhaps. But at least I have a roof above my head unlike you. Said the smiling Naruto. Is that why you betrayed the village, sensei? Because you didn't want to be a pawn. For some odd reason, the question made Aoi widen his eyes, giving Naruto the opportunity to easily knock him down. Dandling the chakra into the sword, he sent the river of lighting towards his old sensei, knocking him unconscious. 7. At the same time, Kakashi appeared beside him, looking at the unconscious Aoi, just like Naruto did. Strange to see him in these parts. Didn't he defecate to a Megakur? Naruto asked. He did, although we didn't hear anything about him after his defection. It wasn't difficult to beat him at all. I thought he would be a tougher opponent given the fact he was an instructor at the academy back home. Naruto paused, thinking. Most likely it was because he suppressed his chakra for so long and it would take time to regenerate. His greed got him defeated. Naruto concluded. How did you run into him in the first place? Kakashi asked. I sensed a familiar trace of chakra in this town and only went to check out if it really was my old academy instructor. But as I wasn't sure at first, I took out the sword of the thunder god, just to be sure. When I saw the shade of his green hair, my theory was confirmed. It's a good thing the old man told me about his treason previously. Indeed. Place one chakra suppressing seal on him, just in case. I want to check something. Kakashi said and Naruto did as he was told. Kakashi placed his hand on Aoi's head, surfing through his memories as Naruto watched in silence. After 10 minutes or so, Kakashi removed his hand from Aoi's head saying with a hint of enjoyment in his voice. It seems that your comment gave him a feeling of deja vu. An old episode from his interrogation of Ibiki. Naruto slowly nodded. What are we going to do with him, sensei? Take him back to Konoha. Nope. We'll destroy his body here. I already searched his memories and got the information I needed. I'll just report to the Hakajusama when we return to the village. He didn't have anything valuable in there anyway. What was that jutsu you used on him? It seemed similar to the techniques of the Yamanaka clan. Not quite. It is actually a psycho mind transmission jutsu used by our interrogation unit, a bit different from the one Yamanaka's use, but has the same background. Yamanaka and Moichi developed it to expand our analysis unit. Will you teach it to me? Naruto asked hopefully. It would be useful for him, just like Kakashi uses it now. Maybe at a later date, Kakashi said smiling, but then turned serious. We need to take care of him first. How do you know that jutsu anyway, sensei? Naruto asked. I copied it from Aoba by accident, Kakashi said sheepishly. Just don't tell him that. I won't if you teach me how to use it. Smirked Naruto. Team Seven's camp, where have you two been all this time? Sakura asked as they returned to their cavacamp. Naruto went to check something suspicious in the local town, Kakashi answered. He can tell you more, later. 
any strange activity here? No. Everything is peaceful and traps are all in place, Sensei. Good. But we'll need to stay alert anyway for the time being. If Aoi managed to slip inside the country, there is no telling how many Masingans, those better than him are currently in. And they are much better at suppressing their chakra without backlashes, unlike Aoi. Kakashi then went on to check other parts of the border and defense mechanisms that were placed alongside it. Huh? What was that all about? I'll tell you later. Where is Sasuke? Near the river. We went to fish for dinner. Naruto grunted at her answer. I'll go and help him, prepare some salad to go along with it. As the night fell once more, Naruto and Kakashi took the night watch sitting at the top of the cave as they did for the many past nights, talking about various things as always. Sensei, do you think Sasuke has a chance to kill Itachi one day? Naruto asked. I don't know. Admitted Kakashi. Itachi was a genius within his own clan. Many branded him even greater than Madara himself. The pause. It is up to us to help him if they ever meet, Kakashi said. Hakajusama told me about the Akatsuki and that they might come for you. If there are more of us, we might have a chance to beat whoever comes after you. I hope. Naruto nodded. I fear that Sasuke will lose it once he sees Itachi. He'll need to be emotionally prepared if he ever wants to face him. I know. That is one of the many reasons he was placed under me. Speaking of the team. What do you think of their development? Sasuke's and Sakura's. Naruto asked. Well, Kakashi said as he stood up as he stretched his muscles. Sasuke is given the training he needs and wants. I'm wary of teaching him too much. It's best if it doesn't go over his head and give him too much unnecessary confidence. I noticed. Do you think that's wise, though? He might think that you're holding him back. He can, but that's why I'm placing an accent on teamwork. That is the place where Sasuke needs most to work on. Hmm. Grunted Naruto. What about Sakura? At that, Kakashi looked at him with one of his eye smiles. I have to thank you there. Me? Naruto raised his right eyebrow. He did give a few pointers to Sakura here and there, along with a few motivational moments. But that was it. Unless it was enough. You are rather mysterious to Sakura, just like Sasuke is. But while he ignores her most of the time, you help her whenever I'm not there. You've become her inspiration to become stronger. Right. As long as she becomes stronger, I'm glad. It was also a nice feeling when someone looked up to him. She will. Jinjutsu is her stronger side, but I can see her having a lot of potential in medical ninjutsu. As well as to jutsu. When she's finished with her initial training I'll sign her up in the hospital for tutoring. Smart move, Naruto said. How long are we to remain here? It is nearly the end of two weeks since we came. I contacted Captain Hayama. He replied that the second team will come to replace us in two days. So until then, we are to remain here. On Hagakur no Sado, Hokage's office, and they did. A day later a new genin team arrived and replaced them with their duty. So now, Team 7 was in front of the Sandame Hokage, reporting on their first crank mission. With Aoi's appearance, it is automatically classified as a prank. Due to that, Hiruzen would need to deposit more money to the three genins and their sensei. But he was proud of how they handled their first mission entirely. As Team 7 encountered a Missingnan on this mission. Your first crank is upgraded to the prank. Congratulations on the first hiring mission, Team 7. The money will be deposited to your accounts tomorrow. Saratobi said, smiling. Thank you Hikajusama. Team 7 replied. Go on then. You have the following week free from the missions. Kakashi, you stay. I have something I must speak with you. Sakura was the first one to talk after they exited the Hokage's tower. What will you two do with all this money? She spoke excitedly. 50,000 rim was a good amount each of them got for this mission. 8. I'll save it for later use. Don't need anything expensive right now. Sasuke shrugged his shoulders. Same as Naruto. He was happy with how this mission went. Money didn't interest him because he had plenty of it anyway. Are you three free right now? Their sensei, Kakashi, spoke behind them as he walked down the stairs. After getting a positive response from his students, he made a proposition. How about we go and celebrate your first prank? My treat. On Hagakur no Sado, Senju clan's main residence, Yon, Naruto had to suppress one as he had risen up from his bed early in the morning. Looking at his clock to his front, he saw it was 6 a.m. An hour to get ready, eat and go and meet his team. It was his usual morning ever since he became a genin officially. No point in beating yourself. Life of a shinobi wasn't as bad as many would think. Uncertainty of what tomorrow would bring was always there, yes. Yet at the same time satisfaction of being the protector would fade that away. For as a shinobi of Konoha, he was the protector of his people, village and the entire country. After having breakfast and getting ready for his day, Naruto went outside. As he left his home, he allowed the morning breeze of spring to invade his face, causing his hair to move wildly as it did. Cherry blossoms have already flowered, and it gave a pleasant hue from his ingawa. 
he used the body flicker jutsu to arrive faster to his team's designated meeting spot. Anaka bridge that was above the river of the same name. He found Sasuke there who usually came first, followed by him, then Sakura and the last being Kakashisensei. Morning. Naruto said as he arrived next to Sasuke who was leaning on the fence of the bridge. Morning. Sasuke nodded to him before he continued looking at nothing in particular as he always did. About 10 minutes or so Sakura arrived, wearing her usual happy smile on her face that she always had. Good morning, guys. Naruto responded in kind, while Sasuke gave his usual trademark grunt HN that he directed to Sakura for most of the time. Some things never change it seems. His team was a rather odd one in terms of personalities they individually had they couldn't be different from each other if one had tried to place them together as a cell. Sasuke was the silent one, the one who preferred the darkness over the light if his usual mood was any indication. Sakura on the other hand always tended to be cheerful and smiling most of the time. It could be her defense mechanism when around her rather eccentric in their own way teammates. The other Sasuke was a darkness, Sakura was a brightness who always sought to overcome Sasuke's darkness. Just like the light banishes the dark. Fitting. Naruto thought as he could see from Sakura pestering Sasuke for dates many times, ever since the academy, up to the time as a team. Tough, recently, date requests have largely diminished. Uncontrolled hormones or lack of chakra control can be rather destructive for one's development as a person if the person was a shinobi or shinobi in training. Especially during childhood or when the said person is growing up and going through puberty later on. Sakura has been given a reality check with her time with the rest of Team 7. Sasuke is ignoring her for the most part. Except when she actually is serious with her training. With Sasuke ignoring her and Ino not being there as a healthy competition, it gave the space for her to grow. Do you guys think we're having another crank today? Sakura asked. It has been a week since the last one. Their last mission consisted of protecting a merchant and his family on their way back to the capital of the Land of Fire. Probably. Naruto said. I think Kakashisensei intends for us to do one crank mission per week. Today we'll probably do another. All in all, Team 7 has completed two crank missions and one rank that was initially a crank since their formation, in addition to 56 ranks in total. Sasuke on the other hand didn't care much. He would go to the cranks as it was required, but would welcome some sort of challenge. Any challenge. Naruto defeated their old instructor. He wanted to face someone like that as well. To test himself. But, at least these missions went to his official file. The first day, after his team's first two drinks, they had to write a report on how those missions went and the next day to present them to the department from where they took them in the first place. Sasuke liked the fact that their missions for now went flawlessly. He was also allowed to have a copy of his reports, because apparently, clans could keep them as a memento of their career for future generations of the same clan to see. Soon after that Kakashi told him that he could get the mission reports that belonged to his deceased clansmen as well. Because becoming an official ninja placed him as an adult for many purposes. Carrying on the legacy of his clan was one of them. For the first week since he got them, Sasuke had spent most of his free time reading those reports. He was both glad and happy to see the accomplishments of his family throughout many generations. Kakashi also told him that higher inked reports he could pick up only after he became a Jinin. But even those would be simple confirmations on a job well done. Plenty of the higher inked mission reports were held as a secret by the village, according to what Kakashi said to him. His mood soured when he remembered reading Itachi's files. His cursed elder brother also did dranks, but many cranks as well. Sasuke never finished reading Itachi's reports because of the hate that poured into his body at those moments. Memories of the time when Itachi was a kind elder brother who took him for one of his wild animals dealing missions flashed through his mind that he subconsciously started gripping his shorts in frustration. Something which didn't go unnoticed by his teammates. Sasukakin. Sakura said worriedly. Sasuke snapped suddenly. What? Dudat Sakura was visibly shocked. But instead of answering for herself it was Naruto who did in his authoritative manner. Sasuke. Sasuke glared at him for a mere second before calming down and apologizing. I'm sorry. I had a bad night. That's all. Before dipping down his head and shadowing his eyes with his hair. Yet Naruto didn't bulge. Sasuke, if you need to talk about anything, both me and Sakura are here to listen. Naruto nodded toward Sakura who nodded back. Right. We're your teammates, Sasuke-kun. You can talk anything to us. Sakura said with a small smile, albeit a bit shakenly. Despite his sour mood, Sasuke allowed a small grateful smile to grace his face. Thank you. But it's just some bad memories. It's not something I want to talk about. He said, albeit he cursed himself inwardly right after, for allowing such a small trace of weakness to leak from him. Naruto's hard glare softened in understanding. I see. But, just as Sakura has said. No we're here for you to talk with if you need anything. 
Sasuke simply nodded before returning to normal mood, staring at nothing but air in front of him as various celebrations went on in his brain. Pushing the memories of his wretched older brother aside, he tried to find some inner peace by meditating as he saw Naruto do many times. Naruto for his part looked at him with a raised eyebrow before smirking and going back to his conversation with Sakura, who relented after looking at Sasuke worriedly for a moment. Their conversation went on, but not with much enthusiasm as before. Sasuke continued meditating. Think about something else. Naruto was also allowed to keep the mission records as Sasuke saw him once picking the reports. Which was strange in many ways. Naruto was not from any clan. Or so Sasuke had thought. He tried researching in the library about the possibility of the existence of the Namika's clan, but found nothing. In the end he left the matter to rest, at least for now. I think Sakura went to say something in her conversation with Naruto, but Kakashi appeared in a puff of smoke right as she did. Your law. Sakura was about to shout, but then realized something. Wait, you're here on time. I was late only a few times, Sakura. Kakashi replied with a sheepish eye smile. Anyhow. He began but then noticed a rather tense atmosphere around the bridge. He looked towards Naruto for an answer, but the boy just flashed both of his eyebrows upwards and placed his mouth in a thin line, signaling he would tell him later. Akashi nodded. Right then. I wanted to tell you that we will take a new crank mission today. A week has passed since the last one, and I think another one would be good for you. His students nodded. Let's go then. The land of sound, Orochimaru's hideout, Orochimaru-sama. A young silver-haired man with glasses, Yakushi Kabuto, said as he entered one of the operating rooms within his master's hideout. The Butikin, you have returned. Arachimaru said as he shot a glance towards the doors from the corner of his eyes. I did, and I brought the reports you have requested, arachimaru sama The snake Sanin was silent, continuing with the operation he was engulfed in, all the while his right-hand man stood silently behind him. Did you accomplish anything else while you were in Kanoha? Arachimaru asked, while taking a small vial of blood into his hand, examining it closely. I did. Kabuto replied as he adjusted his glasses. I recruited a newly promoted Takibetsu Jinin, Sabiru, to our cause. He will begin his mission once he is firmly established within the tactical division under Narashikaku. One, good. Arachimaru exclaimed, pleased with this development. He placed a vial into a rack and went to wipe his hands from blood, proceeding to sit in a chair after that. Bring me those files. Here you go sir. Arachimaru took the envelope and opened it, seeing dozens of papers that compassed various information and reports that Kabuto had gathered while in Kanoha. See that Sabiru doesn't make it too obvious with the way he works for us. I will. He is rather intelligent and feels that Kanoha is holding him back from utilizing his full potential. Kabuto said, smirking. Kukuku. Sarita Bisensei was always an idealist for a foolish cause. Believing everyone will follow his way just because he said so. Well, it should give us an opening for the invasion, but... Kabuto said, turning serious once again. But what, Kabuto? Arachimaru asked, not lifting his head from the paper he read. Sande Misama has increased the defenses of the entire land of fire, reinstating many retired shinobis for duty, albeit within the village only. It left him with many younger and more versatile ninjas for border and road patrols throughout the country. So, Sarita Bisensei has grown a backbone in his old age. The snake Sanin commented. Sabiru doesn't know about our invasion plans, right Kabutokan? He doesn't. Kabuto replied, tilting his glasses again, as he proceeded to answer further. I only told him to try and weaken the defenses on the northern borders, from Omegakur to Yugakur. That way, even if by any chance Kanoha's higher-ups discover him, it will not endanger our plans for the invasion. Kanahagakur is allied with Sunagakur after all. Their borders towards the land of rivers should be more relaxed in theory. In practice. Sunanan should be able to take care of that. Even the border guards won't stop an entire invasion. Kabuto finished with a proud smirk. Good. Arachimaru started with a wicked grin. The rest of the reports were mostly unimportant. Nothing major happened other than his old sensei had reinforced the number of shinobis guarding the walls around the village. But even that will not be enough to save the pathetic organization that is called Kanoha once he attacks them with the help of Suna and their weapon. Oh my. Arachimaru exclaimed as he licked his lips with his snake-like tongue. How could I forget about this boy? Which boy, Arachimaru-sama? Kabuto asked. This one. Arachimaru answered as he showed Kabuto a page from one of Sasuke's teammates. Namek is Naruto. Kabuto read. He is one of Sasukakin's teammates, said to be one of the most promising shinobis of the new generations. Indeed. Arachimaru continued smiling. You are a medic, Kabutokan. To whom does the Narutokan remind you of? He does look like the Yandame Hikajusama, Senju Minato. Kabuto stated, looking at the picture, but then the realization came to him and an evil smile formed on his face. I see. So the Yandame Hikajusama sealed the kickbi into his own son. 
perhaps we could use this to gain support from a Wagaker. Lunoki of both scales is known to hate the yellow flash, with passion. He could be a valuable ally. He could. But that old fossil hates me as well. He is more than likely to kill me the moment he gets a chance. Arachimaru sneered at the end. Still. Perhaps we can use this to our advantage before the invasion. How so? We will reveal this information to the other villages. Iwa is likely to reinstate hostilities if Lenoki is provoked or in a bad mood when he receives this information. But will the Tsuchikajusama actually believe this information if you deliver him so easily? He will either scoff it off as a provocation or will take measures against the boy. The rakage is unpredictable on the other hand. But it does not matter. Lenoki could divert Saritabisensei's attention towards the borders of Aim, Kusa and Taki. The attacks on the Land of Fire always came from those directions. Silence. We will simply deliver them copies of this document, along with the information that Narutakan is a Jinch Kriki of the Kikbi. Iwa and Kumo will act in the way they want, but in any case it can be beneficial to us. Indeed. Kabuto said. Sasukakan should be an easy target for you. He is described as a flight risk in Kanoha's files. From what I could gather he can be persuaded to join you if we promise him an easy way to kill his elder brother. But there is a possibility that Sasukakan gets killed as well in the process. If the Tsuchikij decided to act more aggressively towards the Son of the Yellow Flash, it could kill Sasuke in the process, too. There is. However. But Sarita Bisensei will not allow Minamatakan's son to die so easily. As I said, if we are lucky, this will just diverge Sensei's attention to other fields. Lenoki will only send minor battalions to the border near the Kusa and Taki. Proud he that he is, he is not a fool to risk an all-out war. That notion is unpopular in Iowa ever since their defeat in the last war. Silence, Itachi is too strong for me, and only another Sharingan can defeat him. It would be prudent for me to train Sasukakan fully and use him to get rid of Itachi and any other Akatsuki member, if the chance is presented in the process, before I take his body. Silence again. You should return to your team, Kabutakan. Lay low while you're in Kanoha, for the time being, at least. Keep an eye on Sabiru, if he is discovered get rid of him. I will take care of the information you have provided me with. The Sanin ordered. I understand, Arachimarasama. Kabuto bowed and left the room. Kukuku. Minatakin. I wonder how your son will fare with this development. Arachimaru chuckled as he considered his options and plans for the future. Even if Minato's son was gifted as a prodigy, as Kabuto's report suggested, not even he will stand in the way of his ambition. Yet at the same time, Arachimaru cursed his lack of luck regarding the last male Senju. The boy was young and from this report he already had a bad experience with the villagers in the past, killing three bullies in self-defense. Arachimaru couldn't help but allow another wicked grin to show on his face. If only he wasn't a Jinch Kriki, Arachimaru would try and woo him to his side as well. Last available Ichiha and the last available Senju. Possibilities would be endless. But as luck wasn't on his side here, he would just have to be content with Ichiha Sasuke. Hukuku. This will be interesting. Arachimaru said to himself as he continued reading the rest of the report. Anahagakur no Sado, Hokage's Tower, bring Tazunasen in. The Sandame Hokage, Saratobi Hirazan ordered and one of his assistants went to the other room to call forth a client after explaining the team's seven aspects of this mission and gaining a positive response from them. Usually this mission would be directed to the regular protection missions department, but as the client was a foreigner, Saratobi had to be the one to give this mission to a particular team that he deemed worthy. The reputation of the village to the outside was important after all. And to his luck, the most promising genin team of this generation was available today. Hiruzen was happy with the way Kakashi handled his team. He gave him enough time to deal with his past, it was time to look for the future. Team 7, which stood calmly in front of him, certainly had a bright future in front of them. And Hiruzen didn't fight the smile that crept on his face as he did. May we know what is so amusing, Hikajusama? Naruto asked, himself smiling. He hadn't talked to the old man for two weeks. He would need to invite him for another hunting picnic, along with Kasuke and Jiraiya, once he comes to the village again. I'm just thinking about how well your team progresses and the bright future you have in front of you. Saratobi said, which caused the rest of the team to smile as well from the Hokage's compliment. An elderly tall man, but in good shape entered the room, with a bottle of wine in his hand. Obviously a bit drunk, if his following comment gave any evidence for such an accusation. I asked for a real ninja, Hikajusama. You don't expect me to believe these brats are one, do you? The old man commented. I assure you, Tazunasan, these are full-fledged shinobi of our village. If anything bad happens and it won't have a Kakashi here will take care of it. And he is one of the best shinobis we have. I see. Tazuna muttered, a bit disgruntled and not being content with this arrangement. Naruto. Sasuke. Sakura. Go home and prepare the standard gear as well as the spare clothes. Food for the trip and the money to buy anything we need along the way. 
Kakashi said and his genins nodded, going on their way to prepare. Azunasan. Kakashi said as he approached the old man after his students left. How long do you think you will need to complete your bridge? I think it'll take two weeks at most, maybe three. Tazuna answered. It is to protect me from bandits and the like. The old man mumbled those words, and Kakashi suspected there was more to this mission than a simple protection from bandits. In any case, he nodded, promising himself to find out what this was about. They already accepted this mission, and the bridge builder paid his money. They couldn't back down now. Yet his senses warned him that something was wrong. At the front gates. I never asked you, but what is that, Naruto? Sakura asked when she saw a strange object on his belt, pointing at it. They met at the gate an hour later after Kakashi dismissed them. This. Naruto looked down. She pointed at Nidame's sword. It's just a religious relic, for luck. He never showed the sword of the Thunder God to the two of them. He should do it one of these days. For all his initial reservations. He thought he could trust Sasuke and Sakura. The latter has a really good relationship with him. Something he never thought would have happened. I never took you for a superstitious type. Sasu commented from the side. It doesn't hurt to be. In our profession at least. Naruto shrugged it off. H.N. Sasu could accept that reasoning. Then minutes later, Kakashisensei appeared with Tazuna by his side. Okay then. Let's go. They walked quietly for a few hours, distancing Themsel from the village as they walked to the east. But even with that, they had to make a pause after some time because Tazuna, even though he was a physical worker for his entire life, couldn't keep up with them. The night started falling as well, so they decided to make a camp for the night. As they sat near the fire, eating the food they prepared for the trip, Sakura decided to start a conversation in order to kill the silence that stretched for some time. Azunasan. What is the land of wave like? We haven't been taught much about it back in the academy, as you don't have a shinobi village. Azuna's already somewhat sour mood fell even more. We did have, many years ago. You did? Sakura questioned. We did. Back when the Land of Waves was part of the Land of Whirlpools. Yuzushi Agakur no Sado. He said gravely. Oh. Sakura exclaimed with a sad look. She of course knew about the homeland of the deceased Yuzumaki clan. Just like everyone else did in Konoha. Sasuke just sat there silently, listening. Akashi on the other hand, had a bitter expression on his face, while Naruto stared blankly at the fire that cracked in front of him. What is now known as the Land of Waves was previously part of the Land of Whirlpools. We were in the southernmost part of the country. A few minor islands that usually lived from fishing and trade with the main archipelago of the country. Tazuna began telling the tale. We have never had much interaction with Shinobus in general. Most of the villages avoided us for our rather worthless position. But we've had a village to rely on in times of need. Silence, except for the sounds of campfire. After the village was destroyed during the last war, we remained part of the land of whirlpools, but the sudden tsunami destroyed the capital of the country, killing the daimum and destroying the central government, along with the remaining population of those islands. He said gravely. But why wasn't the capital destroyed at the same time as the village was? Sakura asked, curious. The Kashi answered her this time. The subject was part of the general international conduct of the hidden villages and their home countries. It is because there is an unwritten rule between the nations and villages, Sakura. We cannot stop the war itself, but we can prevent our capitals from getting damaged during our fights. Why is that? If some hidden village attacks the capital of another country destroying it in the process, killing the daemon, there is nothing that stops the hidden village of a country that lost its capital to attack the capital of the aggressor's country. Daemons for that reason do not support the attacks on the other capitals and forbid their cages from sanctioning those operations. Because of that, the capitals are relatively safe from our wars. That didn't mean that feudal lords are safe from the assassination attempt, though, for that very reason they opted to have the shinobi bodyguards. Every Hokage has supplanted their daemon with certain shinobis. We don't have our own daemon. Our country mostly consists of fishermen and a few remaining minor lords from the previous government that survived, but their power is meaningless. As their wealth was lost in that tsunami. Tazuna said with a haunted look. Akashi was about to ask Azuna a question that bugged him ever since they got this mission, but Naruto's voice stopped him. Sensei. Two identical chakra signatures are watching us at the moment. Naruto said slowly. Sasuke and Sakura stiffened for a second, and Tazna blanched. Erection and stats. Kakashi whispered as he sat next to Naruto round the campfire. As a team sensor, Naruto's ability was very valuable for this type of situation. A standard conduct on how to respond to these types of ambushes was necessary. 3 o'clock. I'd say they are chknins at best with their chakra levels. Very similar chakra by the way. They are brothers most likely. The Kashi nodded. Formation C3. A formation that was used in surprise counterattack during the missions with protection detail, if there was an ambush prepared on an assigned team and the client. 
Sakura and Sasuke nodded, placing their hands onto their pouches for weapons, slowly. All the while Tazuna was quiet but shaken in his seat. Two enemy shinobi were far from them to hear everything. And judging by their lack of response or movements, they wouldn't be hard to defeat. Naruto and Kakashi disappeared suddenly from their seats near the fire. What? One of the shadowing ninjas exclaimed. Hokus, Maizu. Now's our chance. One of them said. And so they attacked, sending their chains towards Tazuna. Sakura. Protect the client. Sasuke shouted, proceeding to deflect the chains with his kunai as Sakura jumped towards Tazuna, pushing him out of the attack's reach. The chains were sent towards the nearby trees, as Sasuke in the meantime sent a few shurikens, pinning the chains on the said tree, making them useless. Ambrat. One of the enemy ninjas said, as he took out his kunai and went to deal with Sasuke, while the other did the same, but turned towards the Tazuna and Sakura who was in front of him, with her own kunai in hand, defensive position, although a bit shaken. But before either of them could do anything, Naruto and Kakashi appeared behind them, with Naruto kicking Maizu to his back with a knee strike and Kakashi knocking Gumzu out with a chop on the neck. Good work, Sasuke, Sakura. That was a good reaction to this type of situation. Well done. He complimented them both who smiled at the praise. Kakashi turned to his last student who just knocked Maizu out. Naruto. Make the two chakra suppressing seals, I would like to question them first. Understood, Sensei. Sasuke, Sakura, help me tie them up. As Naruto made two chakra suppressing seals, Kakashi placed them on the necks of the two Tita brothers. The next thing he did was placing his hand on one of their heads. The information gathering. 3. We need some explanations, Tazunasan. Kakashi said, looking seriously at the bridge builder after five minutes of surfing through the demon brother's memories. As Tazuna explained his reasoning for lying about the mission parameters, Kakashi couldn't help but feel sympathetic to the old man. The same thing was with his students. However, there are rules of general conduct for these situations. And that the mission should be aborted if the client lied about the dangers of the task in order to save up his money. However, Azuna did not do it for his personal or selfish reasons. Saving his country could hardly count as one. Still. Azunasan. This mission is out of the normal parameters designated for my team, which consists of the three genins that I would need to look after as well, in addition to having to fight a dangerous Masingan. Kakashi said in the end. Those two, he pointed towards the two unconscious shinobi. Are working for Mamachi Zabuza, the demon of the hidden mist, who has another minion, stronger than them under his command. I see. Tazuna said sadly, his voice wavering with emotions of an already broken man. He looked close to crying. I understand. You've done enough, even if I lied to you previously. Tazuna removed his glasses and wiped his teary strained eyes. Bakashi turned to his students to see their reactions, and all three of them graced him with a look of understanding. But the most surprising thing that happened was the statement that came from Sasuke. We should continue. Bakashi had to blink with his only visible eye a few times. Naruto and Sakura were no less surprised. Sasuke was as introverted as it could get. A notion that he wanted to help others in need was a welcome guest in any case. Having his own clan butchered must have left a deeper scar on Sasuke's persona than everyone had thought. I agree with Sasuke, we should continue. Naruto agreed. Me too. People of the wave need our help. Sakura said. Bakashi looked at the three of them for an entire minute, and then he sighted before a small eye smile appeared on the revealed part of his face. Fine. It would be bad if I chickened out now, wouldn't it? The student smiled in return, while Tazuna allowed his tears to fall freely, uttering continuous thank you to the Team 7. We'll need to call for backup from Kanoha and check if the Hakaja-sama will sanction this, first. We might not be able to deal with Zabuza and his aid by yourself, if the worst comes to the worst. From now on, this is an a rank mission. The three genins nodded. Thank you so much. You have no idea how much this means to my people. Tazuna said gratefully. After which he went into the forest to relieve himself. I need a private moment. If you'll excuse me. He finished with an easy chuckle. How will we contact the village, Sensei? Sakura asked. With one of my summons. Kakashi replied. Although it will take him some time to go there and for a team to be sent to us. Sensei, my summons can get there faster. Naruto suggested, getting puzzled looks from his teammates, prompting him to elaborate further. Toads have direct access to Kanoha compared to the other summons from what I know. We'll finish this faster. Very well, Naruto. You'll do that. I just need to write a message to the Hikajusama. In the meantime, seal those two so we could send them as well. Kakashi said, pointing to the demon brothers once again. We can negotiate their bounty with Karigakur after the mission. HMPF. Naruto grunted, proceeding to finish his task. Sealing living bodies into a scroll could be dangerous, and the maximum time of which they could be held in one was three hours at most. After which they would need to be unsealed and sealed again in a new, unused scroll. 
not to mention that they needed to be knocked out for it to work and that they would need to have a constant and even chakra input that they would gain from the chakra that was stored in a scroll. Both to survive and to remain in the scroll itself. Otherwise, they could easily escape it after three hours. About five minutes later Kakashi finished writing his letter and called forth Naruto again. Okay, it's finished. I wrote to the Hikaji-sama about this issue. Let's just hope he doesn't cancel it and recall us back. Naruto. He gave the scroll to Naruto to do his part. Summoning Jutsu. Gamakichi. Naruto exclaimed as he slammed his palm onto the ground after doing the necessary hand seals and chakra molding. Yo. Gamakichi waved his small hand. It has been some time, Naruto. It has. Here's your candy for not calling you more often. Naruto replied as he took a small sweet from his pouch and threw it to his personal summon. Thanks bro. So what do you need? The toad asked as he swallowed the small candy. I need you to deliver these scrolls to the Sandame Hokage and to return to me with his reply. You got it bro. Gamakichi said, taking both of the scrolls with his tongue, disappearing in a puff of some ride after. How do you have toad summoning contract, Naruto? Sakura peeked from the side. Sasuke was also curious, but he didn't voice it. Naruto glanced at them from the side, deciding that he should tell them the truth, partly at least. Jiraiya of the Sanin is my godfather. He allowed me to sign the contract and be the next Toad Summoner after him. After Yandane, too. Went unsaid. Jiraiya of the Sanin is your godfather? Sakura asked, shocked at hearing this. Why didn't you tell anyone? I never knew this. Kakashi sensei She asked one thing after another. Bakashi went to say something, but Naruto responded first. Yes, he is. I would appreciate it if this information is to remain a secret, at least for now. Do you understand that, Sakura? Sakura was still in a state of shock, but not it in any case. Still, her mind processed this news. She knew that for some reason many adults disliked Naruto and that he had to kill three older bullies in self-defense when he was younger, but he never said anything more about that incident. The notion that one of Konoha's greatest shinobi is actually Naruto's godfather revamped her previous view of her blonde teammate. Being the smart girl she was, Sakura started thinking about the famed Sanin. Aside from being a strong shinobi in his own right, Jirei also taught the Yandame Hokage, Senju Minato, who looked awfully much like her teammate. Dot. Sakura blinked, trying to make sure her mind was not playing with her. Her inner persona was more vocal and had woken her up. Holy fuck. Naruto is Yandame Sama's son. Cha. Luckily, her outer persona was more compassed, but still exclaimed her shocking discovery. Or at least she tried. Naruto, you are the yo. Bakashi was quick to intercept her, placing his hand on her shoulder, shaking her quickly. Whatever conclusion you've come up with, Sakura keep it to yourself. Understand. Sakura nodded, but still, she threw a worried look towards Naruto, who was smirking at her realization. Sasuke looked at him with narrowed eyes, seemingly he came to the same conclusion as Sakura did. Kakashi had advice for him as well. Same goes for you too, Sasuke. Anything you came up with keep it to yourself. There was no fear that Sasuke would blabber out any of it, however. Do you think Kakajusama will allow us to continue this mission? Sakura asked her team. Most likely. Kakashi said right away. Considering the country in trouble, this makes it personal for Konoha. Yuzushi Agakur was our ally after all. One that we failed to save. The least we could do is help the remnant of that country break free from the shackles of a tyrant. Theme 7 nodded sitting near the fire once again. Sensei, you mentioned that Zabuza has another minion. Who is it? Naruto asked. His name is Haku, and he is the last member of the Yuki clan from the Karigakur. Kakashi said. He also possesses the ice release bloodline limit that was common in that clan. To say his students were surprised was an understatement. Sasuke particularly. What would happen to that clan if he was the last member? Kakashi looked at him and answered. It has been crippled in the last war and various inner conflicts within the Kiri itself. The boy was apparently found by Zabuza, who trained him both in the shinobi arts and devotion. The brothers didn't know all the details, but were witness to the boy's abilities. Particularly something called the demonic mirroring ice crystals. He continued explaining the techniques used to his team in hopes that they would need to fight Haku, could at least have a chance of winning. Zabuza himself had troubles with that jutsu. Maybe he was getting too paranoiac. He knew that Naruto had a large arsenal of techniques in addition to his own practical abilities to use them in combat. They could beat him for sure. Especially the collaboration combo of Naruto and Sasu could prove itself damaging to their opponent, but he would hopefully get reinforcements, Anbu if he was lucky enough. Zabuza was also a former Anbu of Karigakur and a member of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. Title wasn't given on a whim to just anyone. Naruto, Sasu, and Sakura would protect Azuna in case Gaten called more Masingans to help Zabuza. Any shinobi Hakajasama sends will be a welcome present. But Kakashi still hoped it would be some of his old Anbu colleagues.
Right at that moment, Naruto's personal summon appeared with a scroll in his hand. Hey bro. Your Hokage has told me to give you this. Thanks Gamakichi. You can go now. Naruto said as he took the scroll and gave it to Kakashi who proceeded to read the message. Not a problem. Call me whenever you need help. The toad waved goodbye and went back to Mount Momboku. What does it say? Sakura asked. We're in luck. Kakashi said, getting happy smiles from his team. Hakajusama allowed us to continue. And a team from Anbu will be on their way here soon. We'll wait for them here. It will be good to see Tens and my team again. Kakashi thought as the Hakajusama informed him that Team Ro will be the backup for this mission. Better safe than sorry. Zabuza was infamous, even in Konoha for killing his old classmate Toriichi Kumade, a few years back. Kinjutsu was his strong side, as well as his combination of Kurigakur Jutsu and Silent Killing. When the Anbu team arrives, they would need to form a strategy. Just then Tazuna emerged from the bushes. Oh man, I really needed to relieve myself. There's a stream back there, he pointed behind his back to the forest. And there's no better feeling than to shoot some rain under the moon, I'll tell you that. The old man laughed at his own comment, proceeding to sit near the fire with Team 7, placing his manhood with his hand into the right position as he did. Something which made Sakura give him a disgusted look, which he apparently didn't notice. Oh man, I must admit, watching the shinobi battle in front of you is something else. Gets you really excited. Was the next comment from the laughing Tazuna. Excited. Sakura raised her eyebrow, before another realization for that evening hit her. Who the hell gets excited watching people nearly get killed? Cha. Sakura continued making faces of disgust, ignoring the look of bewilderment from the rest of the group. That is, until Kakashi coughed twice, getting her attention once more. However, he turned to Tazuna, addressing the bridge builder. Tazuna-san, Hakajusama has given his permission to continue this mission. A team from Anbu will join us in a few hours, and tomorrow we will continue with our trip. Oh, that's great. The old man exclaimed. Thank you so much. We do, however, expect from your country to pay the rest of the money for this mission, once you get the necessary income for it, that is. Are we clear? Yes, yes. Of course. Tazuna was still smiling. Well. Kakashi said as he stood up, stretching his muscles a bit. As we'll make a camp here, we should place some alarm seals around us. Naruto. Here you go, sensei. Naruto said, handing a few papers to Kakashi. I learned how to make them recently. It should help us more in the future. Thank you Naruto. Kakashi said. Sasuke, Sakura. Take some of them and place them there and there. He pointed to the two directions, while he went to another side of the clearing and Naruto to the last one. Okay. All in place. His genins nodded. Turn them on, Naruto. And he did. An invisible barrier appeared for a moment before becoming invincible again. The alarm seals were useful in the enemy territory as no one, but the user could sense them, contrary to the barrier ninjutsu and barrier-based seals that were visible and could be broken with enough power. If any significant chakra signature passes through them, it will alarm and wake me up right away. But we should still have someone awake to watch over, just in case. Naruto said. I'll take the first watch. The team sent here should arrive in about two hours at most. We've been traveling for eight hours, so they'll catch up to us in time. The group went to set up their beds and go to sleep. Kakashi remained the only one awake, but was soon joined by Naruto, in about 30 minutes to his watch. Can't sleep. I guess there's no point. I'll be awoken soon, anyway. I should have brought my own alarm seals for this mission, sorry about that. Naruto waved it away. Doesn't matter, sensei. This should be good practice for my advancement in Kenjutsu. You have a point there. Comfortable silence stretched for a minute or so. Are you okay with revealing Gamakichi to Sasuke and Sakura? Kakashi asked. The two of them figured it out right away. I don't mind. Naruto replied. Neither of them will say anything. And it is better this way. If you already told them about the consequences, it's revealed when the time is not right. The Kajusama was always on the lookout that someone could figure it out and send the information to the other villages. Or even that Orochimaru could use it to his advantage somehow. Naruto slowly nodded and looked towards the rest of the group. Sasuke and Sakura were sleeping peacefully, while Tazuna was already snoring. That's the knowledge we'll protect him till the end with more support, really upped his spirit, don't you think? Naruto commented. It really did. By the way. Said Kakashi. Mind telling me, what was with the tense atmosphere when I got to the bridge today? I don't know either, sensei. Naruto confessed. I think Sasuke really needs someone to talk to more often. I think you could help him the most, sensei. Kakashi sighed. I guess I will need to. He refused any counseling after the massacre. He is more open now, so it will be easier for me. I thigh they're here. Naruto went to say something, but the alarm seals told him a group of five shinobi passed a barrier. You have a good student out there, Kakashi-senpai. 
a woman with purple hair and a cat mask, commented as she and the other four Andrews joined them near the fire. KM codename Fox the captain. Tenzm codename Tiger, the second in command. Ikgao codename Cat. Daisu codename Boar. Amachi codename Eagle. Good student is the result of a good sensei, wouldn't you agree? Kakashi said with his eye smile. You're not slacking off with their training. The tiger said. Is there a reason I should? We are having bets between ourselves on when the first complaint about your tardiness will reach the Hakajasama. I'm honestly hurt that my old team has so little faith in me. The fox masked Anbu, KM, snorted at that. Being the captain of Team Row, he was first to change the subject straight to the point. If you're done joking around we should talk about why we're here and not currently in our bed sleeping. Right. Kakashi turned serious to his infamous Anbu mode. Hakajasama already told you why, I assume? Of course he did. Dinbu's nodded in any case, something which Kakashi was grateful for. We are dealing with Mamachi's Zabuza and his aide, Yuki Haku. The boy is around 15 years of age, with the ice release bloodline limit. Kakashi began while his new support digested the news. The bulky boar Anbu whistled lowly at that. Plenty of dead clans are emerging lately, don't you think? Focus on the task, boar. Living the history will come later. Captain Fox scolded. You're no fun, Captain. The boar pouted. A jester of the team. Naruto remembered. Any particular abilities of the ice release we should know of. You have the Achiha on your team, so fire should not be a problem. Fox commented, pointing to the sleeping Sasuke. Yet, he didn't need to say it like that. But Captain Fox wasn't known as the Taburamasekin for no reason. A nickname he was given by Naruto in reality, as Team Ro was the team who guarded Naruto part-time when Kasuk was away. So Naruto knew some bits and pieces about them from their time together. Please keep your opinion for yourself, Captain. Kakashi began. Mission is not a time for personal prejudice to cloud our judgment. He told him seriously. Whatever. Fox crossed his arms and kept silent for the next five minutes as Kakashi explained some elements of the demonic mirroring ice crystals that he gathered from the memories of the demon brothers. I'd say the speed and reaction are the elements we need the most. Tiger said. Did you gather any strategies that Zabuza uses in battle, Senpai? He usually fights by himself, Hiden. Haku is hidden in the background and acts as his support if anything goes wrong. So how do we approach them? I have an idea. Naruto said. The adults looked at him, with Captain Fox being the one to motion him to go on. I will make five shadow clones, with four of them transformed into my team and Tizuna. It should give us an opening at least for a moment. Neither Zabuza or Haku are censors, right? There was nothing to suggest they were. Kakashi answered. But, it should give us an opening. My team can guard Tizuna while we deal with Zabuza and Haku. Cats are also sensors. So she can pinpoint where Haku is hiding within the mirrors. Understood. Cat stated. Now. Let us go with potential strategies regarding their general abilities. Naruto, at least one of your clones should stay close to us to disperse Abusa's mist. Should we wake Sasukasen and Sakurasen? The eagle asked. Akashi considered this for a moment. No. Let them sleep. We'll brief them in the morning. The next day, Sasuke and Sakura were told of the plan, and both of them accepted it, Sasuke grudgingly. They were also introduced with the Anbu team that was sent there as a support. Tazuna was exhilarated by this development. Although, he was not very happy once he was taken by a boar and carried in arms when they jumped across the sea to the land of waves. Puke, Tazuna emptied his stomach as soon as they landed on the ground. Sorry about that, old man, boar said. But we couldn't waste our time. You could have warned me, at least. Tazuna grumbled. What's done is done. Captain Fox said. Tazunasan. In which direction is your house? To the north. Tazuna pointed out. It's about half a kilometer from here. Naruto in the meantime placed his finger on the ground and focused on his senses as Tazuna directed them. Opening his eyes, he addressed the group. There are two chakra signatures in about 200 meters from here to the north. But my house is that way. Tazuna exclaimed, worried. Bakashi placed his hand on his shoulder. Tazuna-san, calm down. Allow us to deal with this. The old man nodded and Kakashi addressed Naruto next. Naruto make five of your shadow clones and have them transform as we agreed. Making a sign for a shadow clone Jutsu Naruto made five of his identical copies, four of whom transformed into one Team 7 member and Tizuna. You three stay here and guard Tizuna. Clones go first. But Zabuza, near the lake, the Genin team was sent to protect the bridge builder from him. Nothing too dangerous. Or so Zabuza had thought from his hiding spot in the trees. That was until he recognized the silver-haired man among them. Had a Kakashi. Zabuza narrowed his eyes. Jackpot. The demon of the mist thought as he observed Haddock's genin team. But something feels strange here. While not a naturally born sensor, Zabuza did train to feel the other's chakra. It was necessary, given his use of the silent killing technique. 
he continued watching them as they approached closer, analyzing them as he did. When they got close enough, he decided to reveal himself, sending his Kubikram flying towards them, but they managed to evade it as they laid down to the ground. Fair enough. He thought as he jumped to his blade that was pinned to the tree. Lamachi's abuser. Kakashi said. Your fight is with me. He finished, charging towards him with one kunai. The hell is he planning? Kanoha ninja were infamous for their planning and strategizing, not charging Hedon. Akashi's kunai clashed with him, and Zabuza took his blade right away to protect himself from Haddock's attack. It wasn't hard to do it. For a moment, Zabuza thought he would win this battle easily. His dream was crushed as soon as he saw Kakashi smirking at him. What? An explosion that came from Haddock took Zabuza by surprise, and he barely managed to evade much damage from it as he jumped back towards the lake. A shadow clone he questioned loudly. An exploding shadow clone. Correct. Kakashi's voice came from behind him, causing Zabuza to turn around and see two more figures alongside the copy ninja. Well the other three appeared in front of the genins and the bridge builder. So Kanoha has sent an Anbu team to support you? I must say I'm flattered. Zabuza said sarcastically. It seems Haku will have to join sooner. That's fair. But wouldn't you agree that we should even the odds a bit, Haddock? The man in question remained silent, his Sharingan now revealed as he looked at Zabuza's back. It is easy when you have the village behind your back to support you, isn't it? Zabuza began. You have a stable job, a normal cage. He snorted at such a notion. In my case, it takes months to find a rich customer and seconds to lose him. I'm not wasting this chance away, Haddock. Or Haku, this was the signal and he appeared at the side of his master. It seems you needed my help after all, Zabuza-sama. The ice user said. Gee. Don't have much choice. As you can see for yourself. Opposing ninjas continued looking at each other before Zabuza spoke to Haku. You take care of the three Anbus in front of you. They shouldn't be much of a problem with your ice mirrors. I'll deal with Haddock and the other two. I hope so. Understood, Zabuza-sama. Harigakur Jutsu. Zabuza exclaimed and the mists started forming around everyone present. But then, to both Zabuza's and Haku's surprise, Tazuna stepped forward. I don't think so, you renegades. He shouted, proceeding to do a few hand signs and exclaiming. Wine style. Great breakthrough. Naruto's clone disguised as Tazuna breathed and then blew away a mass of wind from his mouth, dispersing Zabuza's mist. What the fuck? Zabuza questioned, fuming. When the fuck did that old fart learn ninjutsu? He didn't get the chance of getting an answer, an attack came from Kakashi and the other two Anbus. It wasn't an elemental attack at least. A normal hand-to-hand -hand combat. He went to a defensive position. Haku in the meantime surrounded the three other Anbus in his demonic mirroring ice crystals. You will never escape this technique. Surrender the bridge builder now, and I will let you go. I'm afraid we can't do that, Hakusen. Tiger replied. Cat, can you sense him? The woman nodded. I can. But we'll still need an opening. Tiger nodded. Eagle and I will create a diversion. You take him out as soon as you get a chance. Any advice? Seven o'clock, the mirror in the middle is the real one. Cat whispered and Tiger nodded. Let's go, Tiger. Eagle said. Both of them attacked the mirrors in the opposite direction of each other. With Tiger going with the cat's advice. But as he struck the mirror with his blade, the mirror shattered only for a moment and was quickly restored to its previous form. Haku in the meantime escaped to another mirror quickly but revealed his minor weakness as he was robbed of his mirrors quickly and with that an opportunity to escape with more ease. Any other ideas? Tiger asked as he and Eagle jumped back to their female teammate. I can trace the pattern of his movements. Cat said. Tiger and Eagle listened to her closely. Attack his mirrors once again. He moves directly to the mirror right in front of his own where he previously was. Only when he is cornered does he move to the one from the side of his current mirror. So you can attack him directly once he is out of his mirror. But only when he is cornered, he needs to move to the mirrors that are either left or right to his side, not directly in front of him. Right. You'll gee wait, he's preparing for an attack. Thousand flying water needles of death. Haku whispered as the large amount of needles flew towards the Kanohinans from all sides. I'll take care of it. Tiger quickly said. Wood style. Wood locking wall. A wooden dome appeared around the three Anbus, protecting them from the needly attack Haku had sent towards them. Once you release the dome attack right away. Don't waste any moment. Haku released his jutsu and went for an attack, just like the eagle did, in their respective directions. As Haku continued moving from mirror to mirror occasionally throwing some in hope of defeating his opponent, Kat saw her chance and went for an attack with her sword. But before she could land a hit on the Yuki boy once again, a wooden pillar appeared around her, but this time there was a large cleaver pinning through the wood to her right side, just inches away from her neck. That was close. Cat thought as the sweat dripped down her forehead, under the mask. I nearly died. 
B equals equals with Zabuza and the other group at the same time equals equals. Zabuza was not enjoying this development. First, he didn't expect Kanoha to send an Anbu team to protect one bridge builder, in addition to Hata Kakashi, another former Black Ops member. He managed to evade most of their attacks. All three of them could use the water element, but so could he. Yet, he was cornered no matter what. Damn you. Zabuza grumbled as he was sent flying back by the bulky Anbu. He landed on the water near the coast. Behind him were the Haku's mirrors. If Haku dealt with the other three Anbus quickly, this could already be over. However, Zabuza could see that Haku was struggling with his opponents. As he shot another glance towards his companion, Zabuza saw that he would not be able to avoid the sword attack by that purple-haired woman. Quickly gathering his strength he threw his Kubikaram to the direction where the Anbu woman would be in that precise moment. Zabuza cursed his bad luck as a wooden wall appeared and stopped his massive cleaver from killing that Anbu woman. But at least his weapon was secured. Wood style. He was surprised. Another Senju lives. He did not have the time to think about it as two Anbus flanked him from both sides, tying him up with their chains. That's adorable. He smirked beneath his mask while he replaced himself with a water clone that was nearby, just the moment before Haddock could slice his throat with his kunai. Now all he had to do was to take Haku with him and flee. There was no one better than him in that regard. Fleeing from Yagura in the first place gave him enough experience with that for the rest of his life. Equals equals in Haku's mirrors equals equals. Wood style. Wood locking wall. Tiger exclaimed as he saw an attack being directed towards his teammate. He managed to save Ikgao in time as his wood protected her. She quickly compassed herself and appeared next to him as Eagle joined in as well followed by Kakashi, Fox, and Boar. Zabuza grabbed Haku at the same time with his sword. Forgive me, Zabuza-sama. I was careless. Haku apologized. The ch. Doesn't matter. I wouldn't win anyway. We'll fall back. For now. His word was final. He may have lost the battle, but not the war. Zabuza and Haku disappeared in a body flicker right away. Can you sense them? Kakashi quickly asked Ikgao. I can, but they're moving too fast for us to reach them. We could chase them, but it's a matter of time before they escape the reach of my sensory abilities. Kakashi continued looking at the place from where Zabuza and Haku disappeared. They will return to finish the job, that's for sure. The others nodded. Naruto. Dispel those clones. You four can come out now. About five minutes later, Naruto, Sasuke, Sakura and Tazuna joined them. Is there any reason why Gat might think that Tazuna here is a trained shinobi? Bor asked him. Naruto shrugged his shoulders. I just wanted to mess with him a little. What are you guys talking about? Tazuna joined in, visibly confused. We'll tell you later. Can you lead us to your home now? Sure. At Tazuna's house. Father. You came back. A pretty young woman said happily as she approached and hugged Tazuna. You didn't doubt it, did you? Tazuna smiled as he hugged his daughter. I brought Shinobis from Kanoha to help us out. He pointed to the group that followed him to the house. Oh. My apologies for not noticing you earlier. Thank you for protecting my father. Tsunami said, bowing gratefully. It was nothing. Part of our job after all. We couldn't leave his daughter without a father now, could we? Kakashi said, a bit too friendly to the rest of the group as they watched the interaction. Is he hitting on her? Sakura whispered to Naruto. Probably. Azunasan, Sanamasan. Captain Fox started. We would appreciate it if you would show us where we will be staying for the time being. We also need to formulate a new strategy regarding Zabuza and Gatan. What did you plan to do with him? Tazuna asked as he led them to the living room. The Kajusama was given as an optional mission, that is if we get a chance to eliminate the man. We will begin our search tomorrow. Someone will need to stay with Tazuna and the other workers near the bridge. Kakashi said. It is best if my team and I do it. You can search for Gatman's and Zabuza. If you find them. Just send someone for me and I'll come to help. This isn't one of your slacking off moments, senpai. Ikgao asked. Nope. Kakashi said, smiling. Just doing my part of the mission while well, you do yours. Captain Fox snorted at that. Whatever. By the way, Kakashi. We'll still need the blondie to come with us. At that Naruto perked up. Working with the Anbus at his age was an honor not many received. May I know why? Kakashi asked, raising his eyebrow. We will split into two teams and search through the archipelago. Me, Cat, and Eagle will be one team with Tiger, Boar, and Naruto the other. Both Cat and him are sensors, so it will alarm either of us if the Buza is somewhere nearby. Inari, where have you been all this time? They heard Tsunami scolding someone in a reply of. At the town, Mom. They turned around towards the door of the living room and saw a little boy with a hat walking towards Tazuna, giving him a welcoming hug in a detached tone. Welcome home, Grandpa. It's sure good to be back. I'm glad you're okay, Inari. The boy just shot a challenging look to the Kanoha group which was silent as the family affair went on. Is there a problem? 
bore, never the one for formalities, asked. Propelling Ick out to give him a small elbow kick to the ribs, but the man didn't budge. Who are they, Grandpa? These are the ninjas that will protect me till I finish the bridge, Inari. Tazuna said happily before his mood soured at Inari's next words. What's the point? They're going to die anyway. Inari said, leaving the Kanohanans in silence. What's up with him? Or asked once again. Team 7 remained silent as Tazuna had already told them why the young boy was so nihilistic. Let's just rest for today. We all have our duties tomorrow. Kakashi said. Naruto. You and Ikgao will place the various security seals around the house. Just to be sure that either Zabuza or Gat do not meddle while the rest of us are out. Understood Sensei Senpai. Said Naruto and Ikgao in unison. That's Zabuza's hideout, what do you mean you failed? Gatan shouted at Zabuza who sat on the couch in front of him, angry that his investment was wasted like this. I asked you to get rid of that old fart. How hard could it get? He asked him, before looking around, seeing only Haku who stood beside Zabuza. And where are those other two idiots of yours? Sokol Demon Brothers. The bridge builder managed to get help from Kanoha. They had sent him reinforcements in addition to Hada Kakashi. Zabuza said, thinking back about the skirmish near the lake. As much as he hated to admit, he couldn't beat them, even with Haku. Buzu and Maizu are probably dead as well. DCH. I knew you Shinobus are nothing but talk. You pride yourself in your prowess, yet you run with tail between your legs. Gatton complained. Zabuza growled and released a bit of his chakra in order to scare the businessman, who whimpered, along with his two bodyguards. Yet, as much as he hated him, Zabuza also needed him if he ever wanted to overthrow Yagura. This midget has the money necessary for another revolution. Successful revolution this time. Maybe he could kill him and take the money, leaving Haddock to finish his mission and to never see him again. But the feeling of humiliation overwhelmed him and his blood cried for vengeance. Even if he did kill Gatton here, knowledge that he ran from a few Kanohanans will be another blight to his reputation, which was already on the bottom line ever since he fled Karigakur. No. He will finish this one way or another. I have a proposition for you. He told Gatton. What? I have half a mind to cancel our deal. Maybe someone else is more credible. Like this Akatsuki organization. The greedy midget taunted him. Suit yourself. But tell me this. How will you hire them if you're dead? Fire me and they will come for you right after. He couldn't help but allow a wicked grin to appear on his face under his bandages as he saw Gatton shaking. Even a Haddix Genin could kill this bastard, but a bit of lying was never an unwelcome approach for him. So what should I do then? He shouted. They'll kill me. And all my hard work will be for nothing. Tell me. What should I do? He asked him frantically, and Zabuza couldn't help but laugh outright. Oh. Now you're willing to listen. I think that will require at least half of the money to be deposited in advance. Just to be. Fine, Gat muttered, glaring at Zabuza. But you're staying with me until this mess is over. Sure. Zabuza agreed cheerfully before turning back to his demon persona. Now will you listen to my plan or will you continue to bitch around? Of course not. Gatton shook his head in fear, in fear. You were saying. But Naruto and his group. No traces of Zabuza or Haku on this island. Naruto said. They had just finished searching the last island they were supposed to scout. He couldn't just disappear like that, could he? Tiger asked. And we haven't found anything about Gat neither. Did he leave this country already? Or joined in. He doesn't sound like someone who would flee just like that. Although we must not dismiss such a possibility. Tiger said. Where should we go next? We have already scouted our sectors. Or said. Maybe we can find more information in the local town. Naruto suggested. Fine, but the two of us will remain in the shadows. Tiger said after a while. Sure. Naruto replied, but then he recalled something about the tiger that he never asked. Tijerson. Yes Naruto-san. What is your relation to me? He decided to ask bluntly, making both Tiger and Boar tense for a mere moment. I wasn't entirely sure before. Back in Kanoha, whenever I used my sensory abilities, I would sense the chakra very similar to my own. And it came from you. Or looked towards his teammate, deciding to stay silent for this conversation. Naritasan, I'm not allowed to disclose any information regarding that. If you want to learn more, you will have to speak with the Hikajasama directly. But I'm in no way a member of your clan. Origins of my wood style are rather unorthodox, to say the least. I see. He was disgruntled for a moment before pushing the thought out of his head. Let's go and check the town. When they arrived on the outskirts, they met the other team, apparently waiting for them. So you three had the same idea as we did. Captain Fox stated. I guess you found nothing in your sectors. We didn't. Tiger answered. We thought that at least some information would be available in the town. Don't bother. Fox said. We already gathered everything we could. That caught Naruto, Tiger, and Boar by surprise. And what did you find? Naruto asked. 
Adam has nulled his contract with Zabuza and has fled back to his homeland in the land of hot water. As of now, he is out of our reach. We could chase after him, right? He can always come back here once we leave and restart his criminal activities. He could, Fox confirmed. But we can't even be sure if he has gone to that country. It will be like a goose chase at best. Naruto frowned, but Captain Fox had more to say. Look, kid. I know you want the best thing for this country. We all do. The rest of them nodded. But there are certain rules all must follow, and that is. A shinobi must always put the mission first. You do understand that. I do. And he did. Naruto wanted to pride himself in the shinobi knowledge he possessed. But he didn't want for a remnant of his mother's homeland to suffer, again. Azunasan told us last night in detail about his plans regarding the bridge. Yeah. He told my team as well when we found out the truth. But I'm not sure this country will be safe after we leave. There is nothing that can stop Gatton from taking over with no ninjas around. Azuna believes that the bridge will not only raise the spirit of the people and faith in a better future, but also a willingness to resist any future oppression. And you believe that. Granted, that is one possibility, but. If Gatton hired Zabuza the first time, there was nothing stopping him from hiring Shinobus again. But Captain Fox didn't budge. We don't know when Gat might strike again. If we had found him here he would be eliminated on spot. However, now we must think outside of the box. As the Hakajusama gave us an optional task of eliminating him, all we can do for now is wait. I understand. Conceded Naruto. He knew that what the Anbu captain said was true. The current priority is to defend Tazuna as he is constructing his bridge. If it makes it any easier. Fox trailed off. I can speak with the Hakajusama and ask him to allow you to come with us to hunt him down. Really? The opportunity of doing missions with Anbu at his age was rarely, if never given to anyone. Naruto knew of only a few Anbus at his age. Itachi Ichiha being one of them. Something which other members of Team Road decided to point out. Naruto is a Senju, not an Ichiha. He already passed a psychological test in my book. Fox said, stubbornly. You are having a vendetta against a dead clan, Captain. I thigh. Cat said, trying to play the rationality card. Enough about that. He ordered and Naruto wondered if he was missing something deeper here. Grudges could be held by the two families, but he didn't know what enmity Captain Fox, KM held against them. He knew that the Ichihas weren't that liked by the shinobi population, who considered their abilities as cheating. Naruto himself didn't have a very positive opinion of them. One of them nearly ruined his childhood, even more, his son is a member of the organization that would basically leave him dead if they caught him. The third one was decent, if a bit closed off. Sasuke was probably the only reason why he didn't outright hate the clan. At least both of them could sympathize with each other, on a certain level. Let's go and see how Kakashi is doing. Fox said. Probably reading his favorite book. What else? At the bridge construction site, guarding a bunch of construction workers and watching them do their job is not the way Sasuke had imagined saving a country would go by. When he suggested that they continue the mission, despite getting upgraded to a higher rank, he never would have guessed it would go like this. Boring. Try meditating. Kakashi said, not lifting his head from his book. Why? Sasuke looked at him. He already did that plenty of time. But Kakashi's suggestion must have had its reason. It will calm you down a bit. I know this isn't how you imagined the mission would go, but. Not everything is hack and slash, Sasuke. Then why can Naruto go with the Anbus and I can't? At this, Kakashi closed his book and sighed. Why are the Achiha so complicated? He thought. Sometimes, honesty was better than lying, even if his profession prided itself in the latter. Because your brother was one. Kakashi said, bluntly, and Sasuke widened his eyes at his response. Of course he knew his brother was an Anbu. Something he always bragged about early on during the academy. Before that fateful day. So you think I might end up just like Itachi then? Am I correct? Sasuke growled, lowering his head as Kakashi couldn't pick his real reaction from hair covert eyes. Will you? What? The first blunt response took him off guard, the second did as well. Will you become like your brother? Kakashi insisted. No. Was the quick response. Well. You're acting like him. Sometimes. A blatant lie. But necessary. However, it wasn't far from the truth. Itachi was quiet, yes. A man who kept his emotions in check, yes. Hidden for most of the time. Curious as well, but not someone who would leak any information about himself. It was something that many of his colleagues were wondering about. Despite their differences, Kakashi couldn't help himself but compare the two brothers. Don't worry. You aren't that similar to him, but you have your moments when I wonder. That calmed Sasuke a bit. He decided to ask something that bugged him for the past few days. Regarding Naruto. Sasuke began. He really is a senju. It wasn't hard to figure it out. Godfather, the toad contract, blonde hair, just like the Yandames. Even without the first two, he wondered how no one figured it out sooner. 
himself included. I can neither confirm it nor deny it. Orders from the Hakajasama himself. You do know what that means, Sasuke. I won't tell anyone. It's not like I have anyone to tell me. If you want to talk more about it, you will have to speak with Naruto first. HN. It was hard to imagine his teammate was also from a deceased clan. Just like him. Yet as much as Sasuke felt anger when he remembered his condition, he felt at ease knowing there was someone else like him. Naruto was possibly the only person who could understand him fully. Maybe that's why he was friendly towards him, despite their dead family history. Ironic. He wondered if Naruto thought of it as well that way. Hard times breed strong men. For all their family rivalry that he didn't care about, both of them were in hard positions, and a part of Sasuke was glad that Naruto was his teammate, possibly the closest thing he had to a friend. Yesterday's rivalry could easily become the greatest tool for one's progress, tomorrow. As he thought about it, a voice of Itachi whispered inside his head. Pillar. Sasuke shook his head, pushing the memory out. He sat in a meditating position. Enjoying the guard duty, Kakashi-senpai. Sasuke turned around and saw the Anbu group and Naruto with them. I'll have to treat Kitetsu and Izumo sometimes. They really are heroes of our village. Kakashi replied back. Anything new here? Naruto asked Sasuke as he jumped near him. No. Sasuke answered. Just Sakura helping the workers out there. He pointed towards their pink teammate, who when she saw Naruto return, decided to take a break. You're finished already. We found nothing, it seems the Gatan has fled the country and fired Zabuza. Rumor has spread around the town already. Really? This time it was Tazuna who shot the question as he approached the group, sweeping the sweat from his forehead as he did. Naruto as well as the Anbus nodded. That's great. It means that my bridge is really scaring him off. He laughed. You hear that, everyone? He said to his workers. The tyrant has fled the country. I told you this would work. Didn't I tell you? He bragged to his workers who erupted in a happy cheer as the news spread. So he really fired Zabuza. And fled the country. Kakashi mused. We found Zabuza's bandages in his hideout on a small remote island. Fox pointed out as he took the sweaty gauze from his holster and showed it. We also scouted an abandoned castle nearby, Tiger said. Traces inside suggested that it was populated until very recently since the floor as well as everything else was clean from the dust. Or nodded. There was also a safe that was emptied but left open. Everything else was taken as well. No documents or anything else was found inside. No weapons, no food, no clothes. So he really did flee. Kakashi concluded. Tactical retreat didn't always include taking everything with you as you flee. Survival instinct picked up his love for wealth as well. But nothing suggests he won't return once we leave. He will need to be eliminated in any case. Judging from the man's personality, that was an option. Yet the first point outweighed the second. Captain Fox nodded. I thought so as well. It won't be hard to find him, and the Hakajasama himself will probably sanction this endeavor. I think so as well. Kakashi said. Naruto here has suggested we chase after him. But you know that it isn't certain he fled towards his homeland. Right. Indeed. Kakashi said. He could even go to the land of woods, to the south, or the land of water to the east. Nothing is sure. I said so as well. Captain Fox confirmed. Naruto suggested we chase after him. We could do that if we knew for sure that he fled to his homeland. Do you think he will return to the wave after we leave? There is such a possibility, yes. But. The Anbu captain said. He should know about the dangers of returning to this country. He would place a large target on his head if he did. Yes. He should know that. Kanoha had an alliance with the Izushi Agakur. Gatm has drawn the ire of the strongest of the Great Five. He probably didn't even know that. If he did he would have stayed away from this country at all costs in the first place. In any case, all we can do for now is wait for Tezuna to finish his bridge. After that, we return to Kanoha and begin a search for him. I can't help but think we're missing something here. Yes. Tazunasan did say that Gatan does hate dealing with ninjas because we're too expensive. From what we know of his personality, it isn't far from the truth that he could nullify his contract with Zabuza. Correct. Fox said. But why would Zabuza accept being fired? Is that what troubles you? Yes. Captain Fox sighed under his mask. We will search tomorrow, again. Just to be sure he is not in this country anymore. It's best if you do. Islands north to the land of Wave. Is Ushiagakur no Sado? Zabuza muttered as he looked around. Ye. This was the village that your former home has destroyed, right? Gatton said as he walked beside him through the ruins of the former Kanoha's ally. They had just landed on the shores of the ruined hidden village and were walking throughout the streets, looking at the ruined buildings. No. Zabuza said as he kicked Yuzushio's forehead protector away in front of him. Kamagakur helped as well. Albeit, they wanted to harvest Yuzumaki's blood for their breeding program. And? Did they succeed in their plans? I remember seeing those fiery Yuzumaki women once. 
Can't say I blame you Shinobis for wanting to harvest them. Gatam said, laughing at his own joke. Dabuza on the other hand didn't, remaining serious. As far as I know, they did not. They stopped in front of the small monument at the center of the village. The monument itself was a statue of the two Shinobis shaking hands. One had Yuzushio's symbol on his forehead, while the other had the symbol of the Senju clan. The only people who got the chance to breed with the Yuzumakis were their own and Senjus. But both of them are dead now. Zabuza said as he looked at the monument. He pondered that the monument represented the close family ties between the two clans and their alliance that always had the others back in the time of the greatest need. But as the Senjus have largely died out by the time of Yuzushio's destruction, so have the hope of the clan's survival against their enemies. And not even the Senju's artificial creation of Kanoha could have helped them. Yuzumaki women that remained in the village all killed their children once they figured out that the end was near. And then they killed themselves. The Yuzumaki fury, Kumo called it later on. So none of them survived. Some did. Zabuza answered. Yuzumaki Kishina in particular. She was very ruthless against Kumagakur Shinobis during the Third War from what I know. There were probably more survivors out there, but they went into hiding. Boss. Zabuza turned around to see one of Gatam's thugs running towards them. What is it, Wiraji? Vizuhara has contacted us. He was able to spread the rumors as you wanted. Tazuna has many more workers on his bridge. Adam snarled. Let them bloat while they can, I'll show them one day. He turned to his bodyguard once again. Tell him that he should inform me the moment Kanohinans leave. Not a second later or sooner. You got that. Whatever you say, boss. Wiraji grinned and then left. Damn those Kanoha pests. As soon as they are gone, I'm going to make an example of the wave. The businessman continued to grumble as Abusa watched in silence. He didn't care about Gat more whether he would survive Kanoha's retaliation. He just wanted to finish this mission and continue on with his ambition. Kanoha would no doubt hunt his employer more adamantly if he goes with his plans eventually, either way. He wondered if he should advise him not to rush things so quickly, but discarded the idea. If Gatm had a death wish, then so be it. As soon as the man paid him, he would leave this country and never look back. By the time Kanoha finds out about this, he would hopefully become a new Mizukage already. Whatever. Me and Haku will find our own place on this island. Do not disturb me until the mission starts again. You got it. Right. Take your time. As he walked towards one of the buildings with Haku by his side, Zabuza remembered something from the fight with Kanoha Ninja. Haku? He said. Yes, Zabuza sama You fraught with that wood style, Kanoha Anbu. Did you find anything interesting about him as you fought? No, sir. He barely used the wood style in our fight. Only to create a defensive barrier from my attacks. DCH. What are you thinking about, sir? Either the Yandame Hokage had a bastard son along the way, somewhere, or Kanoha is more secretive than Karigakur itself. At the Land of Fire's side of the bridge, the construction of the bridge was finished within the week. With more workers offering their help, the construction was speeded, and the bridge was eventually finished. Captain Fox suggested that they should stay a week more, just to be sure. But there was no sign of either Zabuza or Gatton. A week later, the Kanoha group stood at the Land of Fire's side of the bridge with Tazuna, his family and various other citizens of the Land of Waves, bidding their goodbye. I cannot thank you and your village enough for helping us, Kakashisan. Tazuna said. I don't know what would have happened if you weren't here. I promise you. We will repay the money we owe, in time. Oh, no need to fret about that Tazunasan. We were just doing our job. And we'll make sure that Gatton does not return again once we're back in Kanoha. Ha. Even if he does return, the people will not succumb to his will again. That's for sure. Tazuna boasted in his usual bravado. He motioned for his grandson to move forward. Inari looked to the ground, not wanting to face the shinobi. A move that caused Tazuna to bonk him on his head. I'm sorry for being such pain to you guys. The little boy apologized. For the duration of their stay at Tazuna's house, Inari would occasionally try to bait the shinobi into arguments about heroes. Something that was ignored by the group, causing him to cry. He was happy once the bridge was finished, however. Seeing the few people scare the tyrant into running brought a belief that heroes might exist to the child. And thank you for saving my grandpa. Really, thank you for saving my father, Kakashisan. I don't know what would have happened if you weren't here. Tsunami said to Kakashi, sweetly, who in turn scratched his masked cheek in embarrassment. We were just doing our duty. HH. If the duty consisted of moans during the night. For Sakura whispered to Naruto who raised his eyebrow at her. Delis. No way. We'll see you some other time, Tazunasan. Kakashi said as they bid goodbye. With Gatan, boss, Waraji said as he approached Gatan. A messenger bird from Mizuhara has arrived. Give it to me. The small man said, impatiently, as he took the letter from his bodyguard's hands. Good. A wicked grin crept on his face. Gather the men and calls Abusa. It is time to act now. Um, boss. 
Shouldn't we wait for at least some time before the Kanoha group leaves the wave to be Sue? Shut up. I give the orders and you obey. Now go. Yes sir. Muraji sneered. As long as he got the pay, it was good. Azuna, I'll show you what happens when someone humiliates me. The shipping magnate chuckled as he crumpled the letter in his hands. Of Kanoha's shinobi, they decided to go at a normal pace back to Kanoha. It would take them three days at least to reach their home. I can't believe the mission turned out so easy. I mean, who would have guessed that Gat would simply flee? Sakura wondered out loud as they sat by the road to have lunch. Not every mission goes the way we intend. And this time, our target survival instinct overcame his pride and self-confidence. The Anbu member, Kat, answered. I suppose. I wonder where Zabuza went. He is still a Missingnan in Kurigakur. Eagle said from the side. We haven't heard anything about the inner workings of Kiri in a long time. Nothing but unconfirmed rumors. Captain Fox added his two cents. Like what? Naruto asked this time. Kurigakur was an interesting place for him to research, due to having various bloodlines among many things. Rumor that the Yande Mizukage is dead. Really? So how come nothing came out? I thought they would be ecstatic to reveal that. Stories about the tyrannical reign of his fellow Jinch Kriki reached even him. For a time, since he found out about it, Naruto was afraid that he could end up like him. A tyrant or a madman. On the other hand, it was also inspiring to an eight-year-old when Jiraiya told him that the Kurigakur's Mizukage was a Jinch Kriki like him. Shows it that your status can be bypassed by others and for them to view you differently. Although, what Yugura did was not something that Naruto aspired to become like. As he ate his meal, a sudden flare of chakra had hit him, or better said, an alarm from the seals. His mind ran fast to pinpoint where it could come from. His home perhaps. No. There are double alarm seals there, and the old man will deal with that if there is a problem. Yet, as he discarded that possibility, another one had passed through him. Azuna's house. Both he and Anbu Kat said in unison. The two of them had placed the alarm seals around Tazuna's home and did not remove them before they left. The seals were alarmed because of the two significant chakra signatures. Two familiar chakra signatures. Zabuza and Haku have returned. He said and Kat nodded. Quickly, get ready. We're going back to Wave. Kakashi ordered. He returned rather fast to the Wave, don't you think so? Or asked, serious for the situation at hand. Indeed. Captain Fox answered. I don't know if it's pride, greed or simple foolishness. All three, maybe. It doesn't matter. Fox said. We need to hurry. I have a bad feeling about this. His usual stoic voice was still in place, but there was a sense of worry in it. Naruto, Sasuke, Sakura. You three will deal with any of the Gatons thugs we encounter. Let me and the Anbu deal with Zabuza and Haku. Understand? Yes, Sensei. The three genins answered. It took them a day to return to the wave. And a sight that welcomed them was not something that either of Kakashi's genins would ever forget. The bridge was completely destroyed, with only remnants of it still floating above the water, with the bases of the bridge being the most memorable part of the remaining monument to the resistance of the people. Zabuza and Haku are still here. Naruto snarled as he sensed those two chakra signatures present. A rage like never before started overwhelming him. Memories of the grateful and happy people of the wave being directed towards the Kanohinans when they left the country just two days ago flashed through Naruto's mind. Gratitude. That was the feeling he wanted to always be present within his heart. Unaware of himself, he started leaking Kikbi's chakra in small amounts as he and the rest of the group ran towards the town center. The sight that greeted them was another memory none of the three genins would ever forget. Tazuna, Tsunami, Inari and dozens of other workers were nailed to the wall on the town square, their arms chopped off, blood already dried. Sakura covered her mouth with both of her hands, while Sasuke was visibly shaken. And Naruto widened his eyes even more as the rage he held inside started leaking out. The adult ninjas were better at hiding their emotions, but couldn't help and feel anger as well. Pound Square, moments before the Kanoha group arrived. So how do you like it now, Tazuna? Gatton gloated as he stood in front of the makeshift wall for this occasion. Around him were dozens of armed thugs, while Zabuza and Haku stood beside him. Where is the money? Zabuza asked impatiently. Here you go. The small man gave him a coffer with his reward, almost as if he was angry for paying him for a job well done before turning towards the dead bodies once again. The supplies of weapons, food and various other tools. This should suffice the cost for the new revolution. Zabuza thought as he inspected the coffer. You know. You could stay and work for me as a bodyguard. I could really use you too. Gatton said, not changing his look from the presentation in front of him. But Zabuza did not answer, his attention was elsewhere. Notably, Naruto releasing more and more of Fox's chakra was soon noticed by a demon of the mist, who turned around to face the Kanoha group that was standing atop of one of the buildings. They're here already. He whispered with a frown. They returned fast. He did not expect this. Or knew how they knew about Gatton's return so fast. 
Tabuza sama. Haku said worriedly as he saw their odds are against them again. In the meantime, on the top of the building, Naruto's anger and the result of it was noticed by the group as well. Naruto, calm down. We need to stay focused. Kakashi said and nodded towards the tiger in case anything went the wrong way. As if it didn't already. Their client was dead, along with his family and the workers who helped him with the construction. Money wasn't the problem, but the parameters of the mission's results were. Along with the consequences that this would have on the reputation of Konoha and people of this country. Naruto continued looking at the dead bodies, his rage rising with every moment as he heard Gatton's laughter. Aku, prepare to flee, quickly. Zabuza said as he sensed a familiar energy, very similar to his sworn enemy, Yugura. Kakashi, five Anbus and a Jinch Kriki was an overkill. And there was no way, either he or Haku would be enough to beat them. Let alone, survive. Understood, Zabuza-sama. Huh? Are you two farting or what? What kind of energy is this? Gatton complained, and the realization soon hit him like a pair of bricks when he turned around. Kanoha Shinobi. The blonde one was leaking some sort of orange air around him. His thugs looked towards the top of the building, shakenly. There were around 50 of them. The sheer energy and hatred of the Kikbi was too much for them to bear. Some of them drew their weapons, but for the most part fear overwhelmed them as they struggled to stand still in their positions. I didn't sign up for this. One of them shouted. Me neither. Naruto disappeared from his place and speed so fast that it was impossible for normal eyes to follow. He charged towards Abusa first, who prepared to defend himself. But before he could land a precise hit to his chest, Haku jumped in front of him as Naruto, instead of hitting Zabuza to the chest, punched Haku to the face, breaking his nose in the process, sending him to Zabuza's arms who caught him. Ugh. The Yuki boy groaned as he felt his bones cracking and blood dripping down to his mouth. Haku. We're leaving. Zabuza said as he held his tool in his arms. Today is not the day either of them were going to die. Zabuza where are you going Gatton questioned when he saw his hired blade preparing to flee as far away as possible. He quickly said as he picked his coffer with money. You treasonous bastard. Zabuza disappeared with Haku in his arms in a swirl of water. Naruto could still sense them and was about to give chase. But before he did, few pillars appeared around him, grabbing him by the hands and legs. Nice work, tiger. Kakashi said as he and the other four Anbus jumped near the executioner's wall. Gatton's thugs started fleeing, but were hunted down by the Anbu group. Kakashi grabbed the businessman by his collar, restraining him. Please let me go, I'll give you anything you want. He whimpered in Kakashi's arms. But his plea was ignored. I don't think I need to use that technique on him. Five if he had used more tails, I might have needed to. Tiger said as he held his arm straight, kanji for the word sit inscribed on it. They are running away. A voice in his head commented. Naruto continued resisting the wooden pillars as they continued draining Kikbi's chakra away from him. You're weak. He was weak. Zabuza was running away. He must not allow him to flee. But the wooden pillars were too strong, and he soon returned to normal state. The red eyes and enlarged whisker marks faded away. Please spare me. I beg of you. Naruto turned around to see Kakashisensei holding a short, whimpering man in a tuxedo suit on the ground. I'm sorry. He muttered. Bakashi sighed. You didn't release it. So it's all good. I nearly did. Bakashi remained silent. He turned around towards his other two students. Sakura was visibly shaken, and Kat approached her to calm her down, as he looked towards Naruto in unreadable fear. Sasuke was no less afraid. Although, unlike Sakura, he was a bit calmer. There was one difference in him that wasn't present before this. Both of his eyes flared Sharingan with one tomo each. Great. Kakashi thought tiredly. Another problem. He would have preferred if Sasuke never awakened it. He would need to have a long conversation with him regarding the lure of those eyes. Among other things. Sensei. Sakura stuttered. Everything will be explained when we return to the village, Sakura. Kakashi said. They would need to deal with the entire mess here, first. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys in the next video. Till that. Take care.